term of medieval justice known as the trial by ordeal. This will be your opportunity to speak, but each member of the committee has 30 minutes to ask. Uh, and I know that they're going to be careful to stay within time limits of those 30 minutes. I do want to remind my colleagues that history has proven that speeches don't have to be eternal to be immortal. <laughs> uh, President Lincoln learned at Gettysburg that 275 words were enough. So I hope my, my colleagues and friends will stick to the 30-minute guideline. I'll tap on the gavel if you're getting perilously close to extending beyond. We'll take a few breaks throughout the day. A number of them are scheduled, one for lunch, one for dinner, and uh, several perhaps shorter ones in the meantime. If votes are called on the Senate floor, which is a possibility, we'll do our best to keep the hearing going as members uh, go back and forth. And as I mentioned uh, yesterday, we welcome all of our uh, friends in the audience and ask that they be quiet and respectful during the hearing. So let's get started with the questioning, and I'll begin at this point. Judge Jackson, there are two issues that came up repeatedly yesterday from the other side of the aisle that I want to address at the outset. One of them was a question of judicial philosophy. No one questions either your academic law school credentials or your service as clerk and as federal judge. But time and again, you have been asked, what is your judicial philosophy? Does it fit into Scalia's originalism, Kavanaugh's textualism? Is it strict construction? Is it liberal? Is it conservative? Lo and behold, I've discovered the answer. It turns out that during the course of your time as a judge, you have actually had written opinions, 573 to be exact, I think. Maybe I'm off by one or two. And they more or less express your view of the law as the facts are presented to you in each one of those cases. And then some 12,000 pages from the Sentencing Commission, transcripts of deliberations on important issues. For most of us as elected senators, if people asked, what, what's your philosophy, we'd point to our voting record. You have a record when it comes to court decisions. And this committee, for the fourth time, is delving into everything that you've published as a judge and even before. So would you like to comment at the outset of those who are looking for a label, what your position is on judicial philosophy? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Over the course of my uh, almost decade on the bench, I have developed uh, a methodology that I use um, in order to ensure that I am ruling impartially and that I am adhering to the limits on my judi judicial authority. Uh, I am acutely aware that as a judge in our system, I have limited power and um, I am trying in every case to stay in my lane. And so what I do um, is I essentially follow three steps. The first step is when I get a case, I ensure that I am proceeding from a position of neutrality. Um, this means that you, know, you, you, you get a case and it's about something and it's submitted by certain parties. I am clearing my mind of any preconceived notions about how the case might come out I'm setting aside any personal views. Uh, it's very important that judges rule without fear or favor. The second step is once I've um, cleared the decks, so to speak, in this way, um, I am able to receive all of the appropriate inputs for the case. Um, that is the party's arguments. They've written briefs. Um, sometimes we have a hearing. Sometimes we hear from other parties, amici in a case. And then there's the factual record. I am evaluating all of the facts from various perspectives. I think my experience, uh, all of the various experiences that I've had, really helps me uh, at this stage to see the perspectives of all of the parties and to understand their arguments. And then the third step is the interpretation and application of the law 
to the facts in the case. And this is where I'm really observing the constraints on my judicial authority. Um, there are many constraints in uh, our system, importantly, because just, uh, judges have limited authority. And so I am, first of all, looking at my jurisdiction. Uh, threshold matter in every federal case is to make sure that you even have the power to hear the case. Um, in evaluating jurisdiction, you're looking at all sorts of things. The, the text of a, a jurisdictional provision, for example, precedent related to it. Um, if I can get to the merits of the case, if I have jurisdiction, then I am uh, observing the limits on my authority concerning the question. So if it is uh, a statute, for example, or a provision of the Constitution, I'm looking at the text. The adherence to text is a constraint on my authority. I'm trying to figure out what those words mean uh, as they were intended by the people who wrote them. So at this point, um, I'm looking at original uh, documents. I am focusing on the original public meaning because I'm constrained to interpret the text. Sometimes that's enough uh, to, to resolve the issue in terms of the merits. Judges also look at history and practice uh, at the time of the, the, the uh, document was created. If it's a statute, I'm looking at Congress's purposes because again, I am not importing my personal views or policy preferences. The entire exercise is about trying to understand what those who created this policy or this, this law intended. I'm also looking at precedent, which is a, another constraint on judicial authority. Um, I am looking at prior cases and trying to understand what other judges have said. Uh, as a lower court judge, I'm bound by the precedent. Uh, and even in the Supreme Court, if I was fortunate enough to be confirmed, there's stare decisis, which is a binding uh, kind of principle that the justices look at when they're considering precedents. So all of these things uh, come into play in terms of my judicial philosophy. Another issue which has come up to my surprise, and I've spoken to my Republican colleagues about their fascination with it, is the notion of the composition of the Supreme Court, which euphemist euphemistically is referred to as court packing. I have said on the floor, and I will repeat here, uh, there is exactly one living senator who has effectively changed the size of the Supreme Court. That was the Republican leader, Senator McConnell, who shrank the court to eight seats for nearly a year in 2016 when he blocked President Obama's nomination of Merrick Garland. Now that question on court packing was posed to Amy Coney Barrett, justice in the court, when she appeared before this committee. She was asked about it. She said, and I quote, could not opine on it. And on many other policy issues, then Judge Barrett said repeatedly she could not share her views, stating, and I quote, I will not express a view on a matter of public policy, especially one that is politically controversial, because that is inconsistent with the judicial role. I do believe we should have rules and traditions and precedents, but we shouldn't have a separate set of rules for Republican nominees and Democratic nominees. So Judge Jackson, if a senator were to ask you today about proposals about changing the current size of the Supreme Court, what would your response be? Senator, I agree with Justice Barrett in her, um, her response to that question when she was asked before this committee. Again, my um, North Star is the consideration of the proper role of a judge in our constitutional scheme. And in my view, judges should not be speaking in to political issues, um, and certainly not a nominee for uh, a, a position on the Supreme Court. So I agree with, with Justice Barrett. Let me address another issue that came up yesterday in the opening phase of this uh, nomination hearing. Uh, and it's the issue involving child pornography. I want to turn to that issue because it was raised multiple times, primarily by the senator from Missouri. 
and it was he was questioning your sentencing record in child pornography cases uh, that do not involve the production of pornographic material. They're known as non-production cases. I wanted to put some context here. The senator from Missouri has in his tweets said of your position on this issue, Judge Jackson has a pattern of letting child porn offenders off the hook for their appalling crimes, both as a judge and a policymaker. She's been advocating it since law school. This goes beyond soft on crime, the senator said. I'm concerned this is a record that endangers our children. I thought about his charges as I watched you and your family listening carefully yesterday and what impact it might have had on you personally to know that your daughters, husband, parents, family, and friends were hearing the charges that your implementation of this law, sentencing, endangered children. Could you tell us what was going through your mind at that point? Thank you, Senator. Um, as a mother and a judge who has had to deal with these cases, I was thinking that nothing could be further from the truth. These are some of the most difficult cases that a judge has to deal with because we're talking about pictures of sex abuse of children. We're talking about graphic descriptions that judges have to read and consider when they decide how to sentence in these cases. And there's a statute that tells judges what they're supposed to do. Congress has decided what it is that a judge has to do in this and any other case when they sentence. And that statute, that statute doesn't say look only at the guidelines and stop. The statute doesn't say um, impose the, the highest possible penalty for this sickening and egregious crime. The, the statute says it, calculate the guidelines, but also look at various aspects of this offense and impose a sentence that is, quote, sufficient but not greater than necessary to promote the purposes of punishment. And in every case, when I am dealing with something like this, it is important to me to make sure that the children's perspective, the children's voices are represented in my sentencing. And what that means is that for every defendant who comes before me and who suggests, as they often do, that they're just a looker, that these crimes don't really matter, they've collected these things on the internet and it's fine, I tell them about the victim statements that have come in to me as a judge. I tell them about the adults who were former child sex abuse victims who tell me that they will never have a normal adult relationship because of this abuse. I tell them about the ones who say, I went into prostitution, I uh, fell into drugs because I was trying to suppress the hurt that was done to me as an, as an infant. And the one that was the most um, telling to me that I describe at almost every one of these sentencings when I look in the eyes of a defendant who is weeping because I'm giving him a significant sentence. What I say to him is, do you know that there is someone who has written to me and who has told me that she has developed agoraphobia. She cannot leave her house because she thinks that everyone she meets will have seen her, will have seen her pictures on the internet. They're out there forever. At the most vulnerable time of her life. And so she's paralyzed. I tell that story to every child porn defendant as a part of my sentencing so that they understand what they have done. I say to them, 
that there's only a market for this kind of material because there are lookers, that you are contributing to child sex abuse, and then I impose a significant sentence and all of the additional restraints that are available in the law. These people are looking at 20, 30, 40 years of supervision. They can't use their computers in a normal way for decades. I am imposing all of those constraints because I understand how significant, how damaging, how horrible this crime is. It, is, it should be noticed as well that the cases which the senator from Missouri referred to yesterday all resulted in incarceration uh, of some magnitude. In the one case, the Hilly case, I want to quote what you said on the record. This family has been torn apart, speaking to the defendant, by your criminal actions. You saw it on the faces of those women. You heard it in their voices and the impact of your acts on those very real victims who are still struggling to recover this day makes your crime among the most serious criminal offense this court has ever sentenced. And you imposed a sentence of 29 and a half years on that defendant. So the notion that you look at this casually or with leniency, as the Senator said, uh, your record belies that. And in fact, what we're dealing with here is an issue which even this committee and members on the committee have been loath to address again. The original law was written at least nine or 10, maybe longer years ago, and the quantity of material was relevant to the sentencing. And now that we have computer access to voluminous amounts of material, uh, it has raised questions, has it not, within the judiciary as to the appropriate sentencing in today's circumstances. This was a question that was raised before the Sentencing Commission, was it not? It, it was, Senator. The Sentencing Commission um, has written at least one report, it did when I was there, looking at the operation of this guideline. As you said, the guideline was based originally on uh, a, a statutory scheme and on directives, specific directives by Congress at a time in which more serious child pornography offenders were identified based on the volume, based on the number of photographs that they received in the mail. And that made totally total sense before when we didn't have the internet, when we didn't have distribution. But the way that the guideline is now structured, based on that set of circumstances, is leading to extreme disparities in the system because it's so easy for people to get volumes of this kind of material now by computers. So it's not doing the work of differentiating who is a more serious offender in the way that it used to. So the commission has taken that into account and, and perhaps even more importantly, courts are adjusting their sentences in order to account for the changed circumstances. But it says nothing about the court's view of the seriousness of this offense. Judge, the, uh, there have been several news organizations that have taken a look at the Senator from Missouri's charges, ABC News, CNN News, The Washington Post, and others, and have concluded that they are inaccurate uh, and unfair to you in their conclusions. Uh, in fact, one writer has said they are meritless to the point of uh, unacceptable levels. Nationally, in 2019, only 30% of non-production child pornography offenders received a sentence within the guidelines range, fewer than 30%. Between 2015 and 2020, in the D.C. District Court where you served, judges imposed below guideline sentences in non-production cases 80% of the time for the reasons you've just explained. Judges in Missouri, the home state of the senator who has criticized your record did so 77% of the time. One particular judge whom the senator supported to become a federal judge by appointment of President Trump, uh, unfortunately, has a 77% record. If I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to make sure that this is accurate.
Here it is. In the United States versus Klotz, Trump appointed Judge Sarah Pitley, the senator's choice for the Eastern District of Missouri, sentenced an individual convicted of possession of child pornography to 60 months, well below the 135 to 168 month sentence recommended by the guidelines. She appears to have run into the same issue or same challenge that you have described here. So going forward, uh, in terms of this issue, it, it seems that we at least share the burden by your interpretation uh, as to define this statute in modern terms, in terms of technology as it exists today. Is that the way you see it? Senator, C Congress is tasked with the responsibility of setting penalties. Congress tells judges what we're supposed to do when we sentence. And what I'd say is that Congress has to determine how it wishes uh, for judges to handle these cases. But as it currently stands, the way that the law is written, the way that Congress has directed the Sentencing Commission uh, appears to be not consistent with how these crimes are uh, committed and therefore, there's extreme disparity, as you pointed out. There are judges who are varying because our ultimate charge from this body is to sentence in a way that is sufficient but not greater than necessary to promote the purposes of punishment. Judge Jackson, we've heard criticism from some about your previous work representing detainees at Guantanamo Bay. In fact, for years, we've heard criticisms leveled against lawyers who have provided Guantanamo detainees with legal representation. This criticism misses one critical point. The right to counsel is a fundamental part of our constitutional sentence system, even for the most unpopular defendants. I want to thank Senator Graham, who served as an Air Force lawyer for decades, for offering his perspective yesterday. He said, and I quote, the fact that you're representing Gitmo detainees is not a problem with me, Senator Graham said. Everyone deserves a lawyer. You're doing the country a great service when you defend the most unpopular people. And then Judge Roberts said during his confirmation hearing, it's, it's a tradition of the American bar that goes back before the founding of the country that lawyers are not identified with the positions of their clients. The most famous example probably was John Adams, Chief Justice said who represented the British soldiers charged in the Boston Massacre. This sentiment is shared by lawyers across the political spectrum. I want to give you an opportunity to address this issue because it applies not just to Gitmo detainees, but to your work as a public defender uh, in terms of the uh, wisdom, if not, acceptability of providing counsel in those cases, and what impact it's had on you personally in terms of your rulings on the bench. Thank you, Senator. Um, September 11th was a tragic attack on this country. We all lived through it. We saw what happened, and um, there were many defenses, important defenses, that Americans undertook. There were Americans whose service came in the form of military action. My brother was one of those Americans, those brave Americans who um, decided to join the military to, to defend our country. There are others of you in this body who have military service, and I honor that, to protect our country. After 9-11, there were also lawyers who recognized that our nation's values were under attack, that we couldn't let the terrorists win by changing who we were fundamentally. And what that meant was that the people who were being accused by our government of having engaged in actions related to this under our constitutional scheme we're entitled to representation. We're entitled to be treated fairly. That's what makes our system the best in the world. That's what makes us exemplary. 
I was in the Federal Public Defender's Office when the Supreme Court, uh, excuse me, right after the Supreme Court decided that individuals who were detained at Guantanamo Bay by the president could seek a review of their detention. And those cases started coming in and federal public defenders don't get to pick their clients. They have to represent uh, whoever comes in and it's a service. That's what you do as a federal public defender. You are standing up for the constitutional value of representation. And so I represented, uh, as an appellate defender, some of those detainees. In the early days, the legal landscape was very uncertain. Uh, this had never happened before, not only the attack, but also uh, the uh, use of executive authority to detain people in this way. And there were a lot of questions that the court was asking. The Supreme Court had taken a series of cases to try to understand what are the limits of executive authority, which is important. All of our liberty is at stake if we don't get it right in terms of what the executive can do. The Supreme Court has recently reaffirmed that the Constitution does not get suspended in times of emergency. And so lawyers were trying to help the court to figure out, figure out what the executive's power was in this circumstance. And as an appellate defender, I worked on the habeas petitions of some of these detainees. My petitions were virtually identical because we had very little information. Part of the issue at the very beginning of these cases was that most of the factual information was classified. So defense counsel were appointed to represent these defendants. We had no facts. And I was making legal arguments about the circumstances. That is what gave rise to my representation. And I would just emphasize that that's the role of a criminal defense lawyer. Criminal defense lawyers make arguments on behalf of their clients in defense of the Constitution and in service of the court. Judge Jackson, um those of us who read about the workings of the Supreme Court realize it's a close relationship among the justices. You've seen it personally as a clerk and as an attorney yourself. Uh, I'm going to close with one question here that uh, comes to my mind. Uh, I was in the House of Representatives when the war on drug measure was passed 30 years ago or so. It was at the advent of crack cocaine it scared the hell out of us. The notion of a cheap narcotic, highly addictive, destructive to uh, mothers and their fetus, uh, led us to impose a sentencing disparity between crack and powder cocaine that was unprecedented. A hundred to one. Our notion was to come down hard, make it clear that it was a federal standard, impose that standard, and stop the advance of crack cocaine. We failed from the outset. The price of cocaine, crack cocaine on the street went down and um, up instead of down. The, uh, I'm sorry, I did that wrong, down instead of up. And the number of users went up instead of down. And we found ourselves in a position where we were filling the federal prisons uh, with violations primarily for possession of crack cocaine, hundreds of thousands being incarcerated at that time. I came here to this committee in an effort to try to change it negotiated uh, a revision of that measure from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1 with Senator Jeff Sessions. It was passed by the committee, by the Senate, and by the House of Representatives and signed into law by President Obama. Then you on the Sentencing Commission had to consider what to do with these new guidelines coming from Congress. And you achieved a consensus. I think most people don't realize the Sentencing Commission is a pretty diverse group and very transparent. Could you close in the last minute or so and tell, tell me about that effort to find consensus on an issue that controversial? Yes, Senator. Um, as you mentioned, the Sentencing Commission uh, is a very diverse group of people who've been appointed by presidents of different parties by law 
Um, and at the time that I was on the commission, we had a range of, uh, of people, um, judges from different uh, backgrounds, um, who had different views about the criminal justice system, but we had a directive from Congress insofar as Congress had changed the penalties, as you mentioned, related to crack cocaine. And so um, we worked together to make a determination about whether or not the guidelines needed to change, and if so, whether or not to impose those changes retroactively um, in light of all of the evidence that you point out, all of the, um, the Congress's changes, and um, the need to avoid unwarranted sentencing disparities, which is exactly the charge that this body has given to the commission. And we worked together. We reached unanimous agreement that the change in the guidelines that was necessitated by the change in the statute should apply retroactively to people who had been uh, convicted and sentenced under the prior regime, and then Congress followed shortly thereafter by making it uh, a statutory change to, to apply those changes retroactively. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Senator Grassley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome again to our committee. I got home last night about 8 o'clock. The first thing I heard was my wife's opinion that you did very good in your opening statement. Thank you. <laughs> she didn't have anything to say about my statement. <laughs> also, uh, besides the fact that we might have some votes on the United States Senate, just so that you know I'm not being rude to you, I may have to go across the hall to the Finance Committee on some issues with tariffs and down to the Agriculture Committee for some issues on rural health care. <clears throat> Do you believe, well, let me ask it this way. Do the First Amendment free speech protections apply equally to conservative and liberal protesters? Yes, Senator. Okay. Do you believe the individual right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental right? Senator, the Supreme Court has established that the individual right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental right. Could you tell me how you might go about deciding what a fundamental right is under the Constitution? Well, Senator, um, I don't know that I can tell you that in the abstract in the sort of way that, that you may have posed the question. Um, there is precedent in the Supreme Court related to um, various rights that the court has recognized as fundamental. The court has some precedents about the standards for determining uh, whether or not something is fundamental. The, the court has said that um, the 14th Amendment substantive due process clause um, does support some fundamental rights, but only things that are uh, implicit in the ordered concept of liberty or deeply rooted in the history and traditions of this country. They're, they're the kinds of rights that relate to personal uh, individual autonomy, and they've recognized a few um, things in that category, um, and that's the tradition of the court for for determining whether something is fundamental in that way. Okay. Uh, on another subject, uh, kind of personal to me over a long period of time, and about half of this committee, but it's a controversial issue with the, even within this committee. I favor allowing Supreme Court hearings to be televised. Uh, what's your view on this? How would you feel about cameras in the courtroom, uh, which um, about 40, 50, of, or 40 or 45 of our states allow? Well, Senator, I would want to uh, discuss with the other justices their views and, and understand all of the various um, potential issues related to 
cameras in the courtroom before I took a position on it. I think that's a fair answer at this point. Uh, I'm going to ask you about a bill that I got passed a long, long time ago. And it's something that at some level of courts, sometimes the district court, sometimes at the circuit court, and even a once or twice at the Supreme Court, they tend, these courts tend to do damage to a bill called the False Claims Act. This bill has brought $70 billion of fraudulently taken money back into the federal treasury since it's been passed. And courts have weakened it, and then Senator Leahy and I usually find ourselves having to pass legislation to say to the courts, you got it wrong. In fact, there's a very controversial bill right now before the United States Senate on that very subject. It's fought fraud in the Department of Defense, healthcare industry, the pharmaceutical industry. $70 billion is pretty important. So when you get, if you're approved to be on the Supreme Court and the issue of false claims comes up, I hope you think of Chuck Grassley. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's one of the, well, and Leahy. <laughs> the False Claims Act is one of the best tools that we have to fight against government fraud and to recover taxpayers' money. I've worked for decades to protect whistleblowers who shine a light on fraud, waste, and abuse in the government. So I'd like to ask you a couple questions. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, a former attorney general, unnamed, once suggested that key TAM suits were, in his words, patently unconstitutional, and another word he used was dangerous. He argued that it violated the appointments clause. So, understanding that you may get a case before you on the False Claims Act, but maybe this appointment clause is uh, sound enough, you could answer, do key TAM suits violate the appointments clause? So, Senator, I'm, I am not familiar with that um, could you answer, representation. Could you answer in writing, then? Yeah, well, I, I'd be happy to do whatever. I, I'm just trying to assess. Um, I, I'm the, sorry. I shouldn't have interrupted you. No, no, that's all right. Sorry. Um, I am trying to. I'm not familiar with the quotation or what the uh, attorney may have said about them. I know that the Supreme Court has considered um, various key TAM actions and has um, issued opinions in the area and has not, at least to date, found them to be unconstitutional. But I don't know if that issue has been squarely presented to the court, and I um, would be loath to comment on it um, just because it, if it's being litigated, it's something I wouldn't be able to yeah. address. Let me, uh, on the same subject, also this former attorney general also argued that key TAM suits also violate a broader separation of power principles. Are the, can you tell me whether you think the president's constitutional powers are violated when private citizens are allowed to sue in the name of the United States? And that's what key TAM suits are all about, private citizens going to court. Um, well, Senator, it's a, it, it is an important concern. There are statutes that do um, allow for um, the kinds of lawsuits that you are articulating. Um, I am not aware of impediments to those, but again, you know, this is the kind of thing that um, may be litigated, and I would have to look as I do. Uh, consistent with my methodology um, at any arguments that are raised uh, about uh, the constitutionality or lawfulness of those actions. Remember in about all of these suits that involve the courts in making interpretations of the False Claims Act, most of them are brought by whistleblowers. And remember the government would not even know about these fraudulent use of taxpayers without whistleblowers coming forth. And they ought to be given some credit for wanting the government to do what the laws say it ought to do and spend the money the way that the Constitution or that the Congress implies that that money be spent. I want to move on. 
at an event at the University of Chicago School of Law in 2020, you quoted Martin Luther King Jr., who dreamt of a time when, quote, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners would be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood, end of quote. You talked about how quickly things in the country then changed, including the civil rights laws over the next few years because of the civil rights movement. You added that, quote, less than a decade after Dr. King's words, that was the world that you inhabited. Dr. King hoped for a country where we would all be judged by the content of our character rather than our race. Do these quotes still reflect your views on this very important topic today? Yes, Senator. Um, in that speech, I talked about my background, my upbringing, um, the fact that my parents, when they were growing up in Miami, Florida, attended and had to attend racially segregated schools. Because by law, when they were young, white children and black children were not allowed to go to school together. And my reality, when I was born in 1970 and went to school in Miami, Florida, was completely different. I went to a diverse public high, junior high school, high school, elementary school. Um, and the fact that we had come that far was to me a testament to the, the hope and the promise of this country, the greatness of America, that in one generation, one generation, we could go from racially segregated schools in Florida to have me sitting here as the first Floridian ever to be nominated to the Supreme Court of the United States. So yes, Senator, that is my, that is my belief. And I think that it's good that the country had an opportunity to hear what you just uh, told us about your experience. Uh, I'm going to go to something that the chairman brought up and I, I've written down the three, point, three steps you go through. Uh, no, another question, but also one that he brought up on court packing and your opinion. I heard what you said, and you said it should be a policy question, but I want to go to something in 2013 during your hearing to be a district court judge. Senator Coburn asked you whether you believed in the theory that the Constitution is a living document whose meaning evolves over time. You said no. In 2021, however, during your circuit court nomination hearing, you declined to answer the same question when asked why the answer, uh, when asked why the answer to your question of 2013 and not in 2021, in, in written questions, you noted that you weren't a sitting judge. So please explain to me, or describe for us, the difference between ethical rules for sitting judges versus judicial nominees who are not already judges. Senator, I don't know that there are ethical rules that um, are different. What, what I'll say is, with respect to my um, approach to judging, um, there is not a label, I think, that fits what it is that I do and, and how I've approached my role. As I mentioned to the chairman, um, I'm very acutely aware of the limitations on the exercise of my judicial power. And those limitations come in the form of adherence to the text. When you, assuming you even get to that stage of the process, that you have, uh, you have subject matter jurisdiction, you can reach the merits, 
then you are looking at the text, and I do not believe that there is a, a, a living constitution in the sense that it's changing and it and it's infused with my own policy perspective or uh, you know the policy perspective of the day. Um, instead, the Supreme Court has made clear that at, when you're interpreting the Constitution, you're looking at the text at the time of the founding and what the meaning was then as a constraint on my own authority. And so I apply that constraint. I look at the text uh, to determine what it meant to those who drafted it. Uh, on this same subject, I want to point out a difference between you and a couple people that have sat on the Supreme Court. Justice Breyer said that a structural alteration of the Supreme Court motivated by a perception of political influence can only feed the perception uh, of political influence. That's my parenthetical, further eroding that trust. Justice Ginsburg also cited court packing as being, quote, unquote, a bad idea. Court packing is creating new seats for political purposes for a president to appoint more judges. Uh, do you agree with Justice Breyer and Justice Ginsburg that court packing is a bad idea? Before you respond, I'd like to say that uh, uh, you say this question should be left to Congress as a policy issue. I reiterate that sitting Supreme Court justices have spoken on that matter, so I don't think it'd be inappropriate for you to do if other people sitting there have said that it's a bad idea. Well, respectfully, Senator, other nominees to the Supreme Court have uh, responded as I will, which is okay. um, that it is a policy question for Congress. And I am particularly mindful of, of not speaking to policy issues because I am so committed to staying in my lane of the system. Because I, I, I'm just not willing to speak to issues that are properly in the province of this body. Okay. Uh, then I would interpret your answer, and you don't have to respond to this, but I think you're saying Breyer and Ginsburg should not have stated their views on that issue. Uh, during his opening statement yesterday, one member of this committee suggested that the Supreme Court has been bought by dark money groups. Do you agree that the Supreme Court has been bought by dark money groups? Senator, I don't have any reason to believe um, that that's the case. I have only the highest esteem for the members of the Supreme Court, whom I, I hope to be able to join if I'm confirmed, um, and for all of the members of the judiciary. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I'm going to go to international law. During an ABA panel on international law last year, Justice Breyer said that as a federal judge, quote, you can't do your job properly, end of quote, without considering international law and, quote again, in some cases, and it's a growing number, end of quote, and I assume a growing number of uh, opportunities to use international law. In 2018 op-ed, Justice Breyer said that, quote, the best way to preserve American values may well be to take account of what happens abroad, end of quote. Under what circumstances is it appropriate to consider international law when interpreting our Constitution? Thank you, Senator. Um, I have nothing but the highest uh, esteem and respect for um, my former boss, who I've spent the better, past, better part of the past couple decades calling my justice, having clerked for him. Um, but I do think that uh, the use of international law is very limited um, in, in our s scheme and in our judging. Um, there are certain 
cases in which it is relied upon um, where Congress directs or where the standards are such, the case involves a treaty, for example, and you have to interpret international law in order to be able to address it. Um, but there are very, very few cases, I think, in which international law plays any role, and certainly not in interpreting the Constitution. I'm, I think you probably have answered my next two questions, but if you say you have nothing to add, I would still want to ask the questions. Do you think it's appropriate to look to international law when interpreting enumerated and unenumerated constitutional rights? Uh, no, Senator. Which specific, uh, again, I think you've answered this, but I want to ask it anyway. Which specific constitutional clauses or rights has the Supreme Court held that can be interpreted by looking to international law? I'm not aware of any that um, are properly illuminated by reference to international law. Yeah. Uh, now I want to go to a question that Senator Durbin asked. I'll probably go a little more, but I remember when this is about your judicial philosophy, and you made three points, uh, three steps you take to go through a case and apply the law, and, uh, and, and uh, you say your methodology is limited power and stay within your lane. I'd like to ask you, uh, well, you've served on the district court for several years and spent eight months on the D.C. Circuit. During yesterday's opening statement, we heard a lot about the importance of judicial philosophy. In your own words, you've described that, so you don't have to go through that again with me. But if Congress writes a law that does not explicitly allow private parties to sue, do you believe that the federal courts have the authority to create implied causes of action? And I'd like to have you elaborate if you say yes to that. I would say that as a general matter, no, Senator. I mean, our, um, our obligation as judges is not to create policy. And if Congress has enacted a statute um, that establishes a cause of action or um, restricts causes of action, then as a general matter, I don't think that courts can impose one. Now, you know, I'm saying generally because um, there may be circumstances that I'm not thinking of. There, the, I know that the Supreme Court has in very narrow circumstances at times uh, discussed implied causes of action, but I think the charge of the judge is to um, impose the law as written. There's 115 justices that serve before you if you are approved by the Senate. Uh, is there any of them now or in the past that has a judicial philosophy that most closely resembles your own? You know, I haven't studied the judicial philosophies of, of all of the prior justices. I will say that um, I come to this position, to this moment, as a judge who comes from practice, that I was a trial judge, and my methodology has developed in that context. I don't know how many other justices, other than Justice Sotomayor, have that same perspective, but it informs me with respect to what I understand to be my proper judicial role. Uh, what aspect of your record as a judge do you believe have been the most important for the good of the country? Well, um, I think that all of my record <laughs> is important to some degree because I think it clearly demonstrates that I'm an independent jurist, that I am ruling in every case consistent with the methodology that I've described, that I'm impartial, 
Um, I, I don't think that anyone can look at my record and say that it is pointing in one direction or another, that it is supporting one viewpoint or another. Um, I am doing the work and have done the work for the past 10 years that judges do to rule impartially and to stay within the boundaries of our proper judicial role. Let's go to immigration. Um, Congress gave the Attorney General, quote, unquote, sole and unreviewable discretion to decide whether expi expedited renew removal would apply to, quote, an alien who has not been paroled or admitted to the United States. You decided a case called Make the Road New York where you seem to agree that Congress gave the Department of Homeland Security sole and unreviewable discretion to decide which illegal immigrants would be subject to expedited re removal. But you still went on to review the department's decision. In fact, you issued a nationwide injunction blocking the Department of Homeland Security from removing illegal immigrants who had been in the country for less than two years. In that hearing, you told us that if the text was clear, that ended the question. The law specifically says that Homeland Security, not the courts, was responsible for making the decision. Could you please explain why you believed a federal court could review something Congress called unreviewable? Thank you. Uh, Senator, for allowing me to address that opinion and my analysis with respect to it. Um, as you said, Make the Road was a uh, case involving a challenge to expedited removal, which was a, um, a way in which Congress had given the authority to, Homeland, uh, uh, to the Department of Homeland Security um, to make a decision about how to deport people who are non-citizens. Prior to the challenge that I heard, the Department of Homeland Security, um, since it received that authority several decades ago, had decided that people who are in this country for up to 14 days and are found within 100 miles of the border are subject to expedited removal. The challenge that I heard involved the department's sudden shift to a determination that expedited removal would be applied to anyone who was found anywhere in the country and who had been here up to two years. Importantly, the challenge was not about the actual determination. The challenge was about the procedures that the agency undertook to make that determination. And so the statute said, as you rightly pointed out, that the agency had sole and unreviewable discretion to decide. And in interpreting that, I took into account the language of that statute and the language of another statute that Congress has enacted to direct agencies with respect to the manner in which they exercise their discretion. So I said, and I believed, um, that soul meant that the Department of Homeland Security was the only agency who got to make this determination as to how many months a person should be in the United States. And unreviewable meant it was final. Once the agency decided, um, then there was no ability to review substantively their determination. And I should say that, importantly, the statute co that Congress enacted gave the agency the discretion to make this determination between zero and 24 months. There is a limit in the statute. It says, Congress, you, I mean, uh, excuse me, Department of Homeland Security, you get to decide where between zero and 24 months uh, a person 
who's been in this country can be subject to expedited removal. So I read the statute. DHS gets the sole ability to make that decision. DHS makes that decision and it's final. What wasn't clear to me based on that language was whether Congress intended to preclude its procedural requirements for the exercise of agency discretion. And in the DC Circuit, there was precedent that indicated that even when Congress gives a great deal of discretion to an agency, procedural requirements may still apply. It is presumptive that the APA applies, meaning that an agency can't act arbitrarily and capriciously when it undertakes to exercise discretion. It has to do certain things in order to make the determination that Congress has given it. I looked at those statutes, oh, I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> I looked at those statutes and I considered the canons of construction that say that statutes should be read harmoniously, that, you're, that, that as a court, you're supposed to understand that Congress has directed, sometimes in more than one statute, what is supposed to happen. And so I read them together to mean that the court could still do what it almost always does uh, in a case involving a challenge to the manner in which an agency makes its decision. And in fact, I thought, as I say in my opinion, that Congress intended for the APA to imply because it had not excluded it, which it had done expressly in other parts of the, of the INA, it had not excluded it here, and it made sense to uh, require the agency to use its expertise. If Congress wanted the agency to act arbitrarily in picking a number, Congress could have done that. Congress said you can do it up to, to 24 months. It could have randomly picked a number. But it was giving it to the agency, I thought, and reasoned precisely because it wanted the agency to use its expertise, to do its research, and to figure out what amount of time is sufficient. And so it was important, I thought, um, to lay that out in the statute. And I determined that both of those statutory directives of Congress should apply. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Senator Leahy. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Durbin. Judge, congratulations again on your, your nomination to our nation's highest court. You're an impressive jurist. I hope the broader public sees that and I've enjoyed the opportunity to meet your family here yesterday and uh, uh, but I thought before I begin my questions, I, I was going to respond to something the junior senator from Texas said yesterday. <clears throat> he suggested the Democrats exact, exacted a political agenda by opposing the nomination of then Judge Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. I kind of chuckle at that because, uh, along with others, I and others repeatedly and clearly stated substantive concerns with Justice Gorsuch's nomination. I explained my votes on the record. There's no political agenda. I contrast that with uh, Republicans' treatment of then Judge Merrick Garland. We're still waiting today uh, for Republicans to explain on the record what kind of substantive concerns they had with Merrick Garland, that they blocked him, uh, for over a year and would not allow, even allow a vote uh, on his nomination. Uh, apparently, because of a politically driven agenda. All I'm saying is let's make history this week, but let's not rewrite it. This is a historical time. Judge Jackson, one of the topics we discussed in our meeting was our respective experiences, uh, you as a former federal public defender, myself as a prosecutor. As a federal public defender here in Washington, you were assigned to and then represented clients who couldn't otherwise afford a lawyer. One of the valuable lessons I learned as a prosecutor was this. For our criminal justice system to function properly, you have to have 
skilled, dedicated lawyers on both sides of the issue, both the prosecutor and the defense attorney. It's equally essential for judges to have a nuanced and a balanced understanding of our criminal justice system if we're going to have justice done. Now, it, it's really concerning. It's confusing that some view your background as a federal public defender as some kind of a liability. Those of us who have spent time in courtrooms know you have to have both the skilled prosecutor and a skilled defender. Uh, I believe it, in fact, I don't think of it as a liability. I think it's going to be a major asset to you. And I think it should be welcome uh, on the Supreme Court. In fact, if, if you're confirmed to the court, as I look back over, you're going to be the first former federal public defender on the court. You're going to be the first nominee since Justice Thurgood Marshall with a significant background in criminal defense. That's pretty impressive. So all of us should want that represented in the Supreme Court because decisions on the Supreme Court can have a lasting impact on our criminal justice system. My question is this. I believe that your experience as a federal public defender has made you a better judge, how you maintain impartial and balanced perspective in criminal and other cases. And I assume you would agree with that. Yes, Senator. Um, I, I think that experience in the criminal justice system, um, whether, as you say, on, on the prosecution side or the defense side, having actual experience um, is an asset as a judge. You understand the way the system works and as a defense counsel, you have interacted uh, with defendants in a way that as a judge, at least as a trial judge, I thought was very beneficial. Um, one of those ways um, is it helped me to develop a sense of the need to communicate directly with defendants um, and you know, it didn't change, I think, in any way the outcomes of the cases when I was a trial judge, but I understood from my time as an appellate defender that a lot of defendants go through the system and don't really understand it. And the problem with that from our society's standpoint is that when people go through the criminal justice system and don't have a, a good understanding they tend to not take responsibility for their own actions. They tend to be bitter and feel as though the justice system has wronged them and so while they're doing their time, rather than reflecting on the fact that this is the consequence that they have to face for actually um, committing a crime, instead of doing the work to rehabilitate themselves, they're you know, focusing on how wronged they are, how victimized they feel. And so what I decided as a trial judge was that I was gonna make sure that everyone who was in my courtroom, and especially the defendant, understood all of the pr procedures that we were going through, all of the steps. I spoke directly to them. I asked them, do you understand what's happening? Because I wanted them to know, and then even Perhaps more importantly, as I said about my, my child pornography cases, I focused on the harms of the behavior that was at issue. When I sentenced a defendant, I made clear in every case, here is the problem. This is what you've done. Here is the damage to our society. And I don't know that I would have done that um, if, if I had not been a, a criminal defense lawyer. Well, and that's sort of what, you know, I was getting to the fact that you have that experience. I also, it's obvious you don't get, as a public defender, you don't get the right to, you don't get to choose your clients. It's not like you're going out there picking and choosing. You're told you're going to defend this person, but they're given that right under the Sixth Amendment. And we, 
we all, you're a member of the bar or judge or public defender, you take an oath to uphold the uh, Constitution. And the Sixth Amendment's a pretty important part of it, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, Senator. And it's also a pretty important part for indigent defendants. Is that not correct? That is correct, especially for indigent defendants, because they are determined to not be able to afford counsel. And as you said, Senator, for a judge, uh, it is crucial that you have arguments that are being made and presented on both sides of the issue. That is what allows for judges to reach just results in cases, and it's what makes our system so exemplary. It also guarantees that our Constitution is going to be followed. I, you know, I, I think it's important you went around with uh, Senator Doug Jones, who's highly respected uh, in the Senate, both sides of the aisle, but you got to meet um, other other senators. I, I was delighted you came to uh, to spend time in my office, and, and you noted in your public remarks at the White House when you were nominated that you had been your parents were married for fifty four years, uh, and both public servants in their own right. And they are proudly watching you uh, being announced by the president, and I, I must admit, uh, watching them to uh, the last couple of days, they're proudly watching you here as have other members of your family. Your younger brother became a police officer, detective in Baltimore before serving the army, two, uh, two uh, tours of duty in the Middle East, two uncles that served as police officers, so I'm not really surprised that you understand law enforcement. The National Fraternal Order of Police has expressed strong support for your nomination. In fact, in their letter dated February 25th, 2022, they said you have considered the facts and applied the law consistently and fairly on a range of issues. And they went on to say there's little doubt do you have the temperament, intellect, legal experience, and family background to earn this appointment? And they added, we are reassured, reassured that should she be confirmed, she'd approach her future cases with an open mind, treat issues related to law enforcement fairly and justly. Uh, Chair Durbin, I'd ask consent that the letter from the Fraternal Order please be included in the record. This Without point. objection. Now, that's a statement from the largest law enforcement labor organization in the United States. What do you say to people who say you're soft on crime or even anti-law enforcement because you accepted your duties as a public defender? Thank you, Senator. I, I would make, um, I'd make three observations in response to those critiques. Um, the first is that as someone who has had family members on patrol and in the line of fire, I care deeply about public <clears throat> safety. I know what it's like to have loved ones who go off to protect and to serve and the fear of not knowing whether or not they're going to come home again because of crime in the community. As you said, my brother, my brother patrolled the streets of Baltimore. And I had two uncles who were career law enforcement, including one who became the chief of police of the city of Miami Police Department in the 1990s. So crime and the effects on the community and the need for law enforcement, those are not abstract concepts or political slogans to me. The second uh, observation that I would make is that as a lawyer and as a citizen, I care deeply about our Constitution 
and about the rights that make us free. As you say, criminal defense lawyers perform a service and our system is exemplary throughout the world precisely because we ensure that people who are accused of crimes are treated fairly. It's very important to me in that capacity as a lawyer and as a citizen. Well, I, th oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say the third thing I would say is, is as a judge. As a judge, I care deeply about the rule of law. And I know that in order for us to have a functioning society, we have to have people being held accountable for committing crimes. But we have to do so fairly under our Constitution. As a judge who has to decide how to handle these cases, I know it's important to have arguments from both sides, to have competent counsel. And it doesn't mean that lawyers condone the behavior of their clients. They're making arguments on behalf of their clients in defense of the Constitution and in service of the court. And it is a service. Now, I, I know in our conversation, I, I'd mentioned my own experience as a prosecutor. I want the best defense attorney on the other side because you want to make sure that as the trial went on, everything was done properly. And let's, let's talk about Guantanamo Bay. Uh, been controversial, and we've had two presidents, one Republican, one Democratic, who said they wish it could be closed. But the fact is, individuals were detained there. The whole world was watching this. We, uh, I, I know, I heard from people I respect uh, throughout the world asking questions about Guantanamo. And that's precisely the situation we want our best and our brightest lawyers to step into the fray, however politically controversial. We have to make sure that we do not become uh, unmoored from our core commitments of the rule of law but that also, both in our own country and outside our country, people can see that we're following that. So you were in private practice uh, when you took on these cases, uncharted legal waters, war. Uh, what principles drove you to get involved with cases in such a, a difficult time in Guantanamo Bay? Well, thank you, Senator, and I, I do want to clarify, when I first started working on these cases, um, I was an assistant federal public defender. Um, the Supreme Court in 2004 issued two opinions that began this group of cases and these issues, and this was in the wake of the tragic and terrible attack on this country uh, in 9-11, and the executive's use of authority to detain uh, enemy combatants at Guantanamo Bay. In 2004, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that the executive did have the authority to make those detentions in one case, and then in another case, the Supreme Court ruled that anyone so detained could file a legal challenge. They had habeas rights. And as you know, habeas is in the Constitution. In 2005, I joined the Federal Public Defender's Office, and those cases started coming in. The requests from detainees asking for legal representation consistent with our constitutional scheme to have help to file their habeas petitions. This was very early in the days of these kinds of legal actions, there was a lot unknown about what these petitions could look like, what the arguments could be made and considered by the court, and, and perhaps most importantly, what the facts were related to any of these individuals, because almost everything was classified. 
So defense counsel was getting these, these people in with no information. I was in the appellate division of my office. And as an appellate defender, I worked on legal issues. I was paired with my, I was assigned by the federal public defender. I was an assistant federal public defender. And I was paired with a trial defender who attempted to do the fact gathering, who traveled to Guantanamo Bay. I never traveled there or anything like that. I worked on the law. And as you noted, the law was very uncertain. This was brand new. And people were trying to figure out what are the limits of executive authority in this context. We knew that the Constitution was not suspended, uh, even though we had this emergency. So what did that mean with respect to these individuals? I filed as a federal public defender. Um, I was assigned to work on four cases. And I filed almost identical petitions because what you're doing, especially when you have no facts, is just preserving legal arguments for your clients. That is consistent with what lawyers do. Um, and then um, you mentioned private practice. So I went into private practice in, I believe it was 2007. And by that time, lots of private practices around the country had started taking on these cases because there were lots of people who needed representation. And so pro bono practices were receiving requests, um, usually through nonprofits. And one of the individuals that I had represented as a defender ended up being assigned to my firm, unbeknownst to me. So I arrive at my firm and the partners realized that this same person um, was someone that, according to the docket, I had previously represented, and they asked if I would review some of his materials and continue the representation. That was the only person that I represented in the context of my <clears throat> private firm who was a detainee. Um, I worked on a couple of habeas briefs for judges and for um, a variety of, inst of, of nonprofits, including the Rutherford Institute, the Cato Institute, and the Constitution Project, um, who were all interested in making arguments to the Supreme Court that was considering these very novel legal issues. You know, I, I sit here and I, I think of the 20 uh, Supreme Court nominees I've gotten to vote on over my years here, and I think of the remarkable praise you got from the former Republican House Speaker Paul Ryan, um, whom most of us know well. He, he did mention his politics may be different than yours, but his praise for your intellect, for your character, for your integrity is unequivocal. That's powerful praise, and I, I think it goes to a really fundamental point, and that's this. One doesn't have to have the same political beliefs or ideologies as a judicial nominee to recognize their integrity and intellect. Uh, when I voted to confirm Chief Justice John Roberts of the Supreme Court, I cast that vote knowing very well that he and I would disagree on many policy and political issues. But I voted yes because I believe that he had what it takes to serve as an impartial, fair chief justice who would uphold the rule of law, and I want to take it out of partisan politics. Now, what would you say to people whose politics may be different than yours, like Speaker Ryan, who has endorsed you? What would you say to those people about your readiness to serve as an even-handed, unbiased Supreme Court justice. Thank you, Senator. I would say that I am committed to serving as an even-handed Supreme Court justice if I'm confirmed by this body. And I have a record over the past decade that's precisely how I've treated all of my cases. 
And I've been serving in the District of Columbia, both as a trial judge and as an appellate judge, and we see some of the most politically contentious issues. My record demonstrates my impartiality. Well, I go along with that because, uh, and I, I watch this court. I, I, I used to go there as a young law student, sit in the back and just watch it. I, I continue to watch it. I see the chief uh, judge of the federal district court, Judge Beryl Howell, who I, I was privileged to have her serve as my chief counsel on on this committee and learn from her then I learn from her now but I also as a lawyer I I hear a lot of talk about reversal rates now no judge has goes without being reversed somewhere if they they're never reversed they haven't heard many cases but your time in the district D.C. District Court, less than 2% of your more than 550 cases were reversed, uh, considering the fact that the D.C. Circuit reverses an average of 13% of the cases. It, um, it hears. You got a pretty good record, and, uh, but what does a judge who's been reversed, what do they take from that reversal? What do they, what, what do they or what should they think about it? Well, you obviously look at it very carefully. Um, what it means is that um, a panel of judges who've reviewed what you determined for some reason has decided differently. And there are times when um, panels of judges decide differently because they are making new a, a new statement about the law or they're a, establishing a standard that um, had not pr previously uh, been the case in the area. And so you learn, oh, this is a new standard now that I need to apply. There are times when you... Um, disagree, that people can disagree about the way in which the law works. And that's why we have panels, uh, because people have different, judges can have different perspectives and in good faith reach different results. And so um, obviously when you're on the trial court, the, the court of appeals uh, is binding and they tell you, um, in this case, no, we're going to the, the result is something different, and so you learn. But, you know, um, anytime I had an opportunity to argue a case at an appellate level, I don't think I ever thought about who nominated or appointed the judges as before. I just want to know what I would think about their experience, and I would think about that when I made the argument, not... I don't think I've ever had the opportunity to argue before anybody had your breadth of legal experience here. You served as a federal trial court, a federal appellate court judge for almost 10 years. You've clerked at all three levels of the federal judiciary. You practiced law as a federal public defender in private practice, and I know we... Uh, confirmed you as a member of the U.S. Sentencing Commission. This may seem like a, an easy question, but I just ask you that you've had such broad ex experience, but they're all different in a way. How does that uh, how does that shape your approach when deciding a case? Well, thank you, Senator. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I have um, a methodology that I apply when I'm deciding cases. And maybe my various experiences helped me to get to the point of understanding the importance 
of impartiality, um, staying in my lane as a judge, because the prior experiences were different roles in the system. Because I saw the different roles, um, I think I have a good appreciation of what it means to be a judge and the limitations on my own authority. The Sentencing Commission was a policymaking branch of the judicial um, branch that the, the, the commission and the commissioners develop sentencing policy. Um, Congress delegated that authority to create the, the commission, and so they're doing the, the, the policy work, gathering data, making recommendations. That is totally different than the work that I do as a judge. Advocacy um, on behalf of your clients, making critical arguments, the best arguments you can come up with, um, is a service to the court, but it's a totally different thing than operating as a judge. And so I think that having had those various experiences, I'm now uh, really mindful of my role and limitations in the, the judicial branch. Well, and the, and the president referred to you as a proven consensus builder, and I think he was also thinking of uh, your predecessor, uh, Justice Breyer, in that regard. And I think uh, over the years how important that is, even in a body like the U.S. Senate. I see Senator Tillis here. He and I have worked together on IP issues. Uh, Senator Cornyn and I on fr uh, freedom of information issues. Senator Grassley and I on other issues. Senator Graham and I on, on various issues. And um, and usually, in the Senate at least, if you work across uh, the ideological spectrum, uh, you get better results. So let me ask you, how would you describe your approach to building consensus on cases related to issues like intellectual property that are less likely to break up? break along traditional uh, ideological lines. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator. One of the things that I was able to do when I worked on the Sentencing Commission um, was work with people who had very different perspectives than I did about um, the criminal justice system and come to consensus. It's very important, as you've said, to try to find common ground. And Justice Breyer was such a wonderful model, a role model for that kind of um, ability as a Supreme Court justice. It's something I learned from him and um, something I tried to model in my work on the commission, that I try to model in my work as an appellate judge, and that I would model or, or do <laughs> if I were confirmed to the Supreme Court. Thank you, Chair Durbin. Thanks, Senator Leahy. And now, Senator Graham. Thank you, uh, Judge. Again, congratulations. I want to talk to you a little bit about family and faith, because in your opening statement, and the people who uh, introduced you to the committee, uh, there was very glowing praise of uh, you as a person, a good friend. Uh, you have a wonderful family. You should be proud, and your faith matters to you. What faith are you, by the way? Senator, I am um, Protestant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Non-denominational. Okay. Could you fairly judge a Catholic? Senator, I have a record of I fairly think the answer would be yes. judging I everyone. I believe you can. I'm just <laughs> yeah. asking this question because how important is your faith to you? Senator, personally... Um, my faith is very important, um, but as you know, there's no religious test in the Constitution under under Article Six, and there will be none with me. And <laughs> um, it, it's very important to set aside one's personal views. Yeah, 
about I, things I, I, in I, the role of a judge. I couldn't agree with you more, and I believe you can. So uh, on a scale of one to 10, how faithful would you say you are in terms of religion? You know, I go to church probably three times a year, so that speaks poorly of me. <laughs> or do you, do you attend church regularly? Well, Senator, I am reluctant to talk about my faith in this way just because I want to be um, mindful of the need for the public to uh, have confidence in my ability to separate out my personal views. Well, how would you feel if a senator up here said, your faith, the dogma lives loudly within you and that's of concern? How would you feel if somebody up here on our side said, you know, you attend church too much for me or your faith is a little bit different to me and they would suggest that it would affect your decision? Would you find that offensive? Senator, I'm... I'm... I would if I were you. I found it offensive when they said it about Judge Barrett. The reason I ask these questions is I have no doubt that your faith is important to you, and I have zero doubt that you can adjudicate people's cases fairly if they're an atheist. If I had any doubt, I would, I would say so. But the only reason I mention this, Judge, you're reluctant to talk about it because it's uncomfortable. Just imagine what would happen if people on late night television called you an effing nut speaking in tongues because you practiced the Catholic faith in a way they uh, couldn't relate to or found uncomfortable. So, Judge, you should be proud of your faith. I am convinced that whatever faith you have and how often you go to church, it will not affect your ability to be fair. And I just hope going in the future that we all can accept that and that uh, Judge Barrett, I thought, was treated very, very poorly. Um, so I just wanted to get that out. Let's talk about family. Uh, do you know Janice Rogers Brown? Yes, I do know her. Okay, how do you know her? She was a judge on uh, the court that I now serve. We didn't overlap, and I'm struggling to remember whether I ever met her, but she was a, a judge on the circuit court. Right, and you were a district court judge, is that right? I was, but I don't know whether she had I think you were. Retired are they, are the they in the same building? They are in the same building. Okay. They are in so the you same. really don't know her? I know of her, yes. Okay. What do you know of her? What's her reputation? Um, I know that she's a very well-respected judge on my circuit. Okay. And in terms of family, she was the daughter and granddaughter of share, sharecroppers. She was raised in Alabama under Jim Crow. Despite this adversity, she put herself through law school as a single working mother. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? Yes, Senator. Your background is very impressive. You seem to have a great family. Uh, if family mattered, we would not have done to her what was done to her here in the United States Senate. Do you realize that she was filibustered for two years when she was appointed the D.C. Circuit? I didn't know that. Did you know that Joe Biden actively filibustered Janice Rogers Brown? I did not know that. Did you know that he told Face the Nation, if Bush nominates her for the Supreme Court, I can assure you that would be a very, very, very difficult fight, and she probably would be filibustered. Is that news to you, too? Yes. Okay. Now that you know that, how do you feel about it? Senator, I can't speak to something that I just learned two seconds ago in your okay, fair enough. conversation with me. Fair enough. Um, you're in the Black Law School Society, right? At the Harvard. Black Law Students Association. Okay. okay, Black Law Students Association. Yes. You're a member at Harvard. Yes. And in some time, the Mr. Jeffries thing, do you remember that whole dust up? He got only in um, preparation for this, and I think it, I was in college at the time. It was my senior year of college. Okay, so you weren't actually in the group when he was invited to speak. I don't know which group um, invited him to speak. I was a black student at Harvard, both 
in the Harvard Undergraduate mm -hmm. Black Students Association and the Harvard Law School Black right. Students Association. Do you remember going to a speech given by Mr. Jeffries? I think he's the uncle of Akeem Jeffries. I did not go to a speech okay. given by Mr. Jeffries. Are you now familiar with the press reports about what Mr. Jeffries' views are? Just in preparation for this. Okay. And you do, do you associate yourself with those views? I do not, Senator. As a matter of fact, he's been called by many as very anti-Semitic. He called you skunk who stink up the place. You don't agree with that, do you? I do not, Senator. And it would be wrong for me or anybody else to hold his statement against you because he spoke at some group you're a member of, right? Senator, I don't have... Yes, it would. It would be. Yeah, that, that's right. That's the right answer. I thought that was the right answer with Judge Alito. When they made a big deal about some group he was in that had views that he didn't agree with and tried to call him basically a racist and found out that Senator Kennedy, God rest his soul, who beat the crap out of the guy for being part of some supper club that was actually in some organization called the OWL that didn't admit women. So I guess the reason I'm bringing all this up is it gives me a chance to remind this committee in America there are two standards going on here. If you're an African-American conservative woman, you're fair game to have your life turned upside down, to be filibustered no matter how qualified you are, and if you express your faith as a conservative, all of a sudden you're an effing nut. And we're tired of it. And it's not going to happen to you. But it just appalls me that we can have such a system in America that if a conservative woman wants to stand out and say, I love my family just as much as you love yours, and my faith means just as much to me as it does you, that all of a sudden there comes some kind of weirdo. A guy like Justice Alito, who's in the same type situation you're in, being in a group, doesn't agree with everything they do or what people may say at a meeting he didn't go to, all of a sudden they own it. You know, this stuff needs to stop. Our people deserve better respect, and I hope when this is over, people will say you were at least well treated, even if we don't agree with you. Uh, so now let's talk about Gitmo. Being a public defender, did you consider that rewarding? Senator, yes, um, I did, because public service is very important to me. It is an important family value. It is something that now I've dedicated my career to. Yes, and do you think it's important to the system that everybody be represented? Absolutely, it's a core constitutional value. You'll get no complaint from me. <clears throat> that was my job in the Air Force. I was a area defense counsel. I represented anybody that came in the door, whether I liked them or not. I did my best. Is that what you did? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Now, so the American people deserve a system where everybody's represented, where you like them or not, and anybody that takes up that cause, no problem with me. You're just doing your job, and I think you make our country stronger. But there's the other side of the story that never gets mentioned when I talk about Gitmo. The American people deserve a system that can keep terrorists off the battlefield. They deserve a system that understands the difference between being at war and a crime. Do you consider 9-11, you said, a terrible, tragic event? Would you consider it an act of war? Yes, Senator. Okay, I would too. I think it was an act of war by al-Qaeda and associated groups against the people of the United States. So as you rightfully are proud of your service as a public defender and you represent the Gitmo detainees, which is part of our system, I want you to understand and the nation to understand what's been happening at Gitmo. What's the recidivism rate at Gitmo? Senator, I'm not aware. It's 31 percent. How does that strike you? Is that any, high, low, and, and, about right? I don't, I don't know how it strikes me overall. You know how it strikes I, me? It strikes me as terrible. Yes, that's what I was going to say. Okay, good. We found common ground. Of the 229 detainees uh, 
release from Gitmo, uh, 729 released, 229 have gone back to the fight. Here's some of the notables. Uh, former Gitmo detainee Zakir was named the interim defense minister of Afghanistan. I don't know exactly what his job is today, but during the transition, they made him the defense minister and he was in Gitmo. Of the five men we released from Gitmo as part of prisoner swap for Sergeant Bergdale, here's, what, here's where they're at. Mohammed Fazal was appointed deputy minister of defense. Nor was appointed acting minister of borders and travel affairs. Waziki was appointed as acting intelligence director. Care again, Acting Minister of Information, Culture, Defense. Omar was appointed as new governor of the southeastern province of Coast. These were five people that we had in our control that are now helping the Taliban run the country. Would you say that our system in terms of releasing people needs to be re-looked at? Senator, what I'd say is that that's not a job for the courts in this way that um as an american but, does that bother you well obviously senator any um repeated criminal behavior or repeated attacks acts of war bother me as an yeah, american well it, it bothers me while i will not hold it against you nor should i the fact that you represent gitmo detainees i think it's time to look at this system new folks when 31% of the people are going back to fight to kill Americans and <clears throat> now running the Taliban government, we have gone wrong somewhere. Uh, are we still at war? Um, so the AUMF, the authorization for military force, is still in effect. Congress has authorized uh, the use of force against people in, um, in this way. But do you personally believe that Al-Qaeda, ISIS-type groups are still at war with us? I think, yes. I mean, I think we... So we're still in a state of war with certain elements of radical Islam to this very day? I believe that's documented, yes. Okay. Now, what's the process to determine whether one's an enemy combatant under our law? Well, um, I believe that the executive branch makes an assessment um, of whether or not someone is taken up arms against the United States somewhere in the world related to all of this. Okay. So it's an executive branch function to determine whether or not this person qualifies as an enemy combatant. Well, I believe that they make it under the current law. Under current law, um, I believe that determination is made by the executive branch, and the person is put into, is detained, um, and then the question becomes whether they are able to bring some sort of legal challenge to that. They have a habeas right. Yes. Okay. So the law is that the executive branch determines if you're an enemy combatant. And under our law, you can appeal that decision to a federal court through habeas. Is that correct? I believe that's correct. Okay. Is it your view that we can hold enemy combatants as long as they're a threat to the United States? I believe that's what the Supreme Court has determined. Okay. Did you argue that that should not be the case before in an amicus brief? I'm trying to think. I had two amicus briefs briefs that I worked on, or three technically, but two different cases. Well, um, we'll have another visit tomorrow. So yes. Go back and check. Yes. I'm pretty sure that in your brief you argued that the executive branch should not have the ability to hold an enemy combatant indefinitely. You need to try them through some process or release them. Yes, Senator. As you were um, talking, I my clients... The Cato Institute, the Rutherford Institute, mm -hmm. and the Constitution Project made that argument um, and asked me to draft their brief. Yes. Well, do you agree with that argument? Senator, my um, 
responsibility was to make my client's arguments. And as a nominee to the Supreme Court, that's the kind of issue. The Supreme well, Court did not address that issue. They, in fact, um, the case became moot. Did, and so did you organize an effort to get 20 judges to, to file a brief the Supreme Court on this issue? Not on that issue, no, on Senator. On another issue? Yes, Senator. Okay, did you actively go out and recruit 20 judges to help you file a brief on another issue regarding law of war detention? Not technically. Um, what do you mean by that? What I mean is that I was at Morrison and Forrester, which was my law firm, in the Supreme Court and appellate group. One of the partners at Morrison and Forrester was a um, former federal judge who wanted to make this argument and who said, we, I have former federal judges who are friends of mine who would like to join with me to make this argument. So I worked with her, the partner at my firm, who was a former federal judge, mm -hmm. to make. So it was her idea to get former judges to write this. Yes. Not yours. Yes. And you just helped in the implementation of that idea. So, Senator, as a member of the Supreme Court and appellate group in a law firm, that is the practice. Right. Now, now I'm asking. Amicus was, practice. Yes. It wasn't your idea. It was somebody else. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, now, there are people still held at Gitmo today. Do you, do you understand that? Yes. Okay. What system is in place regarding their future? I am not aware of the system right now. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly well, what you let mean. let me tell you what it is. Yes. There's a periodic review process made up of an interagency where they go through the files of these folks and they determine whether or not they still present a threat to the United States or the world at large. And I think it's six months, maybe a year. But that goes on, at least on an annual basis. And if there's a determination that this person still represents a threat to the United States, uh, they're continued to be confined. That's the way the system works. Are you okay with that? As a policy matter, Senator, I'm, I'm not speaking to my it, views. That, that's, my understanding is that the periodic review yeah. system is an executive branch determination of whether or not they're going to continue to hold people that they... Does that make sense to you as a way to deal with these detainees? Senator, I'm not in a position to speak to the policy or the discretion of the executive branch regarding how they're going to handle detainees. The reason I mention it is because in one of the briefs, you argued that the executive branch doesn't have that option. That if, we, if you had had your way, the executive branch could not do periodic reviews about the the danger the detainee presents to the United States, they would have to make a decision of trying them or releasing them. Is Re that not accurate? Respectfully, Senator, it was not my argument. Really? I was filing an amicus brief on behalf of clients, including the Rutherford Institute, the Cato Institute, and the Constitution Project, who- what, what, when, you, when you sign on to a brief, does it not become your argument? It does not, Senator. If, oh, you wow. are, if you are an attorney and you are representing a client in amicus practice. Well, is that your position uh, when you were in private practice? I mean, you, you sign on to this brief making this argument, but you say it's not your position. I mean, why would you do that if it's not your position? Why would you take a client that has a position like that? Now, this is voluntary. Nobody's making you do this. Oh, Senator, I would, I would refer you to the same sorts of statements that Chief Justice Roberts made when he came before the committee, which is that lawyers represent clients. I, I get that. Make, I, I'm not holding the client's views against you. The, like the, the, the people you're representing at Gitmo, they deserve representation. But this is a amicus brief where you and other people 
try to persuade the court to change policy. The policy I described is a periodic review. If the court had taken the position argued in the brief that you signed upon, we'd have to release these people or try them, and some of them, the evidence we can't disclose because it's classified, you're putting an America in an untenable position. This is not the way you fight a war. If you tried to do this in World War II, they'd run you out of town. We hold enemy combatants as long as they're a threat. There's no magic passage of time that you got to let them go. So my question is very simple. Do you support the idea, did you support then the idea that indefinite detention of an enemy combatant is unlawful? Respectfully, Senator, when you are an attorney and you have clients who come to you whether they pay or not, you represent their positions before the court. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure everybody at Gitmo wants out. No, I got that. This is an amicus brief, and I, I just don't understand what you're saying, quite frankly. I'm not holding it against you because you represented a legal position I disagree with. I mean, that happens all the time. I'm just trying to understand what made you join this cause. And you say somebody hired you, but did you feel okay in adopting that cause? I mean... When you signed on to the brief, were you not advocating that position to the court? Senator, as uh, a judge now, okay. in order to determine the lawfulness or unlawfulness of any particular issue, I need to receive briefs and information making positions on all sides. No, I, I got what a judge is all about. I, listen, I'm not asking you to decide the case in front of me right here. I'm asking me to explain a position you took as a lawyer regarding the law of war, and I am beyond confused. I know what you said in your brief. Whether I agree with it or not, it's not the point. I just want you to understand that it's important for all of us to know where you were coming from. If that brief had been accepted by the court, it would be impossible for us to fight this war because there's some people going to die in jail and get mo and never go to trial for a lot of good reasons because the evidence against them is so sensitive we can't disclose it to the public, that we're not charging them with a crime. What we're doing is saying that you engage in hostile activities against the United States, that you are an enemy combatant under our law, and you will never be released as long as you're a danger until the war is over or you're no longer a danger. That's the difference between fighting a crime and a war. Uh, did you ever accuse in one of your habeas petitions the government of acting as war criminals for holding the detainees That, that I'm, I'm, the holding of the detainees by, by our government, that we were acting as war criminals. Senator, I don't remember that accusation, but I will say that... Uh, Do you believe that's true, that America was acting as war criminals in holding these detainees? Senator, the Supreme Court held that the executive branch has the authority to detain people who are designated as enemy combatants um, for the duration of the hostilities. And what I was doing in the context of the habeas petitions at this very early stage in the process was making allegations to preserve issues on behalf of my clients. A habeas petition is like a, a complaint that lawyers make allegations. You know, I've been a lawyer too, but I don't think it's necessary to call the government a war criminal in pursuing charges against a terrorist. I just think that's too far. I don't know why he chose those words. That's just too far. But um, we are where we are. So let's talk about um, <clears throat> the nomination process. Have you ever had any interaction with a group called Demand Justice? No. Directly or indirectly? No. Uh, have you ever had an interaction with a group called American Prospect? No. Do you know anything about uh, Ar Ar Arbella? Is that the right term? 
Have you ever heard of a group called Arbella? I've heard of a group that I think is Arabella or something yeah, I, like I that. Yeah, you're right. Not yes. A, uh, Arabella. Yeah. Do you know anything about them? Have you had any contact with them? No. Okay. Uh, in <clears throat> your nomination, did you notice that people from the left were pretty much cheering you on? A lot of people were cheering me on, That's Senator. That's true. That's true. Did you know that a lot of people from the left were trying to destroy Michelle Childs? Did you notice that? Senator, a lot of people were supporting various people for this nomination. So you're saying you didn't know there was a concerted effort to disqualify Judge Childs from South Carolina because she was a union busting, unreliable Republican in disguise? Senator, I was. I'm a sitting judge. I yeah. was focused but, but, on my but, cases. Well, the answer I, is no, I didn't know that. No, I didn't know that. <clears throat> Would it bother you if, sir, uh, if that happened? S Senator, it, it is troublesome that people are or were doing things related to I think the that's nomination. the best way to, to say it. People have a right to speak out and pick the person of their choice. But all I can say is that if you miss the fact that there was an organized effort, well, here's President Biden has only a certain amount of political capital for keeping his party united. If he needlessly angers progressives on this SCOTUS pick, that could create all sorts of problems for him down the line. Jeff Hauser, revolving door projects. Uh, let's see. I just got so many quotes. It's difficult to imagine someone with a record like Judge Childs winning votes from criminal justice advocates like Senator Cory Booker, even Dick Durbin. Uh, Childs' experience is nothing like the diversity of experience that the Biden administration has championed. Uh, this just, let's see. Picking her, Childs, would demoralize the base, side with corporate America. The fact that Lindsey Graham is vouching for her should give the White House pause. Our revolution, Joseph Gervonji, or whatever his name is, I'm sorry about that, Joseph. He's Bernie Sanders' PAC director. You didn't know that all those people were declaring war on Judge Childs? Senator, I did not. Okay. Well, <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm not saying you did. I, you said you didn't know. I'll take it your word. But I am saying that what is your judicial philosophy? So I have a methodology that I use in my cases in order to ensure that I am uh, ruling impartially and that- So your judicial philosophy is to rule impartially? No, my judicial philosophy is to rule impartially and to rule consistent with the limitations on my authority as a judge. And so my methodology actually helps me to do that in every case. So you wouldn't say that you're an activist judge? I would not say that. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll have a 20 minutes more later on, but here's what I would say. That every group that wants to pack the court, that believes this court is a bunch of right-wing nuts that are going to destroy America, that consider the Constitution trash, all wanted you picked. And this is all I can say, is the fact that so many of these left-wing radical groups that would destroy the law as we know it declared war on Michelle Childs and supported you is problematic for me. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Graham. Let me mention uh, a few points here. Uh, Congressman Jim Clyburn was a strong supporter of Michelle Childs, and now I believe he is publicly supporting your nomination and Michelle Childs has been nominated by President Biden uh, to be a circuit judge, and she will be considered by this committee as quickly as possible. On the issue of Guantanamo, there are currently 39 Guantanamo detainees remaining. The annual budget for Guantanamo is $540 million per year, which means each of these detainees uh, is being held at the expense of 12 or $13 million per year. If they would be incarcerated at Florence, Colorado, the supermax prison, federal prison, the amount would be dramatically, dramatically less. 
Since 9-11, nearly 1,000 convicted in the United States on terrorism charges. Since 2009, with the beginning of the Obama administration, the recidivism rate of Guantanamo detainees released is 5 percent. So Mr. Chairman, according to the Department, uh, Director of National Intelligence, is 31 percent. Somebody is wrong here. If you're going to talk about what I said, I'm going to respond to what you said. If we close Gitmo and move them to Colorado, do you support indefinite detention under the law of war for these detainees? I would just say uh, I'm giving the facts. And I the want answer to make, is no. I want to make sure that it's clear. The 31 percent you referred to goes back to the year 2009. What does it matter when it goes back to we had them and they got loose and they started killing people? Well, I could just say that uh, if you're one of the people killed in 2005, does it matter to you when we release them? Suggest that a president of your own party released them in. I'm suggesting the system has failed miserably, and advocates to change this system, like she was in, was was advocating, would destroy our ability to protect this country. We're at war. We're not fighting a crime. This is not some passage of time event. As long as they're dangerous, I hope they all die in jail if they're going to go back and kill Americans. It won't bother me one bit if 39 of them die in prison. That's a better outcome than letting them go. And if it costs $500 million to keep them in jail, keep them in jail because they're going to go back to the fight. Look at the friggin' Afghan government. It's made up of former detainees at Gitmo. This whole thing by the left about this war ain't working. Let me also note that Larry Thompson, who served as Deputy Attorney General under President George W. Bush, Orrin Kerr, Special Counsel, Viet Den, who served as Assistant Attorney General for Legal Policy in the George W. Bush Administration, John Bellinger, and former D.C. Circuit Judge, Solicitor General, and Independent Counsel Ken Starr, were also prominent conservative lawyers signing a letter defending attorneys who represented Guantanamo Bay detainees. Uh, I don't believe that we should associate uh, that activity as being inconsistent with our constitutional values. We are going to represent, uh, we're going to re at this point recognize uh, Senator Feinstein and then take a break after she has completed her questioning. Senator Feinstein. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I just would like to compliment the witness. I think you're doing very well. And as you can see, this is a bit of a tough place. <laughs> so, uh, Judge. Uh, one of the issues that I often discuss with nominees, particularly to the Supreme Court, is the issue of abortion. I've asked the three most recent Supreme Court nominees about this issue, and so I'd like to discuss it a bit with you today. In 2017, I asked Justice Gorsuch about this during his confirmation hearing. I asked him to expand on a comment he had made about his belief that precedent is important because it adds stability to the law. In response, Justice Gorsuch reiterated his belief that precedent is important because, and I quote, once a case is settled, that adds to the determinancy of the law, end quote. He also stated that Roe has been reaffirmed many times. I also spoke with Judge Kavanaugh about this issue in 2018. I asked him whether he believes that Roe was settled raw, and if so, whether it was correctly settled. Justice Kavanaugh said that Roe, quote, is settled as a precedent of the Supreme Court, end quote. He said that Roe, quote, has been reaffirmed many times over the past 45 years and most prominently, most importantly, reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, end quote. And he described Casey as having the value of a precedent on precedent, end quote. I most recently spoke about this issue with Justice Barrett in 2020. I asked her whether she agreed with Justice Scalia's view that Roe was wrongly decided. She committed to, quote, obey all the rules of stare decisis, end quote, if faced with the question of whether to overrule Casey. She said she had, quote, no agenda to try to overrule Casey, end quote. So here's the question. Do you agree with Justice Kavanaugh that Roe v. Wade is settled as a precedent 
And will you, like Justice Barrett, commit to obey all the rules of stare decisis in cases related to the issue of abortion? End quote. Thank you, Senator. Um, I do agree with both Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett on this issue. Uh, Roe and Casey are the settled law of the Supreme Court concerning the right to terminate a woman's pregnancy. Um, they have established a framework that the court has reaffirmed. And in order to revisit, as Justice Barrett said, uh, the Supreme Court looks at various factors because stare decisis is a very important principle. Uh, it provides and establishes uh, predictability, stability. Uh, it also serves as, as a restraint in this way on the exercise of judicial authority because the court looks at whether or not uh, precedents are, are relied upon, whether they're workable, um, in addition to whether or not they're wrong, um, and, and other factors as well. So I agree with uh, both of, of those statements that you read. Well, let me add one to that, and then we'll move on. Um, I'm particularly interested in the case of Roe v. Wade. Um, Roe was decided by nearly, nearly 50 years ago, and it's been reaffirmed over a dozen times since then. So my question is this. Does Roe v. Wade have the status of being a case that is a super precedent, and what other Supreme Court cases do you believe have that status? Well, Senator, all Supreme Court cases are precedential, they're binding, and um, they, their principles and their rulings have to be followed. Roe and Casey, um, as you say, have been reaffirmed by the court and um, have been relied upon. And reliance is one of the factors that the court considers when it seeks to um, revisit or when it's asked to revisit, um, revisit a precedent. And in all cases, those the precedents of the Supreme Court would have to be reviewed uh, pursuant to those factors, because stare decisis is very important. Thank you. If you are confirmed, you would be one of only two justices who has also served on a federal district court, the other being jo Justice Sotomayor. In your eight years as a trial judge on the D.C. District Court, you wrote nearly 600 opinions and presided over nine jury trials and three bench trials. As you know from your service on the district court, it's important for appeals courts, and especially the Supreme Court, to be clear in their decisions. The clarity is necessary, as you well know, for trial judges to effectively do their job and properly apply legal precedents that are fair and consistent. As a district judge, you were responsible for applying precedent from the Supreme Court and the courts of appeal to your case. And now as a judge in the DC circuit, you're drafting those precedents. Your experience as a trial judge is one of your most significant assets. And I just wanna add a personal comment. This is a tough place and you are handling it very well. And um, I appreciate your directness uh, and think that's important. Here's a question. I have two related questions. How did you make sure that you were properly applying the relevant precedents as a district court um, judge? And if you're confirmed to the Supreme Court, what would you do to make sure your opinions are clear so they could be applied correctly by district courts. Thank you, Senator. As you noted, um, in my time as a district court judge, I had 
um, the opportunity to apply precedents that were handed down by the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. Uh, the district court is bound by the law as stated by those other uh, tribunals, and I was very uh, focused on making sure that I found the right precedents and applied them faithfully. As I mentioned, uh, with respect to my methodology, part of the process is receiving information from the parties in a case. And the parties write briefs, and uh, in most cases, they identify the precedents that they at least believe are applicable. And then um, the court does its own legal research as well uh, to determine whether all of the relevant cases have been identified. Uh, and then you look to see whether there's anything that directly controls, and if it does, that's your answer. Um, in many cases, the precedents might be a um, little bit different in certain ways, and you are assessing the party's arguments and determining within your proper role um, whether what the appellate courts have said provides the law of decision for the case. But what's important, as you've mentioned, is the clarity by which courts of appeals and the Supreme Court um, need to operate in so, so that the lower courts can actually follow the precedents. And I'm very conscious of that, as you said, as someone who has um, had to follow precedent. And I would think carefully about that and, and use, um, use my communication skills to ensure that the precedents are clear so that lower courts can follow them. Thank you. Um, I'd like to discuss, discuss quickly a letter this committee received in support of your nomination from the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And as you know, this is the world's largest professional association of law enforcement leaders. And the letter states, Judge Jackson has several family members in law enforcement, and we believe this has given her a deep understanding of and an appreciation for the challenges and complexities confronting the policing profession. During her time as a judge, she has displayed her dedication to ensuring that our communities are safe and that the interests of justice are served. And so, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to put this letter in the record, if I may. Without objection. Thank you. I understand that your brother served with the Baltimore Police Department for several years. So here's the question. How, if at all, has having several family members in law enforcement impacted your understanding of the law or your approach to your judicial service? Thank you, Senator. Um, some of my earliest memories, in addition to my father at the kitchen table with his law books um, were of my uncles. Two of my uncles were career law enforcement and um, one was a detective, uniform detective, one was a um, city of Miami police department uh, officer, patrol officer for a long time before he became the chief. And I remember very well, um, we would go to my grandmother's house on Sundays, and um, she would make a big dinner for our family, and my uncles would sometimes come off of their shifts. So I see in my mind their uniforms um, coming in, and they would always, um, they'd be carrying their weapons, and they'd take them off and put them way up high on the china cabinet so the kids couldn't get to them. And I remember feeling very proud of them and the service that they um, provided. And I think it's probably what led my brother, who is 10 years younger than I am, to decide that after he graduated from college, he would want to also be in law enforcement. So I'm 
very familiar with um, law enforcement, the important service that they provide, um, the perils of being out on the street, protecting and serving and having a family that cares about you and worries about your safety. Um, and so this is not something that is, that is unfamiliar and, and I'm very gratified by the support of the group that you mentioned and other law enforcement groups as I go through this process. I joined this committee in January of 1993 and a few months later, we considered the nomination of Ruth Bader Ginsburg to the Supreme Court. Justice Ginsburg's confirmation made her only the second woman to ever serve on the Supreme Court after Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. So we have come a very long way since then, though still not far enough. Women now make up about 35% of active judges on the federal district bench and 37% of active judges on the federal appeals courts. Judge Jackson, if confirmed, you would become the sixth woman to ever serve on the Supreme Court. You would join Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, and Barrett on the bench. This would be the nearest we have ever come to gender equity on the Supreme Court. There would be four women on a court with nine justices. So I have my own thoughts about why gender balance is important on our nation's courts. But I'd really like you to tell us all what are your thoughts on what it means for our country to have women serve in meaningful members, meaning, meaningful numbers on the federal bench, and in particular, what it would mean to have four women serving on the Supreme Court for the first time in history. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think it's extremely meaningful. Um, one of the things that having uh, diverse members of the court does is it provides for the opportunity for role models. Um, since I was nominated to this position, I have received so many notes and letters and photos from little girls around the country who tell me that they are so excited for this opportunity and that they have thought about the law in new ways um, because I am a woman, because I am a black woman, all of those things people have said have been really meaningful to them. And, and we want, I think, as a country for everyone to believe that they can do things like sit on the Supreme Court. And so having meaningful numbers of women and um, people of color, I think, matters. I also think that it, it, um, it supports public confidence in the judiciary when you have uh, different people because we have such a diverse society. Well, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, this is often a hard place. And how you go through those hard times, I really think, is... Um, the most important thing. And it's pretty clear to me that you go through hard times by holding your head up high and doing well. So I thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, uh, Senator Feinstein. We're going to take a break. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's take 15 minutes starting now, and then we'll return to more questions. We'll have a lunch break this later this afternoon in the earlier part of the afternoon.
Sorry. If I could just get you to take a step sure, sure, sure. so we can see that. Yeah, I'm also going to go down. Uh, let me know if she, she's at the end of the hall, right? Yeah. Would you know. say? Is so you want me to take a step forward? Uh, I'm staying right here. I mean, yeah, you don't right think there. I can tackle, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that one. Okay. If I get a running start, you know, I might, I might make you stumble a little bit. I'll allow it. No worries. You'll allow it? Just go. I have bad knees right now, so it'd be perfectly fine. But aim low, yeah. is what you're saying? Especially with this floor right now, kind of hurting. I'd rather be out of way now. No, no, you're not. I'm, I'm going to be right there and down low. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Hi. How are you? Fine. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Okay. Not going to be selfish. Right. How do you if we. We're all, we just, oh, we, oh, if, okay. I'm happy if you can just give us until she comes back in, and then if, you, if there's something you want to say, I just want to make sure, I need to make sure I get that. Thank you. Jackson, how's it going so far?
Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. Um, we're going to have two senators ask questions and then break for lunch somewhere around an hour from now. Senators Cornyn and White House will be recognized in succession. First, Senator Cornyn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge, I want, want you to do me a favor. Um, will you nerd out with me a little bit? Uh, um, I will try, Senator. And we'll, we'll start with stare decisis. Yes. And I've never figured out why lawyers speak in Latin rather than in English uh, when describing these concepts by which judges apply precedent. But would you agree with me that um, even under an appropriate stare decisis uh, analysis that Dred Scott and Plessy versus Ferguson were appropriately overruled by the Supreme Court? Well, Senator, um, I've not engaged in the actual analysis, but I think it is well established now um, that the cases um, that overruled uh, Dred Scott and Plessy were um, correctly decided. Yeah, I mean, there, there is the, a means by which the courts can correct their mistakes, correct, by overruling uh, previous decisions? If the various considerations that the Supreme Court has uh, uses to make that determination and are have satisfied. You, have you ever heard a federal judge talk about super-duper president or super-precedent? I have not. I've never seen it either in any opinion. I've heard it here in the uh, Judiciary Committee on a number of occasions when somebody has a favorite case or outcome that they don't want to see the Supreme Court revisit. Um, let me ask a minute. Obviously, your uh, nomination by President Biden is historic, and I congratulate you again, congratulated you previously, and I think it's uh, been long overdue. When Clarence Thomas, the second African-American who was uh, nominated to and confirmed by the Supreme Court, was nominated to the court, did you celebrate that as a historic event? I'm trying to remember where I was at the time. I believe I did, yes. When we're talking about staying in your lane, uh, and I appreciate your responses to a number of the questions, even though I'd love to get your answer to the question, but where you've deferred answering, saying you want to stay in your lane and not be uh, seen as a policymaker, uh, would you agree with me that one of the most important questions under our constitutional form of government and the separation of powers is who decides? In other words, some questions are appropriately decided by judges who are elected, or unelected, excuse me, serve for life, insulated from politics, and other decisions are appropriately within the, um, left up to the legislative branch because they are, we are accountable to the people who can vote for us, they can vote against us, um, if they don't like the policies that we, uh, that we enact in legislation. Would you agree with, that who decides is an important question in terms of determining the appropriate role for both the judiciary and the uh, legislature? As a general matter, I agree. It rarely comes directly like that as an issue. It's, it's, it's usually not a jump ball between, <laughs> um, between I, the I, legislature and the executive. I get it. You don't get a lot of easy, easy questions. Well, um, but well, you, as a general proposition, you won't uh, disagree with me. What I'd say is that the courts are properly tasked with resolving legal Questions and that, cases or controversies, well, right? Exactly, in right. every case, and Congress is not similarly constrained. We can pass broad policies, comprehensive legislation, changing policy. But the difference is one of the differences is the voters can unelect us if they don't like what we're doing. That is true. I want to ask you: What did you study under Lawrence Tribe when you were at Harvard? I did not. Well. As you know, Justice Breyer, your mentor, wrote a little book 
called Active Liberty. And um, Lawrence Tribe, who uh, was a formerly a law professor at Harvard, wrote a review of that book in the New York Times Review of Books, and the title of it is Politicians in Robes. Are you familiar with that article? I am not. Well, in the article, Professor Tribe accuses Justice Breyer of engaging in what he calls a noble lie. And he said, he talks about the morality of resorting to falsehoods and delusions to conceal, usually from the masses, but sometimes from oneself, the truths whose revelation would wreak havoc or at least do more harm than good. Professor Tribe goes on in criticizing Justice Breyer's book. He says in his stubborn, stubborn av avowal that the court, even with its current far-right supermajority, remains an apolitical body, he perpetuates a lie that is anything but noble. You've talked about staying in your lane, not making policy decisions, not being seen as political. Do you agree with Justice Breyer that, or with Professor Tribe? Senator, um, I believe that judges are not policymakers, that um, we have a constitutional duty to decide only cases and controversies that are presented before us, and within that framework, uh, judges exercise their authority to interpret the law and not make the law. So you would, you would agree with me that judges should not be politicians? Yes. Let me talk to you a little bit about some of the decisions that have been made by the Supreme Court over many years, starting perhaps with Dred, Dred Scott, that adopts the substantive due process argument to determine the constitutionality of, um, of various laws. Perhaps the most recent decision by the Supreme Court that was a dramatic departure from, uh, from previous laws in the states and in the nation was the Oberfell case, which um, dealt with same-sex marriage. In the opinions that were written there, it was noted that here we are 200, at the time, 234 years after the Constitution had been ratified, 135 years since the 14th Amendment had been ratified, that the Supreme Court articulated a, a new fundamental right, which is a right to same-sex marriage. You're familiar with that case, aren't you? I am. At the time, it was noted that 11 states, including the District of Columbia, had, had passed laws sanctioning same-sex marriage. But also at the same time, there were 35 states who put it on the ballot, and 32 of those states decided to maintain the traditional definition of marriage between a man and a woman. Do you agree with me that uh, marriage is not simply a governmental institution, it's also a religious institution? Well, Senator, um Marriages are often performed in re religious institutions. Well, when the, when the, you agree with me that many of the, the major religions that I can think of, and they're Christianity, Judaism, Islam, embrace a traditional definition of marriage, correct? I am aware that there are various religious faiths that define marriage in a traditional way. Do you, um, do you see that when the Supreme Court makes a dramatic pronouncement about the invalidity of state marriage laws, that it will inevitably set in conflict um, between 
those who ascribe to the Supreme Court's edict and those who have a firmly held religious belief that marriage is between a man and a woman? Well, Senator, I, I, these issues are being litigated, as you know, throughout the courts as people um, raise issues. And so it's, I'm limited in what I, I can say about them. I'm aware that there are cases. Um, no, I'm not asking you to decide a case or predict how you would decide in the future. I'm just asking, isn't it apparent that when the Supreme Court decides that something that is not even in the Constitution is a fundamental right and no state can pass any law that conflicts with the Supreme Court's edict, particularly in an area where people have sincerely held religious beliefs, doesn't that necessarily create a conflict between what people may believe is a matter of their religious doctrine or faith and what the federal government says is the law of the land? Well, Senator, that is the nature of a right, that um, when there is a right, um, it means that there are limitations on regulation, even if uh, people are regulating pursuant to their sincerely held religious beliefs. You agree with marriage is not mentioned in the Constitution, is it? It is not mentioned directly, no. And um, religious freedom and um, is mentioned in the First Amendment explicitly, correct? It is. Do you share my concern that when the court takes on the role of identifying an unenumerated right, in other words, it's not mentioned in the Constitution, and creates a new right, declaring that anything conflicting with that is unconstitutional, that it creates a circumstance where those who may hold traditional beliefs, like something as important as marriage, that they will be um, vilified as unwilling to assent to this new orthodoxy? So, Senator, I understand that concern, and because there are cases that are addressing these sorts of issues, I'm not in a position to comment about either my personal views or whether... I'm not ask, and I'm not asking you to. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, Justice Alito, in the, uh, in the Oberfeld case wrote, he said, I assume those who cling to the old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes. But if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots and treated as such by government, employers, and schools. So the Oberfeld case, we to nerd out with you again, was... Um, was decided under a doctrine known as substantive due process, correct? If memory serves, I, um, yes, substantive due process, and I think there might have been equal protection concerns. And the, and as the well. court, the Supreme Court has uh, applied that somehow mis fairly mysteriously by saying it's created by the confluence of the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment to the United States Constitution. But historically, it's been applied in ways that uh, seem to sanction explicit policymaking by the courts. For example, the, the Lochner versus New York case, which I know you talked to Senator Lee about in particular, which it was a New Deal case which set limitations on how long bakers could work in New York the Supreme Court struck that down and said it violated the right of free contract. Now, Lochner, as you know, was overruled 30-something years later, but it's also been applied in a number of different circumstances. For example, um, it's been suggested that Dred Scott, which treated slaves as chattel property, was a product of substantive due process Justice Hugo Black has criticized the uh, doctrine of substantive due process 
as the arbitrary fiat of the man or men in power, or the court declaring a law invalid because it shocked the consciences of at least five members of the court. He went on to say this use of judicial review thus subverts the liberty of government by the people overturning laws en enacted by legislators, legislatures who are answerable to the electorate rather than a majority of the Supreme Court. Finally, he said, finally for the purpose of my question, he said the adoption of such a loose, flexible, uncontrolled standard for holding laws unconstitutional, if ever it is finally achieved, will amount to a great unconstitutional shift of power to the courts, which I believe, Justice Black that is, and am constrained to say will be bad for the courts and worse for the country. Judge Justice Jackson, why isn't substantive due process analysis just another form of judicial policy making, which you've suggested policy making is not in your lane, or and you strive to be apolitical, something I, I, I applaud. But why isn't substantive due process just another way for judges to hide their policy making under the guise of interpreting the Constitution? Well, Senator, the justices have interpreted the due process clause of the 14th Amendment to include a substantive provision, the, the, um, the rights to due process. They have interpreted that to mean not just procedural rights relative to government action, but also the protection of certain uh, personal um, rights related to intimacy and autonomy. They include things like um, the, the right to rear one's children, um, I believe the right to travel, the right to marriage, um, interracial marriage, the right uh, to an abortion, the contraception. These treating uh, treating uh, slaves as chattel property. I'm. I don't quite remember the basis for the Dred, Dred Scott opinion, but but I'll trust you that that. Well, the the fact is, is it not that you can use substantive due process to justify basically any result? Well, the court, whether it's conservative or liberal, libertarian or conservative, whatever you would like to call, it's just a it's a mode of analysis by the court that allows the court to substitute its opinion for the elected representatives of the people. And um, and would you agree? The court has um, identified standards for the determination of rights under the 14th Amendment substantive due process. And who, who gives them the right to, to do that? If it's not mentioned in the Constitution, where does the right of the court to substitute its views for that of the elected representatives of the people? Where does that come from? Well, the court has interpreted the 14th Amendment to include this component, um, the unenumerated right to substantive due process, and the court has said that um, that the kinds of things that qualify are implicit in the concept of order, ordered liber liberty, excuse me, or deeply rooted in our nation's history and tradition. Um, those are standards that identify a narrow set of activities. Well, Judge, judge the, um, in the Oberfeld case, uh, Justice Roberts, in his dissent, noted that the court invalidated marriage laws of more than half the states and orders the transformation of a social institution that has formed the basis for human society for millennia. So that was the basis for the institution of marriage is the practice for millennia and the recognition that marriage was between a man and a woman. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing the merits or lack of merits of same-sex marriage. I believe the states and the, elect and the, and the voters 
can choose what they will, and that's their prerogative, and I think that's legitimate. But when the court overrules the decisions made by the people, as they did in 32 of the 35 states that decided to, to, uh, to, to uh, recognize only traditional marriage between a man and a woman, uh, that is a act of judicial policy making, is it not? Senator, the Supreme Court has considered that to be an application of the substantive due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Right. And it doesn't, the, the Constitution doesn't mention anything about substance when it talks about due process. The four, 14th Amendment and the Fifth Amendment don't talk about substantive due process. It talks about due process of law. Correct? Correct. Well, one of the things that concerns me is here is an example of the courts finding a new fundamental right that is mentioned nowhere in the document of the Constitution that's the product of simply court-made law that we're all supposed to salute smartly and follow because nine people who are unelected, who have lifetime tenure, whose salary cannot be reduced while they serve in office, they, de they decide, five of them decide that this is the way the world should be. What other unenumerated rights do you believe exist? And how could we possibly anticipate what those might be? For example, the Ninth Amendment says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people, which suggests to me that there are other as yet unidentified rights out there, and somehow, some, someday, some court is going to tell us we've identified an unenumerated right, and we're going to reject the right of the American people to determine what the policies ought to be as regards that right, because we, the nine people sitting on the Supreme Court, have decided we've discovered a new unenumerated right, and it shall be the law of the land, and no legislature can pass any law that conflicts with it. What other unenumerated rights are out there, or can you say? Senator, I can't say. Um, it's a, a hypothetical that I've not, I'm not in a position to comment on. Um, the, the rights that the Supreme Court has recognized as substantive due process rights um, are established in, in, in its case law. But, Your Honor, this is not a trick question. Oh, I understand. Okay. I'm just not, I'm just not in a position to speak to the... Well, can, well, can I, you understand why, why ordinary folks wonder who do these people think they are and where does this authority come from? I yes. think the authority comes from we the people. That's the source of legitimacy of government. But when the courts decide to identify an unenumerated right and negate anything that conflicts with it, can't you see how they might just might feel that this is illegitimate or a uh, sort of policy making that you, that you have uh, disavowed? by saying that you don't want to make policy, you want to stay in your lane. Can you understand the concern? Absolutely, Senator. I do understand it. And how do you, and how, because I believe the court's legitimacy is very important. That's why I agree with Justice Breyer that notwithstanding what anybody else says, that the, that should be an aspirational goal of the judges because we're all concerned about the legitimacy of our institutions. And particularly, I would say, the institution of our judiciary. So how do, how do you as a judge, when you are approaching uh, your decisions, how do you try to avoid being seen as a policymaker by embracing doctrines like substantive due process, which is essentially gives judges carte blanche uh, to do whatever they want? 
Well, Senator, I've not had that particular situation, but I do I have a methodology that is designed to, to avoid my uh, importation of policy perspectives. Um, the judges are constrained in our system. That's part of the constitutional design. And so in all cases, I am looking neutrally at the arguments of the parties, and presumably in a case like this, there would be arguments made on both sides of the issue. Well, uh, Your Honor, if you'll forgive me. Yes. One, one reason um, I think the Supreme Court's different is because in your previous capacity as a trial judge, of course, you were bound by circuit court precedent. And on the circuit court, you're bound by the Supreme Court precedent. But as a member of the United States Supreme Court, you will be bound by nothing. You will be unaccountable to the voters. And so you said you can. Well, respectfully, Senator. I mean, yes. So, so, you, so you're not going to be able to find the answer in some law book somewhere. You're going to be presented with a case, and the argument's going to be made. This is an unenumerated fundamental right. And the voters, whatever they've said, is irrelevant because we, five members of the Supreme Court, are going to decide what the law of the land should be. And anybody who disagrees with us will be labeled a bigot or be accused of discrimination, even if those, their beliefs happen to flow from sincerely held religious conviction, like the definition of a, of a marriage between a man and a woman. But you've already told me that you under, you see why the this is a, a concern. I, I see why it is a concern, and I would just say that although the Supreme Court is not, you know, bound in the sense of having to uh, apply prior precedent, there is stare decisis in our system. There are now standards in the stare decisis world that the Supreme Court well, applies when it when well, it's, it's asked to. Well, um, well, thank, well, thank goodness the Supreme Court has been willing to revisit its precedent or we'd still be living with Plessy versus Ferguson or Dred Scott. You know, one of the things Senator Whitehouse and I agree on is he, he and others frequently ask nominees for the Supreme Court, do you think Brown versus Board of Education has settled law? And believe it or not, some nominees won't answer the question. I mean, it boggles the mind. I tend to think that uh, nominees from both parties tend to be overcoached and not uh, and told you can't be, if you don't answer the question, you have a better chance of being confirmed. But some of these things are obviously settled, and I wish we had a more candid conversation about the, the source of the power that unelected lifetime tenured judges have to basically rule rule America when they decide that something is an unenumerated fundamental right. Let me, uh, in the minute 48 seconds I have, ask you about a specific case. You remember U.S. versus Brown? Uh, this was a guilty plea and where you were uh, asked to assess a punishment. And it one point in, your, in the proceedings, you said, I'm going to state for the record, however, that this court has a long-standing policy disagreement with the criminal history guidelines with respect to the application of the two-point enhancement. Do you remember when you said that? I don't remember that particular um, statement. How is that policy disagreement different from other disagreements ah. where you said that you're not going to get out of, out of your lane, you're not going to get into the policy lane? Yes. Senator, um, the Supreme Court in the sentencing realm has made the guidelines, the sentencing guidelines, uh, advisory. They used to be mandatory. Judges used to have to calculate the guidelines for sentencing purposes and then essentially apply a sentence within the guideline range. In a case uh, called uh, United States versus Booker, um, 
the Supreme Court determined that the guidelines were are advisory now, so they don't have to be uh, applied in every case. You have to calculate them, but judges have more freedom to give effect to Congress's um, uh, the various provisions in the statute related to sentencing. In Booker and in, the, in its progeny, the Supreme Court made clear that judges at sentencing. Judge, I only have, I only have a limited amount of time, so um, let me just close on one other question, and forgive me for interrupting yes. you, but, but I, there's such a thing as a judicial filibuster, too. Sorry, uh, I was and, uh, <laughs> trying to get to the point. Let me, just, let me just ask, I don't know you well, but I've been impressed by our interaction, and you've been gracious and charming. Why in the world would you call Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld and George W. Bush war criminals in a legal filing? It seems so out of character for you. Senator, you may have been talk. Are you talking about briefs that I or habeas petitions that talk, I filed? Talking about when you were representing a member of the Taliban, and uh, the Department of Defense identified him as an intelligence officer for the Taliban, and you referred to the Secretary of Defense and the sitting president of the United States as war criminals. Why would you do something like that? It seems so out of character. Well, Senator, I don't remember that particular reference, and I um, was representing my clients and making arguments, um, I'd, I'd have to take a look at what you, what you meant. I did not um, intend to disparage the president or the, the secretary of defense. Well, war, being a war criminal has uh, huge ramifications. You could be subject to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court and hauled before that international tribunal and tried for war crimes. So it's not a casual comment, I would suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Judge Jackson, good to be with you again. Good to be with you. Um, I know that a great many people are extremely proud that you are here today. Um, I don't know that there are a great many who are prouder than Bruce Celia. <laughs> And so, with your permission, I'll take a moment and offer into the record some of his comments about you, and then maybe give you a chance to reciprocate with a word about him. But yesterday, in my opening remarks, I mentioned the Boston Globe article in which Judge Celia said that uh, about you, she is absolutely everything you would want in a Supreme Court justice. She has all the tickets in terms of her intelligence, her education, her work experience and her demonstrated judicial temperament. I see some of the same qualities in her that I saw in Ruth Bader Ginsburg, humility, the ability to inspire others in a quiet way, not at the top of her voice. Some people have the capacity to inspire by example and the force of their reason. Intellectually, she is very smart, very well informed, and she is very hardworking and focused. She gets the big picture. May I ask unanimous consent that the Globe article be admitted into the record? Without objection. But he didn't stop there, Your Honor. He went on to WPRI, uh, a local station in Rhode Island, and uh, said about you, she's worked hard. She deserves it. And I literally don't think that the president could have made a better choice. I think she'll be a terrific addition to the Supreme Court. She listens to what other people have to say, but makes up her own mind. She has a very scholarly approach toward the law, she has a very winning personality. She's kind to the people she comes in contact with. And she has a certain humility that I find very attractive in people. May I ask unanimous consent that the statement from uh, WPRI be put into the record? Without objection. Um, Judge Selye went on Law 360 <laughs> and said, um, I sense that she, you, she has the same sort of desire to achieve consensus and a pragmatic streak that has characterized some of Justice Breyer's work. I think she will be quite balanced. I have not found her to be an ideologue. She understands what the job of being a judge or being a justice is. She wants very much to do it in the right way. And she will bend her considerable talents to that direction and won't get distracted by any extraneous considerations or side issues. I think the country will appreciate that 
and will appreciate that this is a woman who understands the importance of the position and will give 100% of her talents every day to do that job in the right way and in accordance with her oath of office. Unanimous consent that that be put into the record? Without Chairman. objection. And then finally, the Providence Journal, our home state newspaper, uh, Katie Mulvaney, uh, in an interview, uh, heard Judge Celia say, I think it's a terrific appointment. She's a very thoughtful person and wonderfully well qualified. I'm happy not only for her, but for the whole country. She listens well, she gets the whole picture, has great respect for the rule of law. I think she's got the whole package. Unanimous consent that that article be put in the record. That objection. So, any reflections on Judge Celia? Oh, <laughs> well, um, that was very moving. Thank you, Senator, for reading his lovely remarks. Um, it's exactly who I know Judge Celia to be, always eloquent, always insightful, um, and I'm so flattered by his, um, by his admiration because he is someone that I have admired my entire um, professional life. He, he taught me how to um, look at issues very carefully, how to write in a lot of ways because of the way in which he's so fastidious with his opinions. And he's been an extraordinary mentor and role model for me. Well, we are uh, very proud of him in Rhode Island. As you know, he's on senior status. And when he went on senior status, um, we were able to recommend the uh, Rosary Thompson to succeed him, yes. of whom I think Rhode Islanders are equally proud. And she has now gone on senior status. And Mr. Chairman, I hope we'll be considering shortly an equally impressive Biden nominee for, for her position. Um, on an unrelated subject, and um, it relates to yesterday's activities, uh, you can relax a moment, Your Honor, this will not be a question for you, but a lot was said in this room yesterday about dark money by our Republican friends to the point where um, one of the headlines about yesterday read, Republicans hammer dark money groups. And I'll be the first to concede that there is dark money on both sides, and I hope very much we can get rid of it on both sides shortly by legislation. But there is a difference, I believe, between a dark money interest rooting for someone and right-wing dark money interests having a role in actually picking the last three Supreme Court justices. Now, how do we know that they had a role in doing that? Well, we know because everybody involved said so. It was pretty straightforward stuff. President Trump said we're going to have great judges, conservative, all picked by the Federalist Society. That's pretty plain. Uh, Senator Orrin Hatch, the former chairman, was asked, some of, was said, some have accused President Trump of outsourcing his judicial selection process to the Federalist Society. I say, damn right. The co-founder of the Federalist Society said that uh, the administration is relying on the Federalist Society to come up with qualified nominees. And then Don McGahn, who ran the operation for Trump in the White House, said, I've been a member of the Federalist Society since law school. Still am, so frankly, it seems like that role has been insourced. So there's pretty clear and pretty broad agreement that that selection process took place out of the public eye, and it appears to have been informed heavily by dark money interests. They were not alone in saying this. Here's Laura Ingram on Fox News, concerned about abortion cases coming up before the court. We have six Republican appointees on this court. After all the money that's been raised, the Federalist Society, all these big fat cat dinners, if this court with six justices cannot do the right thing, then I think it's time to circumscribe the jurisdiction of this court. That's the way to change things finally. So 
we have people who are in a position to know what was going on behind the scenes describing the six Republican appointees on the court who got there after all the money that has been raised, the Federalist Society, and all these big fat cat dinners, and threatening that if they don't do what she considers to be the right thing, they'll be punished by circumscribing the jurisdiction of the court. That's pretty big talk, but it's backed up by pretty big dollars. If you go back to before this enterprise got underway, the uh, money that came into the Federal Society from what's called Donors Trust, which has been described as the dark money ATM of the right, a Koch Brothers affiliated operation, back say in 2002, it got $5,000. No big deal. By 2019, when this operation was in full swing, it got $7 million. We don't know who the real donor was because that's the job of donors trust, is to de-identify the donor, to launder the identity off the donation so you can't connect the dots any longer. But $7 million, I think, is quite a lot of money. And unfortunately, the Federalist Society was not alone. Right down the hallway, is something called the Judicial Crisis Network. Its office is on the same hallway as the Federalist Society in the downtown Washington building, although JCN's website and tax filings list a mailing address at a different location, an address shared by multiple companies. And right down that hallway at that Judicial Crisis Network, there's even more money pouring. And here's how much poured into the last three nominations via the Judicial Crisis Network. $21 million related in time to the Gorsuch nomination, $17 million to the Kavanaugh nomination, $14 million to the Barrett nomination. And of course, we don't know who the actual donor is. Could be the same donor, who knows? And because we don't know who the donor is, we don't know what business they might have had before the court. And I think it matters when people are seeking to influence the makeup of the court that the public understand what business they may have before the court. And anonymity hides all of that. And they didn't stop with the Trump nominees. They got up on the air, a dark money group, using dark money to accuse Biden's Supreme Court nominee, at that point a player to be named later, Judge Jackson had not been selected at this point, of being a tool or a stooge of liberal activist dark money. This is a screenshot from their advertisement paid for by the Judicial Crisis Network. So it's worth understanding for a moment what the Judicial Crisis Network is and where it lies. And it lies in a network of organizations the um, prevailing way that political mischief is accomplished these days is with a paired 501c3 and 501c4 organization. The 501c3 gets the tax deduction, the 501c4 gets to participate in political activity. And sure enough, there's an 85 fund and a Concord fund that are twinned together as a 501c3 and 501c4 organization. And they filed under Virginia corporation law to operate under what they call fictitious names. That's the term of law under which they file, fictitious names. And there's the Judicial Crisis Network, one of the fictitious names of the Concord Fund. It has a parallel judicial education project that is a fictitious name of the 85 Fund. If you're interested in voter suppression, you can move down to the Honest Elections Project Action, another fictitious name, and it's 501c3 twin, the Honest Elections Project. And they've even got new ones that are less active, free to learn action and free to learn. So these are eight organizations that are essentially one organization. As lawyers, we think from time to time about piercing the corporate veil. That's corporate veiling that you could pierce with a banana. And it runs back and forth with three groups called CRC Advisors, CRC Strategies, and CRC Public Relations that take and send money to these organizations as part of the sort of planning element. 
you might say that CRC advisors, CRC strategies, and CRC public relations, this trio is the uh, command center, and this is the operational torso of the creature. So I show this all because it shows considerable effort when somebody goes to that much trouble to create that many organizations to hide how much money they've spent to control the nomination process to the court. And it's no small amount of money. In the original Washington Post research, they pegged it at $250 million. Further research led to testimony in my court subcommittee that um, the number was actually $400 million. And we have a recent report that we haven't fact-checked that the number is actually even higher than that. So I may amend this number upward once we're done with our fact-checking. $400 million funding conservative activists behind the scenes campaign to remake the nation's courts. That operation is a very different thing than a group rooting for somebody. And I want to make sure that that difference is clear since our friends on the Republican side have made dark money such a big focus of their attention already. There is a drastic difference between rooting for somebody and controlling the turnstile that decides who gets on the court, controlling the funding of the political campaigns that pursue the folks on the court. And actually, once you get on the court, we're working now with the judiciary itself to try to clean up the mess of that same anonymous money appearing before the court through phony front groups that file amicus griefs and little flotillas, or if it's an important enough case, in a full armada of dark money funded front groups. So that bears not at all on this nominee, but because this is a very public forum and because we've heard all that so-called hammering of dark money groups, I wanted to make sure that it was clear to everybody how this game is played and what the difference is in the way the two sides play it. The, um, so now, back to our business, Judge Jackson. Um, you have served as a um, trial court judge. I have. You have served as an appellate court judge. I have. And with any luck, you are on your way to serve as a Supreme Court justice. Now, one of the things that is very different about trial court judges and appellate court judges is what their role is with respect to fact-finding. It's my belief from my time spent as a practicing lawyer that the role of fact-finding belongs at the trial court level. That's where you can look the witnesses in the eye. That's where the evidence can be amassed. That's where the trial judge has the responsibility of sifting through it. Uh, if there's a jury, then the jury, of course, is the ultimate fact finder. But if you're in a non-jury trial, the trial judge is the fact finder. Then the case goes up on appeal, and it comes up with a record, a record of fact in the case. And in my view, that record of fact that comes up to the appellate court is actually a constraint on the power of the appellate court to go wandering off. The court is obliged to consider the appeal based on the factual record that was adduced in the district court. So you having lived in both of those houses, the trial court house and the appellate court house, tell me a little bit about what that change meant to you as you went from being a trial judge to an appellate judge. Thank you, Senator. Um, it is a really big difference. As you mentioned, at the trial court, you are on the ground level. Parties have filed the case. You have all of the issues, usually, um, at the trial level, because 
You'll have the complaint if it's a civil case, and um, there'll be a lot of litigation about the development of the facts in the case. In civil cases, you have a period of discovery in many cases that is really about the development of the record, what actually happened um, uh, in this case. Sometimes there's even a trial, um, and that too is a part of the development of the facts in the case because a jury will be charged with the responsibility of determining what happened, who's guilty, for example, if it's a criminal case, or who's liable, um, if any, if it's a civil case. And sometimes there are even um, questions presented to the jury that they have to determine the facts. At the appellate level, as you said, there is um, already a record, and the court is looking primarily at the law, the legal principles that guided the decision below based on the factual record. And importantly, at the appellate level, there are standards of review that the Court of Appeals applies when it decides how to uh, review whether or not to reverse or affirm the judgment of the lower court. And I've um, been very mindful, especially as a trial judge, of the standards of review. When I was prepping lawyers for oral argument before appellate courts, um, I would often say, please don't quarrel with the facts Mm. unless you have a knockdown case. Because if you want to get the appellate court to relitigate the facts, you're up against the harshest standard of review available, the clearly erroneousness test. And clear error is no small thing. Um, Outside of that narrow finding by an appellate court, that somehow the district court got it wrong, filtered through that clear error standard, are there other circumstances in which it's proper for appellate courts to do their own independent fact-finding outside of the record of the case that they're reviewing? I am not aware of any. Uh, There might, there may be, but um, in my experience, the fact finding is done at the trial level. The Court of Appeals only looks at facts under standards like clear error. Um, and so therefore, the record is usually set and established by the time you get to the Court of Appeals. Yeah. And I think that um, it's actually one of the constraints on the judiciary that they don't get to go and do free range fact finding They have to be tethered to the record of the actual case before them. It's related to the case or controversy requirement. That is correct, Senator. And in that regard, um, civil juries are, I think, um, something that Americans have prided themselves on for a long time. You go back to the colonial days, and the civil jury was one of the immediate imports From England, every colony set up civil juries. When the crown tried to interfere with the civil juries in the colonies, it became casus belli for the revolution. It was in the Declaration of Independence of what the king had done wrong that offended the colonists and caused the revolution. And the documents around the founding and around the creation of the Constitution all reflect passionate belief in the importance of the jury, including the civil jury, which, as you may know from your experience in the trial court, is getting to be a rarer and rarer creature. Um, And in fact, there are trial judges who have written about how do we how do we keep the civil jury alive? And I'd like to hear your thoughts about whether there's more to the civil jury than just a fact-finding appendage of the trial judge, whether it was seen by the founders and whether it belongs in our constitutional structure as a part of the responsible self-governance that was established by our Constitution. Uh, Yes, Senator. Um, It is part of our ordered liberty. It is... um, 
a mechanism by which citizens can participate in governance. They can be called upon by the court to sit in judgment of other people in the community. And it was something that was a part of the democratic vision of the founders from, from the very beginning. Blackstone was one of the legal experts um, who the early lawyers of the United States relied on. I suppose there were lawyers who had nothing but Blackstone's commentaries in the Bible on their shelf. And Blackstone described the jury as having a role to make sure that the power and clout of big and powerful interests could be protected against, that it was a refuge from the power of what he called the more powerful and wealthy citizens. Um, there was long experience in government of corruption, whether it was getting to a chief executive and getting them to do things your way for improper reasons, or whether it was controlling a legislature, a legislative body. But the jury is fundamentally different because they don't stick around. They're there for one case and one case only, and then they disappear. You can't fix them so that they decide your way over time. And if in that one case you try to fix them, you've likely committed a criminal offense. Tampering with the jury is a pretty significant thing, is it not? It is. If anybody tampered with a jury of yours, how would you respond? Oh, very seriously. It so the jury lives in a protected environment from a lot of the political power and the danger of corruption that the elected branches um, often suffer. And do you have thoughts about the importance of the civil jury in that regard as the bastion where people can go where they'll get a square deal from regular citizens and can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the lawyers for however big or mighty an opponent they may have with almost no danger, let's put it that way, little danger, less than danger, of the fix being put in? Well, certainly the jury um, system is designed in that manner, that citizens are brought in from the community. Um, when we pick juries, we ask as judges, do any of you in this pool have any connection to anyone? You know, I've, I've- So you screen them for conflicts of interest? You screen them heavily. That's part of the, what we call the voir dire, the sort yeah. of- We don't do that with people who come to Congress. Mm. <laughs> well, in in the court, they system. come with their conflicts of interest, <laughs> often right on their lapels, <laughs> sometimes hidden in their back pockets. But juries, not so. Correct? Not so. And in fact, th that would be a reason to exclude someone from the jury. And we even ask, um, you know, do any of you, as, as judges, we say, do any of you know me? <laughs> um, and if you do, you'll have to let me know and 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 be removed, because the idea, as you've indicated, is to get people from the community who have no connection to the case and can hear the evidence that's presented in the courtroom and the arguments of, of the lawyers and make a decision um, that is unconnected to any sort of personal interest they might have. Protecting the jury against the dangers of bias or corruption, giving the parties before it a clean and fair shot. Yes, Senator. So, with any luck, you will be on the Supreme Court before long, and I hope you will remember all of this, because it seems to me that the court has been on something of a campaign to deprecate and diminish the civil jury, including by allowing big corporations to build into their standard contracts buried way down in the fine print that Folks often don't read, and even if they do read it, they'll never get through the phone tree to find somebody to complain about it, try to strike it out of the contract. It's a take it or leave it, 
adhesion proposition, and they build into that that you've given up your right to a jury, your Seventh Amendment right to a civil jury. It's right actually in the Bill of Rights. And I cannot think of another right that the court pays less attention to or throws more readily under the bus if you read the mandatory arbitration cases, there's rarely a mention of the Seventh Amendment. And it seems to me that it flies in the face of the purpose of the jury to allow the citizens of the greatest power and wealth, who are today corporate citizens, to actually be able to take on the ability on their own through contracts that the customer has no chance to negotiate, the employee has no chance to negotiate, to actually take away that right that was at the heart of our founding without a squeak of objection or even notice by the court. And I think it's created a dramatic shift in power towards big corporations. And I think it has harmed innumerable employees and customers. So I am extremely happy that you have been able to answer these questions with such clarity about the role and the history and the value of the civil jury and its importance, not just as your fact-finding adjunct, but as an important part of our constitutional structure, part of our structured liberty as Americans. I wish you well. I'll see you again tomorrow. And uh, thanks so much for your patience with all of us here today. Thanks, Senator Whitehouse. And let me just say a positive word uh, to follow up this committee in the last few weeks has passed legislation signed into law by President Biden, which in cases of sexual harassment, provide that uh, individuals who are complaining have the option of a jury trial, uh, despite uh, efforts to steer them into mandatory arbitration. It is the decision of the complainant, the venue that they will seek. Uh, I think that is a step in the right direction and we passed out of this committee on a bipartisan basis. And so, I'd like to ask everyone to consider returning promptly at 1.30 for the much-anticipated Senator Lee of Utah. So I'm doing my like,
Unless you want to go, you want to take turns go down yeah or you want to wait till they're back in i don't know what they're doing yeah i mean i think we need to wait until they're back probably yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right. where would you go if you go oh really
does. Of course it does. Thanks for coming. I was so glad to come. What's it doing? I'll make sure there's a lot of onions on it. Too. Please, for everybody else is good. Yes. Yeah. 
We'd love to have your thoughts any day, just today also. Yes, I want to make sure I get my pass first and then I'll talk to you. That sounds fair. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. No problem. All right, even with the mask, I got it. Thank you, Ms. Lawrence. You got your yes. pass? You got your, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, as soon as you let me go. <laughs> We're only a fraction of the way through this day. What do you think so far? Well, I, I think her brilliance, her experience is on public display. She has gone through this process multiple times. So you can see her comfort level in answering questions sometimes that are leading questions in a negative way but i just i'm very very confident that we will move forward and elect her as our supreme court justice your constituents in michigan they mm -hmm. talk about this they have, i know you don't have a vote but i'm wondering what what, what the interest level is among the constituents in southeast well, michigan i i am um, hearing from women around the country from my state and african-american women who and men who say it's it's time that we break this barrier that we've seen throughout the history of our country and it's so exciting and then to see her brilliance and to see her her comfort level in diving into laws and rules and canons is uh refreshing lastly um, yes the way this hearing is proceeding mm -hmm. um any sense this is any different than prior confirmation hearings? There's going to be accusations that it's asymmetrical with how this mm -hmm. party handled this or that party handled that. As an observer, does this seem any different? What's going to be different is that we'll have the first black woman ever serving on the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Thank you, Ms. Last question. Last question. Very yes. briefly, Congresswoman, you said that women in your state say that this is long overdue. Just mm -hmm. looking ahead to midterms, do you think that this is something that can galvanize black women voters, particularly, to get to the polls and turn out in the numbers that they did in 2020? Promises made, promises kept. In the black community, when you give your word, when you say that you're going to take actions and we put our trust in you, when you deliver, it, 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 is a return on our investment. So I see this as being checking one of the boxes of the promises made. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Lawrence. Thank you.
three from over to the network TV pool. The TV networks would love to hear your voice, yeah. Henry. Well, they didn't hear it here in about 30 seconds. Fair enough. Check one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two.
for that. Put a track on it. We should have put a track on it. Mm, no, you should have. Well, we have the technology. You're right? Use it. Oh, find my friend. <laughs> Did you just check out the other side? No, I checked out the other side. Okay. TV crews, we'd, we'd love to speak with you before you go in. Thank you, man.
is to look at the text and figure out what the text means to ascertain the original public meaning of the text in question. While I doubt there are any members of, of this committee who would disagree with the idea that justice should be blind in this respect and that policy changes need to be made by the political branches of government, primarily by the legislative branch and not by the courts, you did hear some statements that I think are uh, at least a little bit at odds with that concept of justice. Um, one, one of my colleagues mentioned that uh, you should interpret the Constitution in a way that works for the people of today. Uh, 
fair enough. We certainly don't want to interpret the Constitution in a way that doesn't work. But again, that's not the objective. The objective is not to ascertain good policy. Uh, the objective is to ascertain what the law requires. You were urged to consider the effects of the court's actions on people's lives. Uh, there again, insofar as this relates to policy, it's not really the job of the courts. You were admonished that you must, quote, be able to see the real people at the other end of the court's rulings, like Americans who are one Supreme Court decision away from losing their health insurance, or one court decision away from the ability to make their own health care choices. And the list goes on and on. Now, that type of judicial philosophy uh, would, would have you step into the role of policymaker and decide what the law should be rather than what the law is. You also heard quoted a couple of times yesterday, quoted or paraphrased or otherwise referenced, Federalist 78, in which Alexander Hamilton refers to the difference between law, between will and judgment. Will, as expressed by Hamilton, refers to what the law should be. Judgment pertains to what the law is. The judicial branch has the latter power, but not the former. The legislative branch as the former, but not the latter. Judge Jackson, I'd, I'd love to get your, your thoughts on, on this discussion uh, about what it means, what blind justice is, why that's important. Let's start with, with, with this formulation of it, though. Uh, does, does the law determine the outcome of a case, or does the outcome of the case determine the law? Thank you, Senator. The law determines the outcome of case. And so anytime you're looking at a case and you're looking at the outcomes for ordinary Americans, for day-to-day -day Americans, if you're looking beyond the scope of deciding that case and if you're looking even within that case beyond uh, what the law says, uh, you would be stepping into a province of a different branch. Is that right? I believe so. The law and the facts uh, of the case determine the outcome of cases. <clears throat> I think that's, that's an accurate statement. It's important to emphasize this. This is also something that Hamilton describes in Federalist 78, where he goes on to say, anytime you start to see the courts start to exercise will instead of judgment, the result is, is supplanting the will of the people as expressed through their elected representatives uh, uh, through the courts. And that tends to undermine the, the whole system. You see, there's a reason, of course, why we give life tenure to Article Three judges and justices. And that is because we want to make sure that they have the power, the authority, the discretion, and the confidence to issue a decision that they might not be comfortable with. In fact, a, a judge who always agrees with and is always comfortable with his or her own opinions is, as Justice Scalia used to say, not a very good judge. So we wanted them, you all, to have confidence in being able to make the right decision, even knowing that you and the public at large might be uncomfortable with the result it produces. Congress makes laws that you won't always agree with. Congress is accountable to the people at regular intervals. You can fire every member of the House of Representatives every two years. You can fire one third of us in the Senate every two years. But we insulate judges and Supreme Court justices from that same accountability precisely for this reason. It's because political accountability is so important. This is borne out in the judicial oath, uh, uh, one of the oaths that you'll take if confirmed to this position as an associate justice, in which you'll, you'll swear or affirm that you'll administer justice without respect to persons and that you'll do it faithfully and impartially. I read this to mean that you do it without consideration of external circumstances, external considerations, uh, policy considerations, or, or, or otherwise. Now, this relates to uh, um, some interaction that you and I had when you came before this committee for your confirmation to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, where you now sit. Uh, in connection with that hearing, I submitted some questions to the record uh, in which I asked you uh, whether, to what extent, the Constitution protects rights that are not enumerated in the Constitution itself. And, and if so, to specify uh, what those rights were. You responded by citing a number of cases, including Griswold versus Connecticut, Roe versus Wade, 
Loving versus Virginia, and a handful of others. <clears throat> you also suggested that the Ninth Amendment uh, 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 was something, uh, was a source for such rights, unenumerated rights. The Ninth Amendment, of course, states, uh, quote, that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Judge Jackson, what specific rights has the Supreme Court identified as flowing from the Ninth Amendment? And by that, I mean specifically from the Ninth Amendment, rather than uh, uh, um, in sort of an also-ran list uh, of, of other features um, of the Constitution that might back up a particular ruling. Uh, what rights has the Constitution identified as flowing specifically from the Ninth Amendment? Thank you, Senator. Um, the Supreme Court, as I understand it, has not um, identified any particular rights flowing directly from the Ninth Amendment, although, as you said, the text of the amendment suggests that there are some rights that are not enumerated. Right, right. Its very, its very existence and its very language uh, suggests that, which opens up other questions as to how those are to be resolved. Uh, it's led to considerable debate among uh, scholars and jurists alike as to whether, to what extent, in what way, uh, this is enforceable, those rights are enforceable by the courts. But uh, how would we go about deciding that? How would, uh, how would jurists go about deciding this question appropriately? In other words, would it be more, would it be more appropriate to say um, we will ascertain the existence of rights protected by the Ninth Amendment based on the contemporaneous understanding at the time of the ratification of the Ninth Amendment, or would it be mo more open-ended to protect rights that we think are important today? Thank you, Senator. The Supreme Court now um, very clearly has uh, determined that in order to interpret provisions of the Constitution, we look to the time of the founding. And we ascertain, uh, based on uh, what the original public meaning of the words of the Constitution were at the time, um, sometimes that yields a particular answer. Other times, you may have to look to practices historically from that time. But that, that, is, that would be the way in which you would go about interpreting the Ninth Amendment. Could it also be that it, it leaves this um, to be decided at the, at the discretion of the Supreme Court itself? In other words, not, not based on any historical precedent, but based on what the Supreme Court justices themselves deem appropriate at the moment? I don't think so. Um, why, and why is that? Because the way in which the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution is with reference to the meaning of the text at the time. That it is one of the constraints, as I mentioned, um, in terms of my own way of um, handling, interpreting the law, that one of the constraints is that you're bound by the text and what it meant to those who drafted it. At, at the time, gotcha, yeah. Now, on February 1st of this year, uh, President Biden said that he was, he was looking uh, for a Supreme Court nominee. Uh, this was, as I recall, right after Justice Breyer announced that he would be stepping down and before he had announced who, whom he might nominate, uh, uh, that he was looking for a nominee, quote, uh, with, quote, a judicial philosophy that's more one that suggests that there are unenumerated rights to the Constitution and all new members mean something, including the Ninth Amendment. Um, so do you, do you share the judicial philosophy that President Biden described in that statement? Senator, I, I haven't um, reviewed that statement, but I have not discussed anything about enumerated rights, unenumerated rights with, 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 the, the, president. with the president. Yes. Did, um, so did President Biden uh, ask you either about your judicial philosophy more broadly, separate and apart from the Ninth Amendment, or, or uh, ask you... Uh, 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 about your approach to the Ninth Amendment? He did not. In a, in a primary election debate, 
that he had as a presidential candidate in, in Nevada in 2007, Joe Biden stated, quote, I would not appoint anyone who did not understand that Section 5 of the 14th Amendment and the Liberty Clause of the 14th Amendment provided a right to privacy. That's the question I'd ask them. If that is answered correctly, that that is the case, then it answers the question, which means they would support Roe versus Wade. Oh, I assume uh, uh, his reference to the Liberty Clause, I assume he's referring to the, to the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, in context, that appears to be what he's, he's saying. Did, did President Biden ask you whether you agreed with his analysis of the 14th Amendment uh, as it relates to uh, the right to privacy? He did not. Tell me this. Uh, <clears throat> when we look at any provision of the Constitution, um, one of the many reasons it's, it's, it's helpful to look at the original understanding, in addition to the, the, the fundamental reason that you described, um, it, it can, can help us understand what motivated it, and it can help us understand the actions of those who voted within Congress to propose text uh, to be amended to the Constitution and, and those who voted to ratify it. Um, we've got a number of amendments, including the amendment that he referred to in that last quote I read, that, ha that had a, uh, an understanding, at least um, an understanding that include, included certain thou shalt nots for government. Um, the Equal Protection Clause, I think, is, is a provision of the 14th Amendment that people understood, uh, among anything else it might do, restricts government's ability to treat people differently on the basis of race. Consistent with the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, uh, when is it permissible uh, for government to treat a person differently on the basis of race? Thank you, Senator. The Supreme Court has interpreted the Equal Protection Clause, uh, as you say, to generally prohibit uh, classifications on the basis of race. And it said, says that those classifications are to be uh, rigorously scrutinized. They um, are strict scrutiny, which is a, a, a standard that applies that looks at the purposes of the government and the means by which the government seeks to achieve any end related to such classification. They, the government would have to have a compelling interest in making that classification, and the means that it selects would have to be narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. And so those compelling interests um, can't be for light or transient reasons. They, they can't just be something like we, we, we feel like it, in other words. Correct. Uh, and the reason for this is because, um, well, number one, it's bad. it's bad for anyone to treat another person differently on the basis of race. It's especially bad when government does it because there's not exactly equal bargaining power when you're dealing with the, the, the relationship an individual has with government. Uh, uh, by definition, it's a particularly unfair form of discrimination when it's government doing it. Governments have... Uh, enforcement officers, they have armies, they have uh, the means of enforcing their will and their laws, and that's one of the reasons why it's so important. What about under, under statute, uh, consistent with Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, when is it permissible for an employer to treat an, an employee or a prospective employee differently on the basis of his or her race? By statute, under Title VII, it is uh, generally impermissible. And, and permissible only in very narrow circumstances. I believe so. And the statute itself has some restrictions in terms of to whom it applies, right. the employers. And some exclusions in terms of uh, religious employers, for example, uh, uh, not being able to discriminate on the basis of race, but it exempts religious employers within certain spheres in, in order to be able to protect uh, uh, that religious employers' discretion 
to operate within its faith and the rules of its faith. And by doing that, it, it makes that much clearer. By making that distinction, it makes that much clearer that um, uh, discrimination on the basis of race and employment is not something that the law smiles upon, uh, nor should it. Um, let's, um, let's talk about the Commerce Clause for a minute, if that's all right. Now, at the time of the founding, the founding fathers didn't foresee and almost certainly could not have foreseen the invention of radios, televisions, airplanes, the internet, and telephone networks. And yet, all of those things are governed by federal law, by federal law and not by state law. Why is this constitutional? Well, Senator, the Commerce Clause um, was initially interpreted by the Supreme Court to be very broad to allow for uh, federal regulation of interstate commerce um, and the growth of the economy in this country. Um, but over time, the Supreme Court has made clear that the Commerce Clause uh, limits the federal government, that there is limited authority under the Commerce Clause. Um, the, the state of the law now is such that uh, the federal government, through the Commerce Clause, is only permitted to regulate um, channels of interstate commerce, instrumentalities of interstate commerce, and activities that substantially affect interstate commerce. And with respect to uh, the third category, the Supreme Court has made clear uh, in the uh, Lopez case and in Morrison that non-economic activities are not covered by Commerce Clause authority. And in the uh, NFIB case, the uh, uh, ACA case, the Supreme Court made clear that inactivity is also not covered um, and not authorized under the Commerce Clause. Right. In most of the most of the items that I identified in, in my question, in fact, uh, all of them, I believe, would fall under the category of um, channels and instrumentalities of interstate commerce. We're dealing with interstate airways, airwaves, waterways. Uh, networks, things like that, uh, things that depend for their existence, for their effectiveness on their operation inter interstate such that they couldn't, uh, no one could effectively regulate them and preserve their core function unless that was federal. Those fit into the category of the channels and instrumentalities. With the, 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 the third item that you described, the, the substantial effects interstate commerce, uh, is there much of a limiting principle there? I mean, with, you referred to Lopez and Morris and, uh, and NFIB versus Sebelius. Uh, to my knowledge, those are the only three cases the Supreme Court uh, has decided since it, uh, its ruling in 1937 on, on NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steel, which essentially created the modern uh, substantial effects case, uh, the, the modern substantial effects standard. Those are the only three instances in which the Supreme Court identified as outside the Commerce Clause authority um, something that Congress had enacted. Are these meaningful constraints, in your view, or are they examples of Congress just getting reckless and sloppy in the way it drafted things? Uh, some, some have argued, for instance, that uh, as long as Congress doesn't get reckless and sloppy, it can do whatever it wants under those. Do you have any view on that? Well. Um, these cases come through the courts, so I'll, I'll be general. Um, the fact that Congress is limited in its authority under the Commerce Clause is established law. It is a fundamental principle of our constitutional order. And th those limits that the Supreme Court has recognized do carve out categories of uh, activity that Congress is not permitted, the federal government is not permitted to regulate. Um, Non-economic activity is a category. Inactivity is a category. Um, now, 
the Supreme Court has also, through the Commerce Clause, established rules for things that the states may not do. Uh, this is referred to as the, you know, the so-called so Dormant Commerce Clause. Uh, the Dormant Commerce Clause acknowledges the power of Congress, the exclusive domain of Congress, as being regulating interstate commerce. But there's no federal cause of action to allow for the invalidation of a state law under the Commerce Clause. It's been something that's been adopted by the courts. Is that an appropriate exercise of uh, the court's judicial power, or does that amount to uh, de facto legislation on the part of the courts? Well, Senator, I wouldn't characterize it. I know that that's what the Supreme Court has permitted. The Dormant Commerce Clause is, um, is a principle that supports the uh, interstate nature and regulation and authority of the federal government. And so states are not permitted under that doctrine uh, to discriminate against other states, to preference their own commerce in a way that interferes with interstate commerce. I want to turn back for a moment to a line of, um, of inquiry you had with, uh, with Senator Durbin earlier today when you were talking about your sentencing in these child pornography cases. I want to make sure that I understand your, your answer there. Um, if I understand it, you, you were making the argument that your concern was that the, the laws in this area didn't adequately take into account the transfer of these materials by electronic means to be re transmitted, received, and stored through computers. Is that my understanding that correctly? Well, Senator, my, uh, the point that I was making was that the Sentencing Commission, back when I was part of it and even since, tasked with the responsibility to uh, evaluate and make recommendations and look at the data and information about cases, has looked at the operation of the child pornography guideline not so much the, the statute, but the guidelines, um, which the Congress has tasked the Sentencing Commission with developing. And there are aspects of the child pornography guideline that Congress in legislation has required. It required certain enhancements to be included in the guideline. And some of those enhancements, the data is now revealing, um, don't take into account the, the change in the way that, it, that this um, horrible offense is now committed. But the fact that it's easier to commit the offense shouldn't diminish the severity of the punishment, should it? I mean, any more than the more widespread availability of certain drugs, the more widespread availability of certain weapons might, uh, I mean, you surely you wouldn't argue for a lower sentence when certain things become easier in other criminal contexts. So why is this one different? Well, the sentencing enhancements that are in the guidelines are designed to help courts differentiate between different levels of culpability. Congress will say this is an offense, whatever it is, and the maximum penalty is X. And, and in most cases, the range is between zero and something like 20 years that Congress gives when it establishes a penalty. The point of the guidelines is to help judges figure out where in that range between 20, zero and 20 years a particular defendant should be sentenced. And the guidelines have gradations in them that relate to various aspects of the commission of the crime. So, Go ahead. Sorry. So, so the commission does data to it does uh, data gathering and research to figure out how crimes are committed and what gradations should matter in terms of the range of culpability. Because the problem of not doing that or of getting it wrong is that you you are not able to adequately assess and determine 
the differences among offenders on the on the scale. I, I understand that. And so but in in these cases, as I understand it, all ten of the cases that we've reviewed on, on record where you've sent someone to a for a child pornography conviction, in all ten of those cases you you departed from the guidelines uh, and deported downward. It's hard for me to understand departing from those in every case you've got because not supposed to, isn't a departure supposed to be grounded in uh, a finding that it's outside the heartland of, of, of cases in that range, uh, cases of that sort? Yes, Senator. And as I said before, these are horrible cases that involve terrible crimes. And the court is looking at all of the evidence consistent with Congress's factors for sentencing. The guidelines are one factor, but the court is told that you look at the guidelines, but you also look at the nature and circumstances of the offense, the history and characteristics of the offender. There are a series of, of factors. In the cases, you are also getting recommendations. And in most of the cases, I haven't pinned it all down, but in most of the cases, if not all of the cases, the government is asking for a sentence below the guidelines because this guideline system is not doing the work in this particular case. Understood. Section 230 of the, Telecommunica of the Communications Decency Act uh, provides uh, a degree of immunity for tech companies operating in the space of being uh, online interactive service providers. Um, it immunizes them, uh, them from certain causes of action that would otherwise um, apply against them. Would it be within Congress's authority to condition the receipt and, a, a, and availability of Section 230 immunity on those online interactive service providers operating as a public forum that is not discriminating on the basis of, of viewpoint or, or the the, the viewpoint of those posting on them. Would that be within our authority? Senator, I can't um, comment on a particular issue about whether or not it is um, constitutional or, or not, but the criteria that you identify, the, the, it would be relevant, I think, as to whether or not the government is uh, seeking to regulate along uh, viewpoint lines under the First Amendment, that is something that is um, generally impermissible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Lee. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman and Senator Grassley. Uh, welcome again, Judge, your wonderful family. Uh, they all seem to be awake throughout this yeah. entire hearing. Um, I um, just wanted to, before I start, wanted to uh, get at something uh, Senator Lee was talking about. It's not the Dormant Commerce Clause, um, but I really appreciated early on how you talked about uh, these child pornography cases. A former prosecutor could totally see where you were coming from um, when you talked about looking at these cases as a mom uh, and a judge. Um, and would it surprise you at all that other judges, uh, including a number of them that were uh, supported by our uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, have given out similar sentences in uh, child pornography cases. No, Senator, it would not surprise me because these cases um, are horrific and um, there's a lot of disparity because of the way the guidelines are operating in this particular area. Thanks. But in every case, in every case, um, that I handled involving these terrible crimes, I looked at the law and the facts. I made sure that the victims, um, the children's perspectives were represented. And I also imposed prison terms and significant, significant um, supervision and other restrictions on these defendants. Well, thank you. And I just also want to note, and I know others have brought this up, the uh, letter of support from the Fraternal Order of Police, in which they said, 
From our analysis of Judge Jackson's record and some of her cases, we believe she has considered the facts and applied the law consistently and fairly on a range of issues. There is little doubt that she has the temperament, intellect, legal experience, and family background to have earned this appointment. We are reassured that should she be confirmed, she would approach her future cases with an open mind and treat issues related to law enforcement fairly and justly. And that matters uh, a lot to uh, many of us. Now, um, I want to go back to something I was talking about yesterday, and that is why today's hearing is so monumental, um, including that it is occurring at a time when we as Americans have been reminded again, uh, due to the courage of Ukrainians thousands of miles away, that we can never take our democracy or, for that matter, our courts for granted. Uh, it is also happening at a time when we are seeing each other for the first time after a two-year pandemic, connecting to each other again. Um, and I hope this moment uh, will be a moment where uh, we see a renewed interest in our democracy, that we respect each other's rights and views, and that we see that we are not a nation of 300 plus million silos. Uh, instead, uh, we are a nation committed to this idea that what unites us as Americans is much bigger than what divides us. And so in that context, you come before us with this incredible strength, legal acumen, uh, grace under pressure that you have demonstrated today. And uh, you also come before us, as we've noted, as the first black woman to be nominated following 115 justices uh, who have been confirmed. And I will note uh, of the 115 justices, 110 have been men. And I um, actually once reminded a late night show, Trevor Noah, of similar issues in the US Senate. Uh, in fact, in the history of the US Senate, of the nearly 2,000 people who have served, only 58 have been women. And he responded that if a nightclub had numbers that bad, they'd shut it down. <laughs> um, but today, Judge, we're not shutting anything down, uh, not the court, not the Senate, and you are opening things up. And I think one of the things your nomination presents is an opportunity to address a decline in the public's confidence uh, in our court. Um, and uh, increasingly many, if you see public opinion polls, see the court as over-politicized or out of touch. Um, at the same time, we've seen an alarming rise in threats targeting members of our judiciary for just uh, doing their jobs. How do you think we can work to maintain the public's con confidence in the court? Uh, what do you see your role in that? Thank you, Senator. Um, public confidence in the court is crucial. As has been said here earlier, the, the court doesn't have anything else, that that is the, the key to our legitimacy in our democratic system. And I am honored to accept the president's nomination in part um, because I know it means so much to so many people. It means a lot to me. Um, I am here standing on the shoulders of generations of Americans who never had anything close to this kind of opportunity. Um, from my grandparents who had just a grade school education, but instilled in my parents the importance of learning. And my parents, who I've mentioned here many times already, who were the first in their families to get to go to college. So this nomination against that backdrop is significant to, to a lot of people. And I hope that it will bring confidence, it will help inspire people to understand that our courts are like them, that our judges are like them, doing the work, being a part of our government. I think it's very important. Very good. I think along those lines, your wonderful mentor, uh, Justice Breyer, uh, I quoted him about how he said, um, we can in public acceptance of the court, and these are his words, we can do it best by helping ensure that the Constitution remains workable in a broad sense of the term. Specifically, it, the court can and should interpret the Constitution in a way that works for the people of the day. Like, as you know, 
uh, it's, I think section two, article two, section two, uh, doesn't refer to the Air Force uh, because we didn't have an Air Force back then. Um, so are there things about the Constitution that, of course, um, as we've gone along, have been interpreted to meet uh, the moments of our time. What do you think Justice Breyer means when he says the Constitution should be interpreted in a way that works for the people of today? And do you think a justice can be both pragmatic and objective and respect history? Uh, I do. And I think that the justices have demonstrated that. Some of their recent opinions uh, have had to deal with modern technology, technologies that did not exist at the time of the founding. So, for example, the uh, Riley case, the Carpenter case, these were um, Fourth Amendment decisions in which the court was asked to determine whether or not uh, it violated the Fourth Amendment for the police to um, search someone's cell phone without a warrant or for the police to use uh, GPS location data to uh, determine where someone had been without a warrant. And obviously those technologies did not exist. But what the court did was it looked back at the time of the founding and determined what the reasonable expectations of privacy were related to uh, the, the term unreasonable searches and seizures, which appears in the Constitution. And having assessed what that meant back then, they could use those principles to decide whether or not a cell phone is like uh, someone's home these days with all of the information and all of the things that are stored there. And the court determined that it was a violation of the Fourth Amendment, that the police officers needed a warrant. And they did so with reference to what the Constitution meant in history. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, you know, you were uh, viewed as a judge, and you talked about this a bit yesterday, that uh, writes lengthy opinions, um, that believes you should spell things out, and uh, believes in being transparent. Is that a fair characterization? I don't uh, that is. That is. Okay, good. I'm sure your clerks know that. Um, and um, I want to talk about something to me that's a bit the opposite, and that's something that uh, some have termed the shadow docket. Uh, and that includes decisions that the court makes on an expedited basis that are usually unsigned and issued uh, without oral argument or full briefing. In the last few years, we've seen the court increasingly deciding cases in this way, often over the dissent of maybe three or four of the justices. Last term, the court granted 20 requests for emergency relief, a historically high number. Ten years ago, in the October term of 2011, uh, the court granted only six requests in an entire year. Um, when do you think it's appropriate for the Supreme Court uh, to grant emergency relief, use this docket? When are the circumstances uh, that warrant this? And um, I think you know these decisions have a profound effect on people's lives. I'll just use one example. Last fall, in a one-paragraph decision, a majority of the court refused to stop the enforcement of a Texas law that severely restricts a woman's access um, to abortion. In that case, even Chief Justice Roberts objected to the court's decision to let the law take effect, calling the statutory scheme not only unusual but unprecedented. Um, as someone who believes in transparency, could you talk in general about uh, when you think this shadow docket should be used, when emergency relief should be given, and how, if it's overused, it could undermine public confidence in the court? Thank you, Senator. Um, well, there, there's a balance that the court has to consider and that it... Um, Insofar as, uh, on the one hand, it has always had an emergency docket, the need for flexibility, the ability to get answers to uh, the parties at issue is something um, that's important in our system. Um, on the other hand, the court has also uh, uh, considered the interest in allowing issues to percolate um, allowing other courts to 
rule on things um, before they come to the court. And I am not privy at the moment uh, to the justices' views and why and how they're using um, the emergency docket in these cases. If I was fortunate enough to be confirmed, I would look at those issues. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting and important set of issues. Okay. Um, you know, I think just another example of this, by the way, is um, the day before Wisconsin's primary election on April 6, 2020, uh, right um, as the first um, beginnings of some of the health uh, orders that came out with the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, the court issued a 5-4 decision halting a district court's order allowing voters extra time to cast their absentee ballots um, so that they could avoid uh, waiting in line to vote. And back then, people literally got COVID with election workers and the like because of this. And again, I'm not going to belabor this point, but I think some of this is these decisions that are made um, that don't reflect some of the careful consideration that you have made in many of your um, decisions as a judge. But speaking of voting, I'll ask you one question on that front. Since the Supreme Court uh, gutted the Section 5 preclearance regime of the Voting Rights Act in its decision in Shelby County, uh, the D.C. Circuit um, has not seen um, many voting rights cases. Um, however, as you know, Justice Ginsburg dissented in that case, describing the right to vote as the most fundamental right in our democratic system. Do you agree that the right to vote is fundamental? S Senator, the S Supreme Court has said that the right to vote is um, the basis of our democracy, that it is um, the right upon which all other rights are es essentially founded. Um, because in a democracy, there is... Um, one person, one vote, and um, and there are constitutional amendments that relate directly to uh, the right to vote. So it is a, f a fundamental right in our democracy. Yes, I know that's how Justice Barrett answered uh, that question as well in her uh, recent hearing. Um, I'm going to turn to an area that uh, uh, Senator Lee and I uh, we both uh, chair the subcommittee on uh, antitrust, and so it's near and dear uh, to my heart. So I thought I'd spend a little time. It usually gets relegated to the second round, but I'm, I'm <laughs> putting it up on the docket here. Uh, U.S. antitrust law has been described as a comprehensive charter of economic liberty, um, and uh, I agree. And effective antitrust enforcement plays a critical role, uh, as you know, in protecting consumers and workers, promoting innovation, ensuring new businesses have an opportunity to compete. It actually, uh, from really early on uh, in our country's history, uh, has been a very important part of assuring uh, that capitalism works. And um, in January, uh, for the first time since the dawn of the internet, uh, the Senate passed a tech competition bill out of the Judiciary Committee. It's a bill that Senator Grassley and I lead. Many of the members of this committee supported uh, the bill, uh, 16 to 6 vote. It's called the American Innovation and Choice Online Act. It's now headed to the Senate floor. I'm not going to ask you about that bill, obviously, but I want to put this in some context. Uh, while tech monopolies uh, have seized from 50 to 90 percent market share in major parts of their business lines, uh, it is clear to me when you look at the plain language of the Sherman Act, Clayton Act, uh, laws that are in place, that these monopolies are not okay. Uh, however, court rulings for decades in antitrust have created some major obstacles uh, to taking on these cases, and it's not just court rulings. Uh, it is on us uh, with, as I said, the dawn of the Internet, decades having passed. It is on us, this Senate and the House, to update our laws this year to give enforcers the resources to do their jobs, something you, uh, if confirmed, would um, not have a role in. But uh, the role of the courts is also very critical. Uh, you have been nominated to replace Justice Breyer, who came to the court with a strong background in antitrust law, 
Um, I know you handled a, a case. We, you and I discussed it in in my office. I think it got um, I think it got uh, decided the merger was abandoned, um, so you didn't have to rule on the merits of it. It was back in uh, 2017, um, uh, a FTC challenge. Um, but I'll just quote something that Justice Breyer once said. He told this committee, if you're going to have a free enterprise economy, then you must have a strong and effective antitrust law. Do you agree with Justice Breyer's uh, statement, and how would you characterize the goals of our antitrust laws? Well, thank you, Senator. Uh, the antitrust laws protect competition and, as you said, um, therefore protect consumers and competitors and the economy as a whole. And the um, Sherman Act and the Clayton Act are broad in their, um, in, the, in their statements and their protections, and there's a lot of precedent in this area. Um, if I were uh, confirmed, uh, I would use my methodology to um, look at the precedents in these areas to ensure that any legislation that I was considering is interpreted according to the text, consistent with Congress's intent. Um, and um, in the area of antitrust, uh, that is uh, ensuring that there is uh, consumer protections. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, and just to uh, um, play it out a little bit, um, since the 1980s, uh, the court in cases like uh, Trinco and Credit Suisse, Ohio v. American Express, has really made it uh, increasingly difficult to enforce the antitrust laws and protect competition. And during that same time, and I know many of my colleagues know this, uh, we have seen a rise in industry consolidation, market power, uh, not only in tech um, uh, with companies like Google and Amazon and Facebook and Apple, but also across our economy, really in everything from pharma uh, to cat food to caskets. Um, do you, uh, what role do you think that congressional intent should play uh, in the court's interpretation of the antitrust laws? And I, I say that because I think that um, we're dealing with some cases where justices have actually substituted their own ideologies for the intent of Congress um, in originally passing the laws. Um, and I think it was Justice Souter who once said before this committee, uh, when we are dealing with antitrust laws, we are dealing with one of the most spectacular examples of delegation to the judiciary that our legal system knows. Um, and he added this, certainly a respect for legislative intent has got to be our anchor for interpretation. Um, so what role do you think congressional intent should play in the court's interpretation of the antitrust laws? Thank you, Senator. Um, so I've interpreted a number of statutes in my near decade on the bench. Um, and in every case, the text of a statute is what the court looks at in order to ascertain what the legislature intended. Um, and that is um, important because, as I've said, courts are not policymakers, and judges um, should not be importing their own policy preferences. It's judges are restrained in our constitutional scheme um, in order to affect the will of Congress in terms of their interpretation of the laws. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn to another uh, topic, and that's Freedom of the Press, uh, New York Times v. Sullivan, 1964 case. Uh, we have recently witnessed, uh, as you know, unprecedented attacks on journalists and journalism. Uh, whether it's uh, violence overseas, uh, recently learning, losing, uh, sadly, uh, members of the press uh, just in the last month in Ukraine, or threats and intimidation at home. Um, this is very concerning to me, uh, given the important role of the First Amendment. My dad uh, was a newspaper reporter, uh, so the issues hit home for me. Uh, can you talk about your view of the role of journalists in our democracy? 
Thank you, Senator. Journalists, uh, freedom of the press is protected by our, the First Amendment. It is uh, about the dissemination of information, which is necessary for um, a democratic form of government. The Supreme Court has held as much, and that was uh, the basis for the court's uh, determinations in protecting uh, the press from liability in, in New York Times versus Sullivan and, and its pro progeny. Okay. Um, as you know, that uh, ruling was a unanimous ruling in support of the First Amendment, and the court held uh, that when newspapers report on public officials, they're only liable for untrue statements that are published with knowledge or reckless disregard for whether the statement was false. Uh, the court in Sullivan based its decision on our country's, quote, profound national commitment to the principle that debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open. Uh, that's their quote. And it recognized that, quote, erroneous statement is inevitable in free debate, end quote, end quote, must be protected if the freedoms of expression are to have the breathing space that they need to survive. Um, do you agree that those principles are just as relevant today as they were when the Supreme Court first decided uh, New York Times v. Sullivan? New York Times v. Sullivan is the uh, continuing binding precedent of the Supreme Court, and it does state the principles that the court has determined are uh, undergirding uh, the First Amendment right to um, free press. Okay. And last summer, actually, in uh, Berisha v. Lawson, the Supreme Court declined to review a case in which the 11th Circuit applied New York Times v. Sullivan. Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch each dissented from the decision not to grant cert, arguing that the court should reconsider its holding in Sullivan. How would you approach a case that sought to limit or overturn the central holding in New York Times v. Sullivan? Thank you, Senator. Anytime the court is uh, asked to revisit a precedent, there are criteria that the court uses to decide whether or not to um, overrule a precedent. New York Times versus Sullivan is a precedent, and stare decisis um, is very important. The principle that um, courts, the, the Supreme Court should maintain its precedence um, for predictability and stability in the law. If the court is asked to revisit a precedent, its criteria, what it looks at, are whether the precedent is wrong and, in fact, egregiously wrong, the court has said, um, whether there's been reliance on that precedent, whether the there are other cases that are similar to the precedent or that relied on the precedent that have now shifted so that the precedent is no longer uh, on firm footing. Uh, whether or not the precedent is workable, sometimes the, the Supreme Court will uh, issue a ruling and determine later that it's not actually doing what the court intended, and whether or not there are new facts or a new understanding of the facts. Those various criteria are what the court looks at to decide whether or not to overturn a precedent, and they would be what um, I would look at if I were confirmed to the Supreme Court. Now, thank you. I was recalling as you spoke about stare decisis at one of your first nominations hearing for the district court, and you actually, um, in Answer, in response to one of my questions, you said stare decisis is a bedrock legal principle that ensures consistency and impartiality of judgments. And um, I think, as you know, by how you've talked more broadly about this um, moving off of the First Amendment questions, you, throughout the court's history, um, stare decisis um, has been so key, and the court has relied on it. Uh, to maintain stability in the law, reaffirm its impartiality. impartiality. As a um, uh, former justice, um, I know Senator Durbin just read a very famous book about him, Minnesotan, uh, <laughs> Justice Harry Blackman, uh, who actually Justice Breyer succeeded on the court, uh, said in his concurrence in 
Planned Parenthood v. Casey, about the court's decision to uphold Roe v. Wade, he said, what has happened today should serve as a model for future justices and a warning to all who have tried to turn this court into yet another political branch. What role do you think that stare decisis plays in protecting the independence of the judiciary and avoiding the perception uh, that the court is acting as another, quote, political branch? I think it plays a very important role um, as a, a doctrine that keeps um, keeps shifts from happening in the court. That, as um, as I pre previously mentioned, it's very important to have stability in the law for the rule of law purposes, so that people can order themselves and predict. Um, predict their lives given what the Supreme Court has already said. And if there were massive shifts uh, every time a new justice came on or um, every time new circumstances ar arose, there would be a concern that public confidence uh, would be eroded. And so stare decisis is a very important doctrine um, that the Supreme Court has established and um, and it's one that furthers the rule of law in this country. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that's a good way to end uh, Judge Jackson. And I do see uh, Senator Cruz waiting in the wing. So by coincidence, and it looks like he has things he's putting up of charts. Um, by coincidence, I uh, have a was going to put on the record, and since he's here, it, it makes a lot of sense from uh, the judge that you clerked for, um, uh, Senator Cruz, uh, uh, Judge Luddick, who's now retired, and I know you were very close to him, and uh, he actually submitted a letter on, on your behalf, um, Judge Jackson, and said in this letter, and he's an appointee of George H.W. Bush, um, similar to uh, Judge Griffith, who introduced you yesterday, and I've been very impressed by uh, the support you've had from uh, retired judges, obviously not appropriate for current judges, but retired judges appointed by both Democratic and Republican presidents, as well as the bipartisan votes that you have gotten um, through uh, the U.S. Senate for your other positions. But in this letter, um, the judge, former Judge Luddig uh, says that you are eminently qualified uh, to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, and then he actually says Republicans and Democrats alike should give their studied advice and then their consent to the president's nomination. And he adds Republicans in particular should vote to confirm Judge Jackson. So I thought that might be a good segue, Senator Cruz, um, uh, to, your, uh, to your question. So I ask, uh, Chairman, uh, that the letter of support um, from uh, uh, former Judge Luddig, um, who employed Senator Cruz as a, a trusted law clerk, uh, be uh, admitted to the record. Without objection. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judge Jackson. <clears throat> Thank you. Senator Klobuchar finds a Minnesota connection to almost everything. <laughs> very proud of the fact, but Justice Blackman was born in Nashville, Illinois. Okay. Mm -hmm. He was a lawyer at the Mayo Clinic, as we know, and spent a lot of time. I'm going to lose this battle. A lawyer in Minnesota when he was chosen to the Supreme Court, but thank you for pointing that out. And now to the great state of Texas, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Jackson, welcome. Uh, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. You and I have known each other a long time. We have. Uh, we went to law school together. We were on the law re re review together. We were a year apart. Uh, we Happily were, so, I hope, yeah. Senator. <laughs> uh, we were not particularly close, but we were always friend, friendly and cordial. We were. Uh, and you and I had a very positive and productive meeting uh, in my office uh, where we discussed a number of things, including you were there with, with former Senator Doug Jones, uh, and we discussed how he and I and a number of other senators had, for, for two different years, participated in reading aloud on the Senate floor uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, which is one of the truly great uh, advocacies for civil rights our nation has seen. And, and you and I talked together uh, about our shared admiration for Dr. King. Uh, when Senator Grassley questioned you earlier, he asked in particular about Dr. King's speech uh, on, on the 
steps of the Lincoln Memorial, where he said, most critically, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Do you agree with what Dr. King said in, in that speech there? I do, Senator. Um, as we were discussing it, uh, you referenced in my office a, a speech that you gave in January of 2020 uh, at the University of Michigan School of Law. Uh, and after our discussion, I pulled a copy of your speech and read the speech uh, in its entirety. And there were elements of the speech that I thought were really powerful. Uh, and let me say, your, your opening remarks yesterday were, were powerful and inspirational as well. And I, and I think you and your family, the journey you have taken to becoming a federal judge, to becoming a federal court of appeals judge, I think demonstrates the incredible promise and the incredible opportunity this nation offers all of us. As I read your speech at the University of Michigan Law School, however, uh, there was a portion that surprised me. Uh, and in particular in that speech, you referenced the work of, quote, acclaimed investigative journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones and her, and again, this is a quote from the speech, provocative thesis that America was born in, uh, that, that, that the um, provocative thesis that the America that was born in 1776 was not the perfect union that it purported to be. And indeed, Ms. Hannah Jones, in her 1619 projects, describes the central thesis of the 1619 project, which the New York Times laid out as a revisionist look of history, revising American history. And Ms. Hannah Jones described her central thesis as, quote, one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare independence was because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery. Now, that claim is a highly contested historical claim. Um, do you agree with Ms. Hannah Jones that one of the primary reasons the colonists decided to declare independence is because they wanted to protect the institution of slavery? Thank you, Senator. When I gave that speech at the University of Michigan, I was asked to speak on Martin Luther King Day. And um, every year they have a Martin Luther King Day speaker and I gave a speech about black women in the civil rights movement. Um, most of the speech, if not all of the speech, was focused on African-American women, um, their contributions to the civil rights movement, unsung contributions in many cases, and then some of the more recent African-American women um, who have made claims, who have uh, done things in our society. Uh, one slide was of Ms. Uh, a journalist, as you say, who, who made that statement, and I called it provocative. Um, it is not something that I've studied. It doesn't come up in my work. I was mentioning it because it was, at least at that time, something that was talked about and, and well-known uh, to the students that I was speaking to at the law school. So are you aware that, that since the 1619 Project ca came out, that it has been roundly uh, refuted by very respected historians, including Gordon Wood of Brown University, including James McPherson uh, of Princeton University? McPherson called it a, quote, very unbalanced, one-sided account, which lacks content and perspective. And indeed, it was so thoroughly refuted that the New York Times quietly altered the digital version to remove references to 1619 as the year of America's true founding and the moment America began. W were you aware of that? I was not. So let me ask you, related to the 1619 Project, which I believe is, is deeply inaccurate and misleading, um, 1619 Project is closely, closely intertwined with a movement that is called critical race theory. Uh, critical race theory, as you know, originated at your and my alma mater at, at the Harvard Law School. Uh, in your understanding, what, what does critical race theory mean? What is it? Senator, my understanding is that critical race theory is, um, it is an academic theory 
that is about the ways in which uh, race interacts with um, various institutions. It doesn't come up in my work as a judge. It's never something that I've uh, studied or relied on, and it wouldn't be something that I would rely on if I was on the Supreme Court. So critical race theory, as you know, has its origins in the critical legal studies movie, movement, which also came from Harvard Law School, from a number of critical legal studies professors, crits as they were known when we were in law school, uh, who are explicitly Marxists, and they find their origins in Marxism, although critical legal studies frames society as a fundamental battle between socioeconomic classes, Critical race theory frames all of society as a fundamental and intractable battle uh, between, between the races. It views every conflict as, as a racial conflict. Um, do you think that's an accurate way of viewing society and the world we live in? Senator, I don't think so, um, but I've never studied critical race theory and I've never used it. It doesn't come up in the work that I do as a judge. So, so with respect, I, I find that a curious statement uh, because um, you gave a speech in April of 2015 uh, at the University of Chicago in which you described the job you do as a judge and you said sentencing is just plain interesting because it melds together myriad types of law, criminal law, and of course constitutional law, critical race theory. So you described in a speech to a law school what you were doing as critical race theory. Uh, and so I guess I would ask, what, what did you mean by that when you gave that speech? With respect, Senator, um, the quote that you are mentioning there um, was about sentencing policy. It was not about sentencing um, I was talking about the policy uh, determinations of bodies like the Sentencing Commission when they look at a laundry list of various academic subjects as they consider what the policy should be. Okay, but Critical you, but you race were vice chair of the Sentencing Commission, so let me ask again, what did you mean by, because that was an official responsibility of yours, what, what did I you meant, mean by what you were doing was critical race? What I meant was that there are a number of, that that... Uh, slide does not show the entire laundry list of different uh, academic disciplines that I said um, relate to sentencing policy, but none of that relates to what I do as a judge. So let me ask you a different question. Is, is critical race theory taught in schools? Is it taught kindergarten through 12th? S Senator, I don't no, I don't think so. I believe it's an academic theory that's at the law school level. Okay. Um, as you may recall, during the confirmation hearings of Justice Amy Coney Barrett, there was a great deal of attention paid to the fact that Justice Barrett served as a board member on the Board of Trustees of a religious private school, and, and the press focused very intensely on the views of that school. In your questionnaire to this committee, you disclosed that you are similarly on a board, specifically the Board of Trustees for the Georgetown Day School and that you've been a board member since 2019 and you're currently still a board member. Is, is, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, in regard to the George, Georgetown Day School, you've publicly said, quote, since becoming a member of the GDS community seven years ago, Patrick and I have witnessed the transformative power of a rigorous progressive education that is dedicated to fostering critical thinking, interdependence, and social justice. When you refer to social justice and the school's mission on social justice, what, what did you mean by that? Thank you, Senator, for allowing me to address this issue. Georgetown Day School has a special history that I think is um, important to understand when you consider my service on that board. The school was founded in 1945 in Washington, D.C. at a time in which, by law, there was racial segregation in this community. Black students were not allowed in the public schools to go to school with white students. Georgetown Day School is a private school that was created when three white families, Jewish families, got together with three 
black families and said that despite the fact that the law requires us to separate, despite the fact that the law is set up to make sure that black children are not treated the same as everyone else, we are going to form a private school so that our children can go to school together. The idea of equality, justice, is at the core of the Georgetown Day School mission. And it's a private school such that every parent who joins the community does so willingly with an understanding that they are joining a community that is designed to make sure that every child is valued, every child is treated as having inherent worth and none are discriminated against because of race. So Judge Jackson, all of us will agree that, that no one should be discriminated against because of race. When you just testified a minute ago that you didn't know if critical race theory was taught in K through 12, I, I, I will confess, I, I find that statement a little hard to reconcile uh, with the public record. Because if you look at the Georgetown Day Schools curriculum, it is filled and overflowing with critical race theory. That, that among the, doc, the books that are either assigned or recommended, uh, they include critical race theory, an introduction. Uh, they include the end of policing and ad an advocacy for abolishing police. They include how to be an anti-racist by I Ibram K Kendi. They include literally stacks and stacks of books, and I'll tell you two of the ones that were most stunning. They include a book called Anti-Racist Baby uh, by I Ibram Kendi. And there are portions of this book that, that, that I find really quite remarkable. One portion of the book says babies are taught to be racist or anti-racist. There is no neutrality. Another portion of the book, they recommend to babies confess when being racist. Now, this is a book that is taught at Georgetown Day School to students in pre-K through second grade, so four through seven years old. Um, do, do you agree with this book that is being taught with kids that, that babies are racist? Senator. I do not believe that any child should be made to feel as though they are racist or though they are not valued or though they are less than, that they are victims, that they are oppressors. I don't believe in any of that. But what I will say is that when you asked me whether or not this was taught in schools, critical race theory, my understanding is that critical race theory as an academic theory is taught in law schools. And to the extent that you were asking the question, I understood you to be addressing public schools. Georgetown Day School, just like the religious school that Justice Barrett was on the board of, is a private school. Okay, so, so you agree critical race theory is taught at Georgetown Day School? I don't know because the board is not, um, the board does not control the curriculum. The board does not focus on that. That's not what we do as board members, so I'm actually not sure. Well, and I'll note that the board is, is chaired by Professor Fairfax, your college roommate who introduced you yesterday. So the two of you serve on the board together. Um, another book that is on the uh, summer reading for third through fifth grade is a book called Stamp for Kids, again by Ibram Kendi. Uh, I read the entirety of the book, and I will say it is uh, an astonishing book. Uh, on page 33, it asks the question, can we send white people back to Europe? That's on 33. That's what's being given to eight and nine years old. It also on page 115, says the idea that we should pretend not to see racism is connected to the idea that we should pretend not to see color. It's called color blindness. Skipping ahead, here's what's wrong with this. It's ridiculous. Skin color is something we all absolutely see. Skipping ahead, so to pretend not to see color is pretty convenient. 
if you don't actually want to stamp out racism in the first place. Now, what this book argues for is the exact opposite of what Dr. King spoke about on the floor of the, of the Lincoln Memorial. And, and are you comfortable uh, with, with these ideas being taught to children as young as four in, in respect to the first book, as young as eight and nine in respect to the second book? Senator, I have not reviewed any of those books, any of those ideas. They don't come up in my work as a judge, which I'm respectfully here to address. In my work as a judge, which is evidenced from my near decade on the bench. Okay, good. I am then, then let's go back to, to your work as a judge. Um, as was noted in the first slide, you discuss sentencing as being related to critical race theory. And earlier there's been some back and forth as Democratic senators have tried to address your sentencing patterns as it concerns child pornography. And I'll confess, Judge Jackson, as, as, look, as I listen to your testimony, I believe you are someone who is compassionate. I believe you care for children, obviously your children and other children. But I also see a record of activism and advocacy as it concerns sexual predators that stems back decades and that is concerning. Uh, you wrote your note on the Harvard Law Review on sex crimes. Uh, the, your note is your major academic work on the Law Review, and, and yours is entitled Prevention Versus Punishment Towards a Principled Distinction in the Restraint of relate, uh, Release Six Sex Offenders. And in it, you argue, and I quote, a recent spate of legislation purports to regulate released sex offenders by requiring them to register with local law enforcement officials, notify community members of their presence, undergo DNA testing, and submit to civil commitment for an indefinite term. Although many courts and commentators herald these laws as va valid regulatory measures, others reject them as punitive enactments that violate the rights of individuals who have already been sanctioned for their crimes. Under existing doctrine, the constitutionality of sex offender statutes depends upon their characterization as essentially preventative rather than punitive. And what you go, out, go on to explain is if they're viewed as punitive, they are unconstitutional. If they're viewed as preventative, they are not. And throughout the course of your note, you argue they should be viewed as punitive and therefore unconstitutional. Indeed, in the second to last page, you go through each of those four categories. You say requirements that sex offenders register may or may not be unconstitutional, depending upon whether, quote, sex of, in which sex offenders have no privacy right in registration information or blood samples. So you suggest that may or may not be constitutional, although you, you raise doubts about it. And then you raise very significant doubts about community notification, and you heavily suggest that civil commitment for sexual predators is unconstitutional. D do you still agree with the sentiments you expressed in, in your law school note? Respectfully, Senator, those are not the sentiments that I expressed in my law school note. My law school note was about sex offender registration laws, which at the time were relatively new. As uh, you know from our time in law school, one of the things that law school students do is they look for new developments in the law and they try to analyze them. That's something that makes for good fodder for a law school note. My note, uh, which came out in 1996, was shortly after there were new Megan's laws. And the point that I was making was not that the laws were bad, that the laws were wrong. I was trying to assess uh, something that is uh, sort of fundamental in terms of the characterization of the laws. I didn't say that they were unconstitutional one way or the other. What I was trying to assess was how they are characterized. Some, um, some courts would look at those laws and call them preventative, and that has a certain set of uh, uh, consequences. Some courts would call them punitive, and that has a certain set of consequences. And what I was trying to do is figure out how to make the determination, whether they were punitive or preventative. 
Well, your note argued that they were punitive, and I would note that that view, uh, there have been some on the bench that have advocated that. Uh, the Supreme Court in 1997 decided a case called Kansas versus Hendricks, in which it upheld Kansas's civil commitment statute. That was a 5-4 vote. This has been a question that has been close at the Supreme Court. And I would note beyond that, that in terms of the prevalence of these statutes, all 50 states in DC have registry requirements. 47 states have community notification requirements. All 50 states have DNA or blood banks for sex offenders requirements. And 20 of the states, the federal government in DC, have laws that allow for the indefinite detention of sex offenders. I would note in the state of Texas, a state, state court of appeals, relying on very much the, the, the same sort of reasoning you advocated in your note, struck down Texas's sexually violent predator civil commitment law. At the time I was the Solicitor General of Texas, I personally argued that appeal in the Texas Supreme Court. And the Texas Supreme Court unanimously reversed the Court of Appeals and upheld our statute. And, and if the views you advocated in law school prevailed, Civil commitment laws across the country would be struck down, releasing sexual predators. And under the argument, community notification and DNA ba bank laws could well be struck down as well. Is that, is that an outcome that, that, that should concern people? Senator, my note wasn't advocating for the striking down of those laws. My note was trying to identify criteria that I thought could be applied consistently to determine whether the laws were punitive or preventative. But with respect Either to that, Jackson, you argued that they were punitive, and you further say in the note, if they're punitive, they're unconstitutional. I was looking at four different kinds of laws, and not all of them, did I say, were punitive. Okay, so let's take civil commitments laws. Uh, if you look at civil commitment laws right now, the U UCLA School of Law, Williams Institute, estimates more than 6,300 sex offenders are currently detained in civil commitment programs. If the view you advocated prevailed, presumably those 6,300 sex offenders would be released to the public. I is that an outcome that should be concerning? Senator, in law school, when I was writing a note, I was looking at a brand new set of laws that had not previously been enacted in any jurisdiction, they were new. And I was assessing at the time, as law school students do, what criteria I thought might be used by courts to make a determination in the future as to whether or not they should be treated as punitive and therefore not mm -hmm. unconstitutional, but as therefore um, ones that come, carry with them certain rights versus uh, excuse me, preventative. Those, okay, those Judge, Judge, Judge Jackson, so, so you've, you've pointed that these were views in law school. And listen, I will recognize that all of us, when we are students, may have views that, that as time and maturity passes on, we may change. But what troubles me is this was not just a law school view. It's one that has continued. So when you were vice chairman of the Sentencing Commission, you expressed significant concerns um, that the White House has argued that your quotes were taken out of context. So I want to provide the full context of your quote, because you said, yes, I want to ask you about the means by which we can distinguish more or less serious offenders. I know that all of you sort of touched on that. Mr. Fattrell, you talked about going from singular to one-on-one -on -one to group experience. I'm just wondering if there's some sort of inevitable and natural progression from one stage to the other, such that you could say that the least serious offenders are in the singular experience stage. I guess my thought is in looking at some of the testimony that other people will have later in the day. I was surprised at some of the testimony with respect to the motivation of offenders, and we're talking about child pornography offenders, and that there are people who get involved with this kind of activity who may not be pedophiles and who may not be necessarily interested really in the child pornography, but have other motivations with respect to the use of technology and being in the group, and you know, here are lots of reasons perhaps why people might engage in this. And so I'm wondering whether you could say that there is a, that there could be a less serious child pornography offender who is engaging in the type of conduct in the group experience level, because their motivation is the challenge or to use the technology. They're very sophisticated technologically, but they aren't necessarily that interested in the child pornography piece of it. Now, now I find that a, a 
pretty remarkable arguments that people in possession of child pornography are not actually interested in the child porn. They're not pedophiles. They're just interested in technology. Is, is that... And I wanted to provide the whole quote because the White House said that portions of this were used out of context. So this is your entire quote. Um, do, do you agree with that sentiment that there is some meaningful population of people who have child pornography but, but are not, in fact, um, pedophiles or, or getting, getting satisfaction from it? Thank you, Senator, for allowing me to address um, what appears to be a question that I was asking in the context of a hearing on child pornography. You've provided the entire quote, and it looks as though I was asking that of someone, not taking that position. And the position that I've taken in all of my sentencings involving child pornography offenders is to ensure that despite the attitude and um, view of many of the offenders who came before me when I was a trial judge, that they were just lookers, that they weren't really harming anyone, that they were curating their collections and they never touched a child. I made sure that they understood that notwithstanding their uh, collecting behavior, that they were causing significant harm. So, so, Judge Jackson, all right, you, you, you raise your actual sentencing, and I think that's very productive. Let's, let's take a look at your actual sentencing. And you've had 10 different cases involving child pornography. Um, these are the cases. There, there are two, U.S. versus Buttry and U, U.S. versus Can, for which the government did not make a recommendation. And you said... Earlier, when, when Chairman Durbin was trying to preempt this line of attack, you said it's a sickening and egregious crime, which I very much agree with. Um, and you said the guidelines lead to extreme departures. Okay? Uh, let's look at what the prosecutors are asking for. And I would note that this was in the District of Columbia, where prosecutors are far more liberal than many of the prosecutors in this country. And in every case in which, so United States versus Hess, there was a mandatory statutory minimum of 60 months, and you imposed 60 months because you had no discretion. Uh, in United States versus Nickerson, there was a mutual agreement of the parties to 120 months, and that's what you imposed. In every other case, United States versus Chazen, the prosecutor asked for 78 to 97 months. You imposed 28 months. 28 months is a 64% reduction. In United States versus Cooper, the prosecutor asked for 72 months. You imposed 60 months. That was a 17% reduction. In United States versus Downs, the prosecutor asked for 70 months. You imposed 60. That was a 14% reduction. In United States versus Hawkins, the prosecutor asked for 24 months. You imposed three months. That was an 88% reduction. In United States versus Savage, the prosecutor asked for 49 months. You imposed 37. That was a 24% reduction. In United States versus Stewart, the prosecutor asked for 97 months. You imposed 57. That was a 41% reduction. Every single case, 100% of them, when prosecutors came before you with child pornography cases, you sentenced the defenders to substantially below, not just the guidelines, which are way higher, but what the prosecutor asked for on average of these cases, 47.2% less. Now, you said you made sure the voice of the children was heard. Do you believe in a case like United States versus Hawkins, where the prosecutor asked for 24 months and you sentenced the offender to only three months? Do, do you believe the voice of the children is heard when 100% of the time you're sentencing child uh, those in possession of child pornography to far below what the prosecutor's asking for? Yes, Senator, I do. Could, could you explain how? I will. A couple of observations. One is that your chart does not include all of the factors that Congress has told judges to consider, including the probation office's recommendation in these 
cases. Well, Judge Jackson, we don't have those probation. The committee has not been given the probation officer's recommendation. We would welcome them. I would, Mr. Chairman, I would love to see those. The we second, don't have access to the them. second thing I would say is that I take these cases very seriously as a mother, as someone who, as a judge, has to review the actual evidence in these cases and based on Congress's requirement, take into account not only the sentencing guidelines, not only the recommendations of the parties, but also things like the stories of the victims, also things like the nature and circumstances of the offense and the history and characteristics of the defendant. Congress is the body that tells sentencing judges what they are supposed to look at. And Congress has said that a judge is not playing a numbers game. The judge is looking at all of these different factors and making a determination in every case based on a number of different considerations. And in every case, I did my duty to hold the defendants accountable in light of the evidence and the information that was presented to me. In 100% of the cases, was the evidence less than the prosecutors asked for? Senator, the evidence in this, these cases are egregious. The evidence in these cases are among the worst that I have seen, and yet, as Congress directs, Judges don't just calculate the guidelines and stop. Judges have to take into account the personal circumstances of the defendant because that's a requirement of Congress. Judges have to consider things like the victims. And when I was talking about making sure that victims' circumstances are heard, it was about my sentencing practices well, that, that I- show victims being heard with respect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In 2012, the Sentencing Commission, on a unanimous bipartisan basis, issued a report recommending changes to sentencing for non-production child pornography, which is the subject at hand. Offenses because of widespread concern among judges and other stakeholders, for example, 70% of surveyed judges said the guideline ranges for possession receipt offenses were too high. 71% said the mandatory minimums were too high. Notably, the report was supported by every member of the commission. I believe the question which Senator from Texas was referring to was part of the proceedings that led to that commission report, unanimous uh, bipartisan basis commission report. M Mr. Chairman, very briefly, I would ask unanimous consent that the books I referenced be entered into the record. Without objection. Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley. Judge Jackson, good to be with you. Good to be with you, Senator. I, I'd like to take a few minutes, if I could, and just uh, give you a chance to address some of the issues just raised. My colleague suggested that you've never sentenced a defendant in a child pornography case consistent with what the government requested, what the prosecution requested. But according to my staff's research, that's just not true. So let me briefly ask you about three specific sentencing cases. Do you remember U.S. v. Nickerson? You sentenced Charles Nickerson Jr. to 10 years in prison, exactly what the government requested. I do, Senator. Do you remember U.S. v. Fife? You sentenced him to 20 years in prison, exactly what the government requested. I do, Senator. And do you recall U.S. v. Nguyen? Um, you sentenced him to 37 months in prison, exactly what the prosecution requested. I do, Senator. So in, in these three cases, it's also true that the government, the prosecution, requested below guidelines sentences. Would that seem surprising to you at all? It would not. And is that because overwhelmingly nationwide in 70% of cases, and in your district, 80% of cases, Downward departures from the guidelines are the norm. That is correct, Senator. So to the extent there seems to be some concerted effort to try and 
uh, characterize you as being uh, soft on crime or uh, somehow uh, unconcerned about child safety. Uh, I, I just wanted to take another moment um, and give you a chance uh, to respond to that. Um, as a parent, uh, as the member of a family that's had um, several members uh, who've served your brother, your uncles in law enforcement, um, could you share a bit about how having loved ones who serve as law enforcement officers, in one case a detective on a sex crimes unit, um, has had an impact on your sense of the balance of uh, justice and mercy in the case of um, ensuring that we hold to account those who commit crimes against children? Thank you, Senator. As a mother, these cases involving sex crime, crimes against children are harrowing. What I think is important to understand is that trial judges who have to deal with these cases are presented with the evidence or descriptions, graphic descriptions. These are the cases that wake you up at night because you're seeing the worst of humanity. When, when there are victim statements that are presented, when people talk about how their lives have been destroyed as children, how the people who they trusted to take care of them were abusing them in this way, and then putting the pictures on the internet for everyone to see. I sometimes still have nightmares about the main witness, the, the woman I mentioned earlier who cannot leave her house because of this kind of fear, the vulnerability, the isolation. These cr crimes are, are horrible. And so I take them very seriously just as I did all of the crimes, but especially crimes against children. So, Your Honor, if I could, um, the, the characterization that was just presented. Uh, in a recent column in the National Review, a, a conservative publication, um, has uh, characterized that view of you as a smear that appears meritless to the point of demagoguery and characterizes your approach in sentencing in these cases as mainstream and correct. And I'll just remind my colleagues and those watching that um, two of the largest, uh, most substantial law enforcement advocacy organizations in our country, the National Fraternal Order of Police and the International Association of Chiefs of Police, have spoken up uh, in support of your qualifications and um, your capabilities. The FOP letter says there's little doubt you have the temperament, intellect, legal experience, and family background to have earned this appointment. That sentiment was echoed by the IACP. In their letter, they said, um, you believe you have a deep understanding of and appreciation for the challenges and complexities confronting the policing profession, and you have, during your time as a judge, displayed your dedication to ensuring our communities are safe and that the interests of justice are served. I find it hard to believe that these organizations, having looked closely at your judicial decisional record, your sentencing decisions, um, your lifetime conduct, would have taken those unusual steps to be that forceful uh, in supporting you if, in fact, you had somehow a disturbing record of uh, coddling child pornographers or being soft on crime. In fact, Judge, your record, in my view, demonstrates you're an even-handed and impartial judge. And I can see that when I look at cases you've ruled on uh, that involve very um, politically charged or partisan interests. Uh, you've delivered rulings on both sides for plaintiffs and defendants. Uh, and in my review of your record, you've put any personal views or concerns aside. You've based your decisions on the argument of the parties, the facts in the record, the applicable law and precedent. And the well-reasoned and thorough opinions you've written show to me a judge striving to make even-handed decisions based on facts and law, not on some caricature of a leftist agenda. Um, but don't just take my word for it. Um, we've received an outpouring of support for your nomination. Uh, as we'll hear on Thursday, a very wide range of groups and individuals have um, sent letters or testimony to this committee in support of your nomination. 
It's no surprise to me that your, your legal mind, your experience, your temperament inspire strong support from some of the best and brightest of our legal community. Um, and I think it's worth highlighting that among those many who have written to us uh, are included well-respected conservative and Republican lawyers and Republican appointed judges who agree with my characterization that you're an even-handed and impartial judge. We've received a letter from 24 conservative lawyers who held positions in Republican administrations or are well known for their conservative political or legal views who wrote this committee to urge your speedy confirmation. They praised your character and intellect and called you, and I quote, a truly excellent person. I'd like to focus, though, on the way that these conservative lawyers characterized your judicial decision-making, which is, after all, the core issue before us, is whether you are the sort of judge at the district court and circuit court that should be elevated to the Supreme Court. And they note in this letter that in nearly 10 years on the bench, as a district judge and then in the Court of Appeals, Judge Jackson has been involved in thousands of cases running the full range of federal law. You're approximately 500, I think it's more than 570 now. Opinions written during this time have, and I'm quoting, demonstrated complete command of the legal subject matter, a judicious and even-handed approach, a fine ability to express yourself with force and great clarity. They've also demonstrated, and I'm quoting, another attribute essential for a judge, a sense of empathy for the situations of others. Judicious and even-handed. These prominent conservative lawyers want this committee to know you're judicious and even-handed and recommend you for the Supreme Court without reservation, despite having noted they differ with you concerning some political or partisan issues. And they're not alone. Um, judge Griffith, in a letter to this committee, and then followed up with personal testimony in your introduction yesterday, a judge appointed by former President George W. Bush enthusiastically supports your nomination. I was struck by his description of your intellectual capacity, your keen legal mind, as well as your character and judicial approach. And now I'm quoting from his testimony to this committee yesterday. Judge Jackson, he told us, is an independent jurist who adjudicates based on the facts and the law, not as a partisan. He went on, as Justice Scalia taught us, an indispensable feature of the republic the Constitution created is an independent judiciary of judges who've taken an oath not to a president or a party, but to the American people and to God that they will be impartial. And he concluded that you, Judge Jackson, have demonstrated an unwavering commitment to that oath. That's a conservative judge appointed by a Republican president who told this committee he's confident you'll decide cases based on the facts and the law, not as a partisan. Now, I value the working relationships I have with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. We can and do at times have fierce policy disagreements, but we also work together to try and find ways as lawmakers and individuals to respect each other. And I take it as a personal sort of badge or a source of pride when someone with whom I really disagree on one issue is able to legislate with me on another. And so I imagine, Your Honor, it must be gratifying to know that a judge who literally sat in judgment of, reviewed dozens and dozens of your opinions. In fact, I think he reversed you once. Oh, more than. <laughs> more so than. Here is someone who closely read and reviewed your decisions and as a circuit judge sat in review of your work over years as a district, hundreds of opinions as a district court judge, and has such unequivocal praise for the even-handed, impartial, thorough, and nonpartisan way you've approached judicial decision-making. Could you just briefly share with me what it means to you to hear that someone like Judge Griffith has such confidence you would make an excellent member of our highest court? Thank you, Senator. It means the world to me to have the support of Judge Griffith, his coming here yesterday and testifying on my behalf was so gratifying. Um, I have tried in every respect to follow my methodology that enables me to rule impartially in every case and to understand the limits of my own judicial authority and thereby reach decisions 
without fear or favor. My record demonstrates that I am not proceeding from any sort of preconceived notion about how a case comes out. I'm not ruling consistent with any sort of ideology. I'm doing what impartial and fair judges do, which is to decide in every case based only on the facts and the law of that case. And I'm very, very pleased that Judge Griffith um, has seen that in the years that he supervised me effectively as a court of appeals judge when I was a district judge. And I think it, it's wonderful that he was able to come here and testify to that. Well, Judge, uh, for those watching and um, for those following this, that they might be puzzled um, because my colleague, uh, the junior senator from the state of Texas, has tried to ascribe all sorts of views to you in his recent questioning that try to paint you as some kind of, a, of an activist with a radical agenda. And in my review of your experience and your record, these letters from judges and scholars, I, I don't see anything that remotely substantiates uh, that claim. We are here to evaluate your qualifications, your judicial decision making. But So let me get at a few of these points specifically, if I could. I've heard references to the 1619 Project and critical race theory, um, but I didn't hear that cited in any reference to your opinions as a judge. In your nine years on the bench as a district court judge, more than 570 decisions, have you ever cited the 1619 Project? No, Senator. In your nine years on the bench and more than 570 opinions, have you ever cited the journalist or principal author of that 1619 Project, Ms. Hannah Jones? I have not. And in your nine years on the bench and more than 570 decisions, have you ever used, employed, relied upon critical race theory to determine the outcome of any case or to impose any sentence or as a, as a framework for your decision making? No, Senator. Um, would you just explain to us briefly what sort of factors you do, in fact, consider in your analysis? Senator, when I analyze a case, I am looking at the arguments that the parties raise in the case. I'm looking at the record, which is the facts of the case developed, if I'm on the Court of Appeals, developed below. And I'm looking at the law. I'm looking at any statutes. I'm hewing to the text. I'm looking at constitutional provisions to the extent that they are applicable and any precedents related to the case at issue. Those are the inputs that are appropriate for a judge to consider, and those are the only things that I use in my decision making. Well, I, I appreciate your laying that out, and I, I'll, I'll just, let me dig into two cases, if I can, that I think are also probative here, because uh, I, I agree with the wide range of supporters we've heard from that you've demonstrated an even and impartial judicial approach in your record. Um, but this is true not just in the hundreds of sort of run-of-the-mill um, quotidian cases that are considered by a district court judge, but in several that have been highly charged and really quite political in terms of their consequences. Um, I'd like to discuss your opinion in the Center for Biological Diversity versus Mechelenin. Do you recall that case? I do, Senator. It was a dispute between groups advocating for environmental protection and the Trump administration's Department of Homeland Security. Um, the dispute was about President Trump's efforts to quickly construct a physical border wall between the United States and Mexico. I'm sure I don't need to remind you or anyone here that at the time, um, uh, Democrats were just about unanimous in thinking that physically building a wall from coast to coast was not the wisest use of resources to secure the border. There were other ways to do it, and with Republicans pretty much unanimously willing to defend it. So it was a policy matter with some sharp divisions and some political consequences. You ultimately ruled in favor of the construction of the wall and against an attempt by environmental groups to halt its construction through um, legal case, through a legal case. Can you discuss what you recall just briefly of the claims presented and how you came to a decision in favor of the Trump administration? 
Senator, the claims in that case, uh, which, as you say, were brought by an environmental organization, um, related to the Administrative Procedures Act, which is something that um, we often um, see in the District of Columbia, and whether or not the agency uh, could waive certain environmental laws pertaining to the construction of the wall, whether or not the agency's determination to do so uh, was lawful. And I looked at the relevant um, circumstances, and I ended up, I believe, dismissing that case um, on, on threshold grounds uh, before getting to that point in the analysis. But um, consistent with what you said, I was guided um, by my understanding of the law and what it required, and not by anything else. I could spend a lot of time on the details of this case, um, but let me try and summarize it this way. Um, you analyzed the statute. You concluded Congress had clearly blocked the courts from hearing non-constitutional challenges. There was no jurisdictional bar to the constitutional claims. To decide them, you considered whether the plaintiff's claims were viable. You looked for precedent. You found one. While not controlling, you thought it was legally sound um, and persuasive. Um, but there was no controlling circuit court or Supreme Court precedent that stopped you. If you were, in fact, an activist judge, a motivated partisan determined to let these plaintiff environmental groups proceed, you certainly could have. There was no clear precedent that barred that from happening. You analyzed the statute. You applied the best precedent you could find, and you reached a result without regard to the political consequences. That is correct, Senator. So in my view, um, I wanted to talk about this case because it, 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 there's really nothing unusual or special about it from your perspective. That is correct. For those of us up here, there was a lot special and important about it. It was a highly charged partisan and political issue. But you looked at the statute. You found persuasive precedent. You applied it. You went on to the next case. Well, let me ask about another decision. Um, in a case addressing another very politically charged issue, and specifically this involves the emails of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Now, the Republican National Committee, or the RNC, is opposing your nomination, publicly accusing you of being a partisan, of a partisan Democrat. And they argue you could not possibly be an impartial justice. But ironically, back in 2016, you presided over a case brought by the RNC against USAID related to then presidential candidate Clinton, and you ruled in favor of the RNC. Both the substance and the timing of the case are, are really quite striking. I did. The RNC made Freedom of Information Act requests for certain emails involving the former secretary. And despite what the RNC would have us now believe, um, I, in this case, you reinforced your deserved reputation for following the law, not a partisan agenda, because you ordered USAID to produce thousands of pages of documents related to Secretary Clinton. Do you recall when you issued that decision, that order? I actually don't. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it was just before the presidential conventions. So if there was a moment when the RNC had a political objective, it was right before the convention, and you actually issued a ruling that they were entitled to email production from the USAID on the basis of legal arguments presented to you, the statute at issue, and the evidence. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, Your Honor, I, I'm, you know, I'm frankly really struck um, at the fact that, you know, for all the back and forth uh, in Senate hearings and uh, academic circles about the judicial philosophy of Supreme Court nominees, um, you've shown what the experience of nearly a decade overwhelmingly spent on the district court has produced, a methodology, an approach that looks at the Constitution, the statute, the facts, the arguments of the parties, and reaches a result um, without fear or favor, without taking into account the partisan issue at stake. Um, you know, I don't believe that a, a judicial philosophy is always all that meaningful. Um, the judge for whom I clerked on the Third Circuit had spent years as a district court judge, and when I asked her, you know, what's your judicial philosophy, she looked at me and said, I just call balls and strikes. I'm a judge who rolls on the case before me in exactly the same frame that you offered. 
But judicial philosophy does not in and of itself constrain a judge. What constrains a judge is a judge who is willing to be constrained, who understands that the role of the federal judiciary is a limited one. And so the real question I think a president should consider when they make a nomination, the question that we as senators need the answer to in order to perform our function of advice and consent, and the question that I think resonates best with the American people who are concerned about this hearing and this nomination and how it will impact the country and their lives is sort of what kind of justice will you be? We want to know if you'll be fair. We want to know if you'll be faithful to the Constitution and to the rule of law. You've been a judge almost 10 years and you've written more than 570 opinions. I'd say your record as a judge is the best answer to the question what kind of justice you will be. How would you say, Your Honor, that your approach to judging on the district court relates to the way you are now judging on the circuit court? And what approach do you think you will bring with you if confirmed to the Supreme Court? Thank you, Senator. My approach all the way through is one that I believe is required by my duties, by my oath as a judge. We rule without fear or favor. We are independent as judges in our responsibilities. We understand at the district court level, at the court of appeals level, and at the Supreme Court that judges are restrained, are constrained in the exercise of our power under our constitutional scheme. My methodology is designed to help me to make decisions within those confines at every level. It's no different now that I'm on the Court of Appeals than when I was on the district court with respect to my understanding of the constraints on my authority and my responsibility to be impartial in my rulings. And I think it would be no different at the Supreme Court. Well, Your Honor, I, I know we've walked through just a few cases um, today now. In some ways, we've only scratched the surface of your decade and the more than 570 opinions you've written. Uh, but it's clear to me from what I've reviewed and from just this sample that as we also heard from um, colleagues, from conservative lawyers, from judges who wrote to the committee, that you are judicious and even-handed, um, that you have a demonstrated record of excellence, that you adjudicate based on the facts and the law and not as an advocate, activist, or partisan. Um, and I encourage my colleagues who want to know what kind of a justice you'll be to take a fair and even-handed look at your record at your impartiality and at your methodology. Your experience is extensive and broad. Your commitment to follow the law impartially and without the influence of politics is evident in your record. Your keen legal mind, judicial temperament, and impeccable character are plain to all. As Judge Griffith told this committee in a review of your record makes clear, you've demonstrated that the way you approach cases is based on the law and not on some political agenda. You understand the reason why the robes of our federal judges are black, not red or blue. The American justice system, as many have said, is rooted in the impartiality, the independence, and the reliability of our federal judicial system. It is one of the most critical bulwarks of our system of ordered liberty. No wonder that when you came before this body to be confirmed for the district court, then the circuit court, you earned and received bipartisan support. I know President Biden counts nominating a Supreme Court justice among the most significant decisions of his presidency, and our role here in the Senate in confirming a justice to our highest court is among our most solemn obligations and greatest privileges. So in nominating you, I believe our president has met his mission, and it will be my honor to join, I hope, the overwhelming majority of my colleagues in supporting your confirmation as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Senator Coons. Uh, last week, the committee received a letter, Judge, from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, representing survivors of domestic violence, urging the Senate to swiftly confirm you to the Supreme Court. 
The committee also received a letter about your nomination from nine separate organizations representing both survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. The letter said, and I quote, Judge Jackson is highly qualified for the position as her career and record demonstrate her historic confirmation as Supreme Court's first black woman and the sixth woman overall will represent monumental progress toward a nation. It is charged to serve and that values all of its citizens equally. The organizations also noted, quote, Judge Jackson's rulings reflect the judicial consensus. I move to enter these letters into the record. Without objection, they will be. Senator Sass, you're next up, but we're on a cusp of a vote. So I want to be fair to you. We're going to take a break at this point. I'm going to hope. I thought we were taking a break and going to go vote, but if you want me to go first, I'm good. No, I think we ought to go over there and okay. pray that it comes along and we can return quickly. So why don't we declare this break time for 20 minutes, 4.05, back in the room.
this to here. Yeah, because the guys that are in Russell Balcony. No.
that's who we get to see. Yeah, but his size, I don't know his average.
Senate Gen Judiciary Committee will come to order. The Senator from Nebraska, Senator Sass. Thank you, Chairman. Judge, welcome back. Um, by my quick eyeballing count of this, you are 51% done as of this moment, <laughs> which feels more like <laughs> curse than blessing, but I meant it as a good thing. Thank I think, you. I think I'm number 12 of 22, so you're just past halfway down on the downhill. Uh, thank you as well for spending time with me in my office, and thank you for answering the questions of the committee today and tomorrow. Um, what you've said in public matches what you've said in private, and that's obviously a testimony, a testament to your character. Um, that also uh, can be helpful to rebuilding public trust. So thank you for the way you've, the ways you've engaged thus far. Um, Judge, you are likely to go on to serve a lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court, which means that this is very likely the last job interview you ever have. Um, and the most public, Senator. Yeah, that's, <laughs> these processes are a lot like a proctology exam. Um, that means that it's an opportunity uh, for you to explain to the American people how you view a Supreme Court justice's job and uh, the limits and bounds on that job. So I want to go back to a topic that you and I have discussed a few times, which is how you approach cases. Um, you've told this committee and you've told me in private um, that you don't have a judicial philosophy yet, but that you think of yourself as having more of a judicial methodology. Um, I'd like to understand that a little bit more. And I think it would be helpful for the American people to understand that argument and that distinction a bit more as well. Uh, earlier today, you said that you, quote, do not believe there is a living constitution. And you also said that you're constrained to interpret the text. And that I think you said sometimes that's enough to resolve the issue. So I think I've heard you pay partial tribute uh, to the judicial philosophy of originalism, but you've not adopted it or embraced it as a philosophy or label that applies to you. So maybe one of the places we could tease that out a little bit more is trying to um, 
dig into whose jurisprudence you most admire. Um, we've heard many nominees before, like like Senator Grassley, former chairman of this committee. I'm not an attorney, uh, so the farming and ranching people where I'm where I come from uh, know that. John Kennedy is super smart Rhodes lawyer who kind of pretends to be a you know aw shucks kind of guy as he picks your pocket. Um, Grassley and I, Do I get equal time, Mr. Chairman. He, he all he always gets unequal time. Uh, he always gets bonus time. Uh, but. I think it might be helpful for us to understand who you most identify with. And past nominees before this committee have talked about the mold of particular justices they thought they followed in. And so if you had to tell the American people who you're closest to, who is that justice? Or who are those justices? Well, thank you for the question, Senator. And I, um, I must admit that I don't really have a justice that I've molded myself after or that I would. What I have is a record. I have 570 plus cases in which I have employed the methodology that I described and that shows people how I analyze cases. I, in every case, am proceeding neutrally from a neutral posture. From every, in every case, I describe thoroughly all of the arguments that are made in the case to me as a judge, because I want, in my lengthy opinions, for people to understand the inputs. This, I say, is what I'm considering because I lay out in very, you know, detailed way everything that people have argued in all of the cases. And then when I'm doing my interpretation, I am focused on the text of any statute or constitutional provision. I am looking as appropriate to the intentions of the people who wrote the words because I view statutory interpretation, constitutional interpretation, those exercises consistent with my limited authority. I am conscious of not interpreting those texts consistent with what I believe the policy should be or what I think uh, the outcome should be. I am trying in every case that involves that kind of interpretation to assess what it is that the parties, the parties who wrote the text intended. And as a result, because my methodology involves um, these various pieces and um, because of the way in which I do things, I'm reluctant to establish uh, or to adopt a particular label because the idea of how you interpret is just one part of the entirety of a judge's responsibility. As I mentioned, you know, I'm looking at the facts in a case and my experience as a trial judge helps me to assess the facts from all of the different perspectives of the parties because I'm able to do that, I think, having heard from parties in all sorts of cases directly as they present their arguments. That's a part of the judging uh, responsibility that isn't really captured by something like originalism or living constitution. And I believe that the constitution is fixed in its meaning. I believe that it's appropriate to look at the original intent, original public meaning of the words when one is trying to assess, because again, that's a limitation on my authority to import my own policy views. But there are times when the meaning, um, unreasonable searches and seizures, due process, looking at those words are not enough to tell you what they actually mean. You look at them in the context of history, you look at the structure of the Constitution. You look at the circumstances that you're dealing with in comparison to what those words meant at the time that they were adopted. And you look at precedents that are related to this topic. Um, all of those tools judges use, and I have used, is if, if, if you look at my cases. 
But when you say that you look at the intent of the yes. authors of a statute, sometimes courts have to say the people who wrote this statute, whether they meant to or not, have done something that we, the judiciary, decides, speaking in the voice of you, um, is unconstitutional. And deciding that something is unconstitutional requires an interpretive framework for how you get there, right? And so you and I talked in my office um, about the differences between Justices Kagan Breyer and Sotomayor's judicial philosophies, and you told me that you needed time to study that issue further. So assuming that you've had a chance to think about that a bit more, I guess I'd ask you again, what are the differences among the three of their judicial philosophies? With respect, Senator, I have not actually had time um, with all of my meetings in, with senators and um, the work that I've done to, to appear before you today. I would say that there are differences, as you see from the various opinions that they have issued. Uh, I'm not sure which one I would necessarily follow because it depends on the case. I think their differences um, indicate that they are, are looking at different provisions. They are using the various tools that judges use and that I have used in my cases. The, the idea of um, striking down a statute as unconstitutional is daunting and should be daunting, um, I think, for any judge or justice and, and had to be, would have to be looked at very carefully because of the limited nature of the ju judicial role and the fact that um, the policies have been adopted by the branch of government that has that authority under the Constitution. So I, I guess I'm surprised after nine years on the bench that, I mean, you're super smart. Nobody disputes that. Um, and having worked for Justice Breyer and knowing of some of the fights, some of the philosophical arguments he and Justice Kagan had, um, it, it just seems surprising that you wouldn't be able to at least speculate, not speculate, but reflect a little bit on the nature of those disagreements. Because to say it depends on the particular case, that's fine, but they have different philosophical and hermeneutic approaches to the text. So maybe another way to get at it. Um, I think Justice Breyer, again, for whom you clerked, and Justice Scalia used to travel together and uh, have lively um, debate circuit conversations. Can you tell the American people a little bit about what Breyer Scalia roadshow looked like? What were they arguing about? Well, my understanding is they were arguing or at least presenting two different um, viewpoints as to how the Constitution should be interpreted. And I would say, um, just as an aside before talking about their positions, um, that while I have been on the bench for nine plus years, the issue of constitutional interpretation in that sense doesn't come up very often. Um, it comes up to the Supreme Court for sure, um, but it doesn't come up very often in the lower courts. Um, what Justice Scalia and Justice uh, Breyer, I believe, were debating was the, Justice Scalia's notion of originalism, meaning um, the, that the words of the Constitution should be interpreted as uh, they were written by the founders in the founding era and that they should not be considered to um, essentially to establish principles that modern justices could now apply based on their own view of the needs of society. And that Justice Breyer's position was more toward that latter view, that the idea of um, the Constitution needing to be interpreted in a way that is consistent with modern sensibilities about uh, the principles that the document reflects. Um, and I would just say that um, it appears now that the Supreme Court has taken uh, Justice Scalia's view that the prevailing interpretive frame for interpreting the Constitution is now very clearly looking back through history. So we see that even in um, the Heller case where the justices, even, even the justices in dissent, were all 
analyzing the issues in the Second Amendment through a historical lens, what, what was meant at the time of the founding. So that is now the way in which constitutional interpretation is done. But do you identify with that position? I identify with the position insofar as that's how uh, the text is interpreted of the Constitution. That I am a strong believer, as I said, in uh, precedent, in stare decisis, in predictability, in the rule of law, and the way that the law now interprets the Constitution is through this historical frame. Um, I'm grateful for your last couple of minutes because I, I think that it's in the American civic interest for us to understand these different schools. Again, non-lawyer here, but my uh, simple way of summarizing some of what I think I heard you just say is that Scalia argues hard that the Constitution has a fixed meaning and justices aren't really free to depart from it without a constitutional amendment passed by the political branches so that the voters get to hire and fire the people or um, have a role at the state level in the ratification of a constitutional amendment. And Breyer's position seems to me, and I won't get it precise enough uh, in, in technical legal terms, jurisprudential terms probably to satisfy him, but that the Constitution is speaking to more abstract principles and therefore there's a lot more play in the joints of what a justice's job is. And I think the way you summarized their debate was pretty fair. And I also think it's fair for us to want to understand what your position is about it, because you're obviously, as I've said, incredibly uh, smart and incredibly likable and winsome and on the, on the stage for a lot of Americans to look up to. I'm at the rah-rah, hear-hear side of that debate um, at the level of what is a Supreme Court justice's job. I think that's why a lot of us are still trying to tease out the philosophical distinction, which I think is more than just a methodology, but wanna, wanna thank you for that answer. Um, you've also brought up the, the Fourth Amendment a number of times in our conversation, and I would like to talk a little bit more about the Constitution and whether its meaning changes. And so I'd like to go back to the Fourth Amendment topic you brought up in my office. Um, you said, I think, that original, and correct me if I'm missummarizing your position, you said that originalism wouldn't have much to say about the Fourth Amendment because the Founding Fathers never conceived of a tool, a piece of telecommunications equipment like this. And so I think during our conversation, you said that the original meaning of the Fourth Amendment won't tell you much about what to do with a new technology. My guess is that originalists, and Scalia in particular, would disagree. So what, what do you do if the text of the Fourth Amendment doesn't answer a question? Where do you go next? Well, Senator, just to clarify Please. what I intended to say, and I Thanks. may well have misspoken, um, there is an originalist take, I think, on the question of what happens with a cell phone. Um, as the Supreme Court held in the Riley case, there was a way in which you assess uh, principles of the Constitution, the text of the Constitution, and apply it to modern technology. And you have to, because there's no question that cell phones didn't exist at the time of the founding. So if the originalist principle is we look only at the Constitution as it relates to things that existed at the time of the founding, there would be no answer to what to do about a cell phone. And so what the Supreme Court has said and done is to determine that the principle of the Fourth Amendment with respect to searches is to determine whether there is a reasonable expectation of privacy. They also have uh, looked at property interests with respect to whether or not there's an invasion of privacy, and then determined from history what that reasonable expectation of privacy related to back at the time of the founding, and analogized to current circumstances related to things like cell phones. It's, it's a method of interpretation that allows you to instead of the, the alternative, which would be, don't worry about the history, just look at the words in the Constitution and say, what do I think is reasonable or unreasonable with respect to police officers searching cell phones? 
That's not the way the Supreme Court handles it. They try to determine what was unreasonable historically, and then given those principles, historically it would be unreasonable for police officers to enter someone's home, to rifle through their papers and documents. They then analogize to current circumstances and the fact that a cell phone is like your personal file cabinet. And they say, okay, given what we understood the framers to have intended about the need for a warrant or the need for uh, protection against un unreasonable searches, we're going to apply that to modern circumstances. It's still an originalist way mm -hmm. of analyzing the current dispute. So are there non-originalist ways to wrestle through that same question? And what would they be? One could imagine that rather than referencing history at all, <clears throat> that the court would look at the Constitution. It says no unreasonable searches and seizures and would just ask in the in you know in light of modern sensibilities in light of what we would think would be reasonable today or what the court itself would think would be reasonable today we'd apply that that modern understanding to the cell phone situation and the danger i think justice scalia would say is that that's a kind of framing that permits judges to make a determination based on their own views rather than hewing themselves, as, as Senator Lee said before, that Justice Barrett pointed out, hewing themselves to the text of the Constitution. And does Breyer have a different view? You know, I haven't, um, I'm just trying to think. I, I My understanding of the living constitutional principle is that it's closer to looking at the needs of modern society. But I'm, I'm not well versed in it, in part because the Supreme Court has now so clearly taken the historical perspective, uh, the originalist perspective in its interpretations. You brought up the cell phone example with me, but I know you have others. What are some other areas of life where the original meaning seems to be two and a half centuries removed? What are, what are places that the Constitution seems to not speak to? Well, Senator, I, you know, I'm reluctant to s spell out uh, different circumstances. What I will say is that when you look at the language in the Constitution, um, there are some provisions that are completely clear on their face without any question of what was intended, the age of, um, the required age of senators, the required age of the minimum age of the president, these kinds of provisions, all you need is the text and, and there you are. <laughs> um, but there are provisions of the constitution that are broader than that and therefore some interpretive frame is necessary and to the extent I mean, every question the Supreme Court gets that involves new technology, for example, that relates to constitutional provisions will require some kind of analogy, I think. Um, but, you know, I can't speak to, to anything more than that. You have described Justice Breyer's uh, constitutional approach as pragmatic. What does that mean? I understand it to be, um, and his approach to be about ensuring that the rules that follow from the Supreme Court's determinations are ones that make sense and are workable. Um, he, he said recently, um, explaining his approach to interpreting a statute, you're not going to go outside the words, but it often doesn't give you the answer. And you look at the history, and you look at its purposes, and you'll look at the consequences too, and you'll try to evaluate them from that, the point of view of what a reasonable legislature writing this statute have thought that these words were there to achieve. 
do you do you align yourself with that position? In the broad sense that what it is that the court is tasked with um, when statutory interpretation is um, being undertaken is to achieve the purposes of the legislature. The text is the uh, primary and in most cases sole uh, indication of what the legislature intended as opposed to the court saying, I see this statute, but I'm you know, uncomfortable with how it's going to turn out or what it's going to mean, and so I'm going to import my own policy perspective. Instead, the court is constrained to say, regardless of what I think the right policy objective should be in this, it, with respect to this law, my purpose, my requirement is to determine what Congress intended. But with respect to legislative intent, when uh, a Congress of 535 often distracted people, 100 in this body and 435 in the other, pass something you know, by a two to one-ish vote, um, and it's a part of a large piece of legislation, how do, you, how do you determine what the intent is when it's 535 people doing something that has many, many different purposes for why somebody might vote yes? Well, you, you look at the text. I mean, the, the, the way in which statutes are interpreted is based on what the legislature says. There are times in which there are statutes <clears throat> in which Congress includes a purpose statement, for example, in the actual text of the statute. You look at the text of the provision. If that isn't clear, you look at the structure of the statute there are canons of interpretation that courts use to evaluate and interpret statutes. Things like the a word that appears in the section that you are interpreting should be defined the same way it is in another section. The, you know, the same word being used, Congress probably intended to, um, to for it to have the same meaning. So there are tools in the law that exist to help courts to interpret the text, but again, the goal is to interpret the text um, as a means of understanding and reflecting what Congress intended. And of course, in statutory interpretation, um, if Congress decides that the court has gotten it wrong, then, as has happened many times, Congress comes back and clarifies and tells the court, no, this is, this is what the statute means. I want to go back to an exchange you had with Senator Cornyn. Uh, substantive due process um, is a doctrine that often allows courts to create new fundamental rights. Um, what's the test for determining a new fundamental right? <clears throat> the Supreme Court has said in the Glucksburg case that um, the fundamental rights that are recognized or that are, are included in substantive due process um, are those that are deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition. In a case prior to that, the court had um, defined it as the rights that are implicit in the ordered concept of liberty or the concept of ordered liberty. Um, so there are standards for the courts to use to identify these these types of rights. So did the Supreme Court use this test in Roe or Casey? In Roe and Casey, I don't know that the court used that formulation. Um, I know that after Casey, the court has determined um, n not so much that the right to terminate a woman's pregnancy is fundamental. The, the right exists, and it's subject to the framework in Casey uh, that allows for uh, regulation um, so long as there's not an undue burden on the exercise of the right pre-viability. 
I, th I think some of what we're wrestling with here is the question of, and I think what Senator Cornyn was driving at, is how particular the concept of deeply rooted goes and how that really is a bound uh, on what the judiciary can do. But I want to thank you. We're nearly at time. I want to thank you for engaging in the back and forth. I want to think more about what you've said and uh, look forward to further discussion tomorrow. It, it still appears to me that there's a very basic difference between a judicial philosophy and a judicial methodology. Into, and how you go about applying that when you're interpreting a law and making a determination about uh, constitutionality or non. And I, I know that you haven't claimed um, a judicial philosophy at all, but a, a judicial philosophy of originalism here. But I do think the fact that you've at least nodded to it uh, in the committee hearing today is in and of itself a pretty great testimony to how much of Scalia and Bork's uh, work has has moved the legal field. So I'm grateful for, for the time you're taking with us. I'll look forward to listening tonight and talking with you again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sass. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Judge, for your patience and your perseverance. Uh, I want to begin just by thanking you also for an extraordinary moment in our history. I think we all, as Americans, feel excitement and pride in really making history here. And the old saying, a picture's worth a thousand words, is I look at your parents and your husband and your daughters, uh, what I see is America and the best of America. So I think we should all feel that excitement and pride in this moment and the extraordinary journey that has brought you here you will make the court look more like America, but also think more like America in the obstacles and challenges that you've overcome to be here. We don't know all of them, but you will provide a very important perspective, indeed a unique perspective that the court needs more than ever at this moment in its history. There are a lot of people who are book smart, there are not as many people who are person smart, and you are both. That kind of emotional intelligence is what our courts need, not just our Supreme Court. So I want to really begin by asking you, as a role model for others, to talk a little bit to the young women and girls of America, particularly black young women and girls about those challenges and obstacles that you've had to overcome to be here and what's helped you do it. Thank you, Senator. I am humbled and honored to have the opportunity to serve in this capacity and to be the first and only black woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court. I stand on the shoulders of generations past who never had anything close to this opportunity, who were the first and the only uh, in a lot of different fields. My parents, as I said, were the first in their families to have the chance to go to college I've been the first and the only in, in certain aspects of my life, so I would say that I agree with you that this is a moment that all Americans should, should be proud. Now, you've never been a prosecutor. A lot of us on this panel have been prosecutors. I was the U.S. attorney, the chief federal prosecutor in Connecticut for four and a half years, and then I was attorney general of my state for 20 years. But I would say one of the most meaningful cases in my career was as a defense counsel. I was asked by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to represent a black man on death row in your home state of Florida. He had been convicted of murder and rape had been on death row 
for a number of years. And I took the case because I was asked to do it. And eventually, somewhat to my surprise, found, in fact, he had never done the crime of which he had been convicted. And eventually, we won his freedom because the prosecutor in the case concealed evidence, which was a violation of his constitutional rights. And he was a free man as a result. Your husband, as a surgeon, saves lives. Lawyers don't do it often. But I know from personal experience the importance of having a good representative, an advocate, a counsel, because in that case, he had been denied it when he originally went to trial. And only after years in both state and federal courts was the truth vindicated. So I want you to talk a little bit about why it is important for defendants to be represented by zealous, really aggressive and energetic advocates who tell the truth to the court, put on the evidence, and present the best possible case for a defendant accused of a crime. Thank you, Senator. The idea is one that is rooted in our Constitution. The framers were concerned about government overreach in a lot of different areas. The provisions of our Constitution are protecting individual liberty from government overreach. This is why we have provisions about limited government. And there are many provisions in the Constitution that are limiting government action when it comes to the deprivation of liberty, because the framers understood how important liberty is to our society. And so there's the Fourth Amendment, there's the Fifth Amendment, there's the Sixth Amendment, there's the Eighth Amendment. These provisions are crucial, and it is zealous defense counsel that ensures that the government is protecting these rights, is, that ensures that these rights are protected and that people are getting due process in the criminal justice system. And that's to all of our benefit. That helps everyone in America when we ensure that liberty cannot be denied without due process. It's defense counsel, as I said, who are making arguments, and they're not condoning the criminal behavior. They're, they're making arguments on behalf of clients in defense of the Constitution and these constitutional values. And as a judge, I now see how important it is for me to be able to make my decisions after hearing from both sides. That's crucial. We have an adversarial system, which means that judges are presented with arguments from both the prosecution and the defense. And only when I'm able to hear from both sides can I make a just, fair determination. And fairness is the hallmark of our constitutional scheme, and it's what makes us the best criminal justice system in the world. And it's not only the reality of fairness, but also the perception of fairness, the public's understanding of how courts work that is essential to the credibility that courts have, correct? That is correct. And so uh, I feel very strongly, uh, I know that a number of us on the committee agree that more transparency, more visibility is important for the public to understand what goes on in the courtroom. I know you feel transparency is a good thing. You've been asked about cameras in the courtroom. I'm a supporter of Senator Grassley's Sunshine in the Courtroom Act, as well as uh, Senator Durbin's Cameras in the Courtroom Act. Uh, I am hopeful that the court, the United States Supreme Court, actually will back these proposals because their support would be very important. 
tell me how you feel about the basic principle of transparency and more visibility. Well, Senator, one of the reasons, as I said, that I write such long opinions um, is because I want everybody to know exactly the arguments I've considered, the facts that I've reviewed, and in pretty fine detail, the course of my reasoning. And I've done this in 570 opinions. Um, I think it's important for public confidence, as you say, for people who are bound by the law and who are affected by the courts to know what the court's views are. With respect to the issue of cameras in the courtroom, I understand that that is something that is proceeding through Congress. And if I was confirmed, I would look forward to talking with my colleagues to understand the positions uh, that people have regarding that issue. I appreciate that response. Uh, one of the other areas that I think is important to transparency and to public trust and confidence in the court is visibility as to its own decisions, which I think is directly contradicted by the shadow docket. You've been asked about it before, but I just want folks to understand that some of the most important decisions of the Supreme Court have been decided, or at least uh, issues resolved, without oral argument, without briefs, without any public explanation. Uh, a controversial travel ban has gone into effect. The first federal execution in 17 years was permitted. Uh, statewide COVID restrictions were enabled. The collection of data in the 2020 United States cens Census and enforcement of voting restrictions in the 2020 presidential elections, as well as decisions relating to immigration and blocking the Biden administration from enforcing a federal moratorium on ev evictions imposed because of the COVID-19 epidemic. Americans have a right to an open, full, fair proceeding with a record of the court's reasons for making decisions. So I hope that you will urge your colleagues when you talk to them about cameras in the courtroom also to do less on the shadow docket. And I hope that perhaps if they don't, Congress will take some action. I uh, finally want to ask, uh, so far as this issue of transparency is concerned about um, codes of ethics, you have followed a code of ethics as a district court judge and court of appeals judge, correct? I have. Does that code of ethics apply to the United States Supreme Court? My understanding is that it does not. Correct. Uh, and uh, my hope is that you will perhaps urge your colleagues as well to support a code of ethics. They haven't done so as yet, but I think we have an obligation in the Congress to set forth a code of ethics, and I hope they'll support it. Uh, Senator Durbin and others of us have supported that, that kind of measure as well. Um, and I, I would just ask you whether you'll raise it with your colleagues if you're confirmed. Senator, um, certainly if Congress is taking anything up uh, that requires our review, I would absolutely, um, I would absolutely consider it. And, and, and even if not, I would, would consider it, Thank talking you. to them about it. Thank you. Uh, you know, the reason I raise these points is that um, I respect the United States Supreme Court. I've argued four cases before it. I was a law clerk to Justice Blackman, uh, who, by the way, was from Minnesota, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Uh, in fact, he was known as one of the Minnesota twins when he was appointed because he was thought to be exactly like then Chief Justice Warren Burger, who also was from Minnesota, mm -hmm. in his very, very conservative views. 
And as it happened, Justice Blackmun became one of the most progressive members of the court over the years that he served. He had a capacity for growth and for learning and listening, which I believe you have, and I think it is one of the most important characteristics of anybody who serves on the court. But I do think the court's crisis of legitimacy is the result of divisions within the court, the polarization and politicization that has drawn lines, the process that has happened in recent years in confirmation proceedings. And so I really think that consensus building, building bridges with your colleagues, will be immensely important. I think that's one of the reasons that the president chose you, having talked to him about it, that you have that kind of persuasive and forceful intellect, but also the personal charm and warmth and depth that will enable you to do it. Maybe you can tell this committee about how you worked on the Sentencing Commission, for example, or in your previous experiences on that kind of consensus building. Thank you, Senator. Um, consensus building was one of the things that Justice Breyer was particularly good at in terms of his uh, personality. In the time that I clerked for him, I witnessed uh, the way in which he continually reaches out to colleagues, continually seeks common ground. Um, and it's something that I would hope to be able to emulate if I were to be confirmed. When I worked on the Sentencing Commission, the commission is a seven-member body um, working on sentencing policy, which is at times a pretty uh, contentious effort because we're talking about uh, criminal justice. As commissioners, we are working on policy issues related to uh, appropriate sentencing and um, by statute, the commission is, is a bipartisan group. Um, and during my four years as a commissioner, I was able to work uh, well with other members of the commission to find common ground, to work on issues, to come together. And uh, the vast majority, I heard a statistic that something like 95 or 97 percent of the votes that the commission took were unanimous. Um, and that, that happened because of a lot of effort and in, intention on the parties, on the part of all involved, to see if we could work together. And that would be the kind of thing that, um, that I would hope to do if I was confirmed to the Supreme Court. You've mentioned in your previous testimony the challenges of applying the law to evolving a new technology. Obviously, the internet raises exactly those questions. Congress passed the Electronic Communications Privacy Act in 1986, when the internet was barely recognizable. It was nascent, just starting. And now, our nation faces a mental health crisis. It is partly aggravated by the pandemic, the isolation and anxiety that's resulted from it, but also by the internet and by the tech platforms that drive toxic content at children as a result of these black box algorithms that nobody really understands. Literally, no one understands because the tech platforms want to keep them secret. And we are trying to upgrade the law and update it to give parents tools to have greater visibility as to what their children are doing and to give parents and children tools to protect them against some of the bullying and eating disorder content